seeking to demonstrate her academic ability, and the feeling of being overawed by the centuries of learning and tradition that seeped out of the ancient stonework. The history tutor had run rings around her during the interview, but had nevertheless offered her a place. She'd discovered later from the second and third year students that the harder the interview, the more Dr. Irene Thomas rated you. She didn't waste time challenging those she considered unlikely to make the grade. Was Dr. Thomas still around? She would be well into her sixties by now, but some Oxford academics refused to give up. As long as they had their wits about them, they might carry on studying and teaching until they died. Bridget didn't think that Dr. Thomas would allow a minor inconvenience, such as old age, to stop her from continuing her life's work. "'Can I help you?' the sound of the porter's voice brought her back to the present. "'Are you here for the Gordy?' The young man in a college-crested sweater was peering at her from behind the reception desk. She wondered what had happened to Stevenson, the head porter during her student days. One of the old guard, he'd addressed all the female undergraduates as Miss, and all the male undergraduates as Sir. Retired long ago, no doubt. Bridget wiped away the beads of sweat which had formed on her brow after struggling with her overstuffed suitcase. Yes, I'm here for the gaudy. Bridget Hart. She had been Bridget Croft in those days, of course, and almost completely inexperienced with the ways of men, after coming straight from an all-girls school. Part of her still yearned for those simpler times. The porter ticked her off his list and handed her a large white envelope with her name and room number on it. All the information about the Gordy is in there. The first event will be tea with the warden. The warden of Merton College was the equivalent of the master of other colleges, or the dean, in the case of Christchurch. The old warden that Bridget remembered had now retired, and his position taken by Dr. Brendan Harper, a much younger man who was something of a celebrity. Bridget was looking forward to meeting him. Your room is in the Grove building. Do you know the way? She thanked the porter and assured him that she remembered the college layout very well. Then, wheeling her suitcase once more, she stepped out of the lodge and into front quad. Built in a mishmash of architectural styles, the buildings that made up the main college quadrangle nevertheless achieved a sense of unity through their use of yellow Cotswold stone. Every wall, gable, and archway gleamed golden in the September light, and the leaded windows sparkled wherever the sun caught them. To her right rose the Gothic east window of the college chapel, and ahead of her a flight of stone steps led up to the medieval dining hall, where tonight's dinner would be served. To the left, a double archway led through to St. Albans Quad, and the rather gloomy arch of the Fitzjames Gateway marked the entrance to Fellows Quad. Crenellations and chimneys peeked gleefully down at the architectural jumble from on high, and behind her towered the castle-like turret that adorned the gatehouse. Other colleges might be bigger or grander or more famous— but Merton's more modest proportions and eclectic mix of styles had the power to move Bridget deeply. This was beautiful architecture on a human scale. A narrow walkway past old stone walls brought her to the peculiarly named Mob Quad. If Bridget had to choose her favourite place in the whole of the city of Oxford, then this would be it. Tucked away out of sight of the tourists and shoppers that throned the crowded streets, Mob Quad's thirteenth and fourteenth century buildings enclosed a perfect square of bright green lawn. The tranquillity of Oxford's oldest quadrangle caused her to slow her pace. What was the hurry? If she was here to enjoy herself, then she would do so by taking the time to soak up the atmosphere. She took a deep breath and felt the tension in her shoulders ebbing away. On an impulse, she left her suitcase at the bottom of one of the staircases and climbed the stairs to the college library. With the undergraduate term not yet started, the library appeared to be empty. Bridget wandered down the central aisle, pausing briefly to glance at the various alcoves—English, modern languages, law, classics, mathematics, and history. They were arranged just as they had been in her day— the oak bookcases were crammed with so much learning it was tempting to pick a title off the shelves at random and just start reading. She had so little time for books these days. Being a parent, and a single one at that, had taken that part of her life away from her. 
she felt a tinge of regret at what she had lost. But then she remembered what she had gained in its place. A daughter, Chloe. She wouldn't undo the choices she had made. Paper rustled from the farthest alcove, and she realized that she wasn't alone after all. Peering around the shelves, she couldn't stop herself from exclaiming in pleasure. Dr. Irene Thomas was sitting at one of the tables, surrounded by piles of history books. An expert on the Elizabethan and Jacobean periods, she had made her name with a book on Sir Francis Walsingham, spymaster to Elizabeth I. She was busy writing in her notebook in a flowing, cursive script. Bridget had guessed correctly that her old tutor would keep going until the day she died. At Bridget's approach, Dr. Thomas took off her reading glasses and looked up, her face lighting up instantly in recognition. Well, goodness me, Bridget Croft, how are you, my dear? Very well, thank you, said Bridget. Her tutor's ability to remember faces and names had always been impressive, and clearly had not diminished with the passing of time. Although it's Bridget Hart now, she added. Quick as a flash, Dr. Thomas's eyes darted to Bridget's ringless left hand, and she knew that her former tutor would at once have deduced the facts of the case. Wasn't that what the study of history was all about? Looking at the available evidence and drawing conclusions. Rather like police work, in fact. Diplomatically, Dr. Thomas made no mention of Bridget's marital status. I take it that you're here for the gaudy. Yes, I thought I'd just pop into the library before going to my room. I wasn't expecting to find anyone here, but it's lovely to see you. Sit down and tell me what you've done with your life. Dr. Thomas indicated the chair opposite. I do like to hear what my students get up to once they escape from this place into the real world. Bridget gladly sat down opposite. After rushing to get here, it was a pleasure to spend time with a woman for whom she had the greatest respect and admiration. It was hard to pin down her tutor's precise age. The last time Bridget had seen her, Dr. Thomas's hair had been grey, and had now turned white, and her skin had taken on the powdery look of advanced age. But her eyes still sparkled with that fierce inquisitive intelligence that Bridget remembered so well from her weekly tutorials. In her heyday, Dr. Thomas was known to be able to complete the Times crossword in under fifteen minutes. Bridget doubted that her ability would have faded. "'Well, I'm afraid that I didn't really make use of my history degree,' said Bridget. "'I joined the police. It seemed like the only thing to do after—' "'After what happened to my younger sister, Abigail. Now I'm a detective inspector.' "'Of course,' said Dr. Thomas. I remember that dreadful business. And the police never caught her killer? No, said Bridget. But at least I now have the opportunity to bring other criminals to justice. Dr. Thomas nodded her head approvingly. I always knew you would do something worthwhile with your life. And you? asked Bridget, wanting to change the subject. Are you still teaching and writing? Dr. Thomas waved a hand over the piles of books and papers in front of her. We have so much to learn from the Elizabethans. It was a time when Britain had to establish its place in the world after the chaos caused by the break with Rome. There are so many parallels with the present day. And if we cannot learn from history, what hope is there for the future? I sometimes fear that what the Spanish Armada failed to achieve in destroying this nation, we will achieve ourselves. She paused. You do, of course, remember the date of the Spanish invasion? Uh, um, yes. It was 1587. No, 1588. Dr. Thomas held Bridget's gaze for several excruciating seconds before nodding. Yes, I see you haven't completely forgotten everything you learned here. Now, don't allow a gloomy old woman to keep you from your revelry any longer— I expect that tea is already being served. Bridget looked at her watch. It was nearly four o'clock, the time scheduled for tea to start. She rose to her feet. It was lovely to see you again, Dr. Thomas. Maybe we'll have a chance for a longer chat later on. I do hope so. Bridget collected her suitcase from where she'd left it at the bottom of the staircase 
and made her way to the grove building, a nineteenth-century addition to the college that resembled a baronial manor-house with stone gables and leaded bay windows. She lugged her suitcase up the stairs and found her allocated room on the second floor. She'd had a room in this very building in her first year in college— but times had changed, and this room now boasted an ensuite bathroom, shoehorned into one corner, a small fridge under the desk, and an internet connection. She dumped her suitcase on the bed and looked out of the window. The south-facing room overlooked Dead Man's Walk, a sandy footpath that ran east-west between the old city wall and Merton Field, once used as the route of medieval funeral processions from the old Jewish quarter to the Jewish cemetery— outside the city walls. Legend had it that the walk was haunted by the ghost of Francis Windebank, a colonel executed at that spot during the English Civil War in 1645. The ghost was supposedly visible only from the knees up, due to the change in ground level since the 17th century. Bridget didn't believe in ghosts, at least not the chain-rattling sort that stalked castle ramparts demanding vengeance for past wrongs, or that turned up as unwelcome guests at the dinner-table. But she was only too familiar with the power of memory and guilt to haunt the present. It was why she had ignored previous invitations to College Gordies. It was now twenty years since she'd matriculated at the university as a fresh-faced eighteen-year-old, and seventeen years since she'd graduated with a two-one degree in history. She was divorced with a fifteen-year-old daughter— and her career as a detective inspector with Thames Valley Police was at last getting going. Things were even tentatively looking up on the romantic front. It was time to face the ghosts of her past, and see if she couldn't put some of them to sleep. She opened the envelope the porter had given her and pulled out a timetable of the day's events. Tea with the warden, informal, was now being served in the foyer of the T.S. Eliot Theatre— she was already late, and needed to get changed out of her jeans and T-shirt. But what exactly was an informal dress code? Was informal the same as casual? She strongly suspected it was not. She had a sudden nightmarish flashback to a college dinner at which she had turned up in a short cocktail dress, when all of the other women were wearing long gowns. God, she had always found social events to be sartorial minefields. She opened her suitcase and started pulling out clothes. She'd brought three different dresses, any one of which might, or might not, be suitable for dinner later that evening. The dress code for dinner was specified in the programme as black tie. That was all very well for the men, for whom black tie meant a black dinner jacket, a white shirt, and a black bow tie. But what did it mean for the women? She would tackle that decision later. In addition to the three formal dresses, she had packed several other outfits to give her options for the various other social events of the day. But options meant choices. Difficult choices. She checked her watch. Tea with the warden, informal, had started fifteen minutes ago. At this rate, it would be over by the time she decided what to wear. The dinner at seven would be preceded by a short service in the chapel, for which no particular dress code was specified and after dinner the college bar would be open until midnight, by which time everyone, including her, would be too inebriated to care what they were wearing. For now, a pair of black trousers and a stripy Breton top would have to do. By Bridget's standards, they were smart, not informal, but it was safer to be overdressed than risk looking like a slob. She quickly ran a comb through her short, dark bob, applied a dash of nude lipstick, and checked her appearance in the mirror. For better or worse, she was ready to face the world. 3. Bridget hovered nervously at the edge of the large crowd, her teacup and saucer in hand, a small Danish pastry balanced precariously on the saucer's edge. She scanned the theatre foyer for a familiar face, but could see none. Being only five foot two never helped in these situations. It was simply impossible for Bridget to see over other people's shoulders, but at least that allowed her to hide from view. She had never been good at large social gatherings. She took a bite out of her pastry to give her courage. She hadn't kept in touch with any of her old college friends, and people had changed, noticeably, in two decades. She was struck by how old everyone looked. Well, 
they were all approaching forty. Middle-aged, according to Chloe. Many of the men were already going bald, and some of the women had obviously dyed their hair. Nearly all of them had fuller figures. She knew that she had changed, too. Grey strands had begun to appear in her own hair recently, and she had never managed to shake those extra pounds she'd acquired since having Chloe. Not that she had expended a huge amount of effort trying. Her high-pressure job and her responsibilities as a single parent left little opportunity to exercise or to eat healthy, well-balanced meals. And it didn't help that she was uncommonly fond of pasta, sticky desserts, and a glass or two of wine. She took another nibble of the Danish pastry. It really was delicious. She inched her way sideways past a group of men now running to fat, who were fondly reminiscing about their college rowing days. It seemed that getting up at five o'clock every morning in the middle of winter to run down to the boathouse for training had been the happiest time of their lives. If that was the case, she wondered why they didn't still do it. She felt a tap on her shoulder and turned around. "'Bridget, I thought it was you.' "'Bella!' exclaimed Bridget. Relieved that there was at least one person here that she recognised. Bella Williams had shared a house with her during her second year at college, together with four other girls. They had all been good friends once, but Bridget had seen none of her former housemates since graduating. Her sister's murder had wrenched her away from university, just as she should have been celebrating, and she had simply lost touch. Bridget kissed Bella on the cheek, then stepped back to take a proper look at her old friend. She was taken aback by what she saw, but did her best not to show it. Bella had been very pretty once, but the years had not treated her kindly. Now her mouth was turned down in a permanent scowl, and her skin showed signs of premature ageing. Her hair, like Bridget's, was turning grey, but unlike Bridget, she had made no effort to restore it to its original colour. Bridget couldn't help noticing that if her own attire might be described as informal, then Bella's outfit was definitely casual, even a tad scruffy. She was wearing a pair of faded denim jeans and a loose sweater with fraying cuffs. An old canvas bag was slung loosely over one shoulder. It hardly seemed like the right thing to wear to tea with the warden. But then what did Bridget know about clothes? Her own life consisted of one wardrobe gaff after another— Chloe was the one who dished out fashion advice in her house. "'How are you?' asked Bridget. "'Oh, you know.' Bella tucked her hands into her jeans pocket and gave a non-committal shrug of the shoulders. "'So-so.' Bridget had no idea what Bella meant by that. It wasn't exactly the sort of reply you were supposed to make when someone asked you how you were. Even Bridget knew that. "'But what about you?' asked Bella obviously keen to turn the focus of the conversation on to Bridget. I haven't heard from you in years. What are you doing with yourself? Married? Kids? Bridget gave Bella a quick synopsis of her life. A brief marriage resulting in one daughter, followed by a messy divorce and a career now finally beginning to get going. Wow, said Bella. So you joined the police. I would never have expected that. Bridget laughed. Me neither. She took a sip of her tea. And what do you do these days? Bella had studied classics at university, and Bridget wondered if she had pursued a career in academia. Me? Oh, I ended up going into teaching. In a university? Bella gave a hollow laugh. In a school? It's not really what I'd hoped for. It certainly wasn't what Bella had hoped for. At university she had been a rising star— expected to get a first and to pursue a glittering academic career. Bridget had fully expected her to be a lecturer at Oxford, or some other prestigious university now. But life had a way of throwing up surprises and diversions, as she well knew. "'I'm sure that teaching's hard work,' said Bridget, "'but very worthwhile.' With a teenager of her own, she had total respect for anyone prepared to spend their working day controlling a classroom of kids— followed by an evening marking homework and producing lesson plans for the following day. Maybe that was why Bella was looking so downtrodden. And at least you get nice long summer holidays, Bridget added brightly. 
Bella smiled wanly, and Bridget thought it best to change the subject. What about boyfriends or husbands? Bella shook her head. Nothing to report there either, I'm afraid. I guess I never found the right person. Well, neither did I, said Bridget. It just took me several years to find out how wrong he was. She decided not to say anything about Jonathan. It felt like tempting fate, to talk about her new relationship, which had only just got off to a very faltering start. Instead, she asked about the other housemates. Have you seen Meg, Tina, or Alexia here? I haven't seen Alexia. But Meg and Tina are over there. Bella indicated the far corner of the room where two women, one blonde, one brunette, were standing with their backs to each other, each engaged in animated conversations with other people. Their poses suggested that they were very deliberately ignoring each other. Have they fallen out? asked Bridget. Meg, Margaret Collins, to give her full name, and Tina Mackenzie, had always been the best of friends during their university days. Bella shrugged dismissively. Who knows with those two? You know what they're like. They're as stubborn and pig-headed as each other. Bridget was surprised to detect such an undisguised note of hostility in Bella's voice. The three women, Meg, Tina, and Bella, had all been inseparable at one time. She wondered what had happened in the intervening years to drive a wedge between them. As if sensing that they were being discussed, both Meg and Tina looked over to where Bridget and Bella were standing. Meg was the first to abandon the person she'd been talking to and stride across the room in her brightly coloured dress, adorned with big, expensive-looking jewellery. Her long, golden hair bounced over her shoulders. A pair of oversized sunglasses were perched on top of her head, as if she had just flown in from somewhere exotic and was attending the gaudy as part of a world tour. Bridget! she exclaimed in her louder-than-life voice. How wonderful to see you, darling! In her six-inch red stilettos, Meg towered over Bridget and Bella. Bridget, who had never got on with heels, wondered how she could possibly walk in them. Meg bent down ostentatiously to Bridget's level and planted two noisy air kisses, one on either side of Bridget's cheeks. Meg had studied biochemistry at Oxford, and had always talked of starting up her own company one day. Bridget was about to ask her what she had done since graduating, but she didn't get the chance. Clearly not wanting to be left out of the grand reunion, Tina appeared the next moment at Bridget's side. Whereas Meg favoured bold colours, bright scarlet with clashing pink accessories, Tina was tastefully turned out in an exquisite figure-hugging black dress. Her slim, youthful figure suggested to Bridget an unattainable degree of self-control, and her short, elegantly cut hair and impeccable makeup completed the vision of perfection. If this was informal, Bridget couldn't imagine what Tina might choose to wear for dinner. "'Bridget, you haven't changed a bit,' said Tina, planting a kiss on Bridget's left cheek. "'I don't know about that,' said Bridget. "'But you don't look a day older.' Yet that wasn't strictly true. Although Tina was just as thin as she'd been at twenty, the jeans-wearing student that Bridget had known had been replaced by a mature and supremely confident woman she barely recognised. Tina had studied law at university. Perhaps she was now a high-flying lawyer with a big London firm, as she'd always hoped to be. "'Well, here we all are again,' said Meg, beaming at everyone although her smile dimmed noticeably as it reached Tina. It's just like old times. Except that Alexia's not here, said Bridget, looking around the room. Alexia Patrakis was the fifth member of their circle. With her exotic background and striking good looks, Alexia had always been the most glamorous of the group. She had stood out among the other students with her glossy black hair falling in curls, her dark eyes and olive skin and she had broken more than a few male hearts during her three years at Oxford. Even as an undergraduate, she had enjoyed a jet-setting lifestyle, travelling to her family homes in Greece and the Amalfi Coast during the summer vacations. She had once invited Bridget to stay with her, but Bridget had been too timid to go. Now she wondered what on earth she had been so afraid of. "'Has anyone heard from Alexia? Where is she now? Is she coming today?' "'I'm sure she is.' 
said Bella. Knowing Alexia, she's probably in someone else's bed, said Tina. Meg's face turned to thunder. She glared angrily at Tina. In response, Tina shrugged and sipped her tea. Bridget waited to see if anyone would explain this exchange of hostilities. But instead, the two women turned their backs on each other once more, saying nothing. Bella caught Bridget's eye, as if to say, Honestly, those two. Bridget sipped her tea, feeling decidedly uncomfortable at the way the reunion was progressing. She had expected people to have changed, naturally, but hadn't counted on this open warfare between her old friends. As she pondered their behaviour, she was reminded of another reason for her growing feeling of disquiet. Whatever might be going on between Meg and Tina, and Bella, for that matter, there was an elephant in the room that no one had yet mentioned. The sixth member of their household, Lydia Curry. Lydia, of course, would not be returning to the college today. Lydia would never be returning. The awkward silence that had descended on the group was broken by the arrival of the warden and his wife, who were circulating among the guests. Both Meg and Tina eagerly turned back as the couple approached. The warden of Merton College, Dr. Brendan Harper, had been the tutor in archaeology and anthropology when Bridget was a student. He had since gone on to achieve a degree of celebrity, presenting documentaries on the National Geographic Channel, the History Channel, and more recently the BBC where he was credited with making old bones look sexy. A real-life Indiana Jones, he was the sort of man whose appeal to women seemed only to increase as he aged, particularly when he was striding around the desert in a pair of khaki shorts and sturdy walking boots, his lightly stubbled features leaning earnestly into the camera, as he explained the significance of some rare and important artefact. While Dr. Harper was in his mid to late fifties, his wife, Yasmin, was much younger. Bridget guessed maybe mid-thirties. With her long neck, finely carved features, and deep-set eyes, she made Bridget think of the famous bust of the Egyptian queen, Nefertiti. Meg was the first of the group to step forward and shake the warden's hand, switching her beaming smile back on. Warden, I hear we should be wishing you luck with your quest to become vice-chancellor of the university. Dr. Harper returned her exuberant welcome with a smile of false modesty. Thank you. It's all in the lap of the gods now. Or at least the governing body of the university, which, as you know, is the nearest we have to divinity here in Oxford. He paused while Meg laughed rather excessively at his quip. The congregation will make its decision in a week's time, he concluded. Of course, I don't hold out too much hope for myself— the other candidates are such worthy luminaries. But so are you, Warden, gushed Meg sycophantically. You're very kind to say so, said Dr. Harper. The news that the Warden was being considered as Vice-Chancellor was news to Bridget. She knew that Dr. Harper was a highly respected academic, as well as being a shameless media tart. But the position of Vice-Chancellor was the University's most senior executive position— and the warden was relatively young for the task. She wondered how he would fit it in around his busy TV schedule. "'An intrepid adventure is just what this university needs,' said Meg. "'Shake things up a bit. Dust off the cobwebs. You'd be perfect for the role.' The look of admiration on his wife's face suggested that she thought so too. It was a relief for Bridget to return to her room in the Grove building for some peace and quiet before the evening got going. She kicked off her shoes, banished her many and varied outfits to the room's small wardrobe, and flopped down on the bed. The narrow mattress had seen better days, and she doubted it would give her a good night's sleep. She stared up at the ceiling and pondered what she'd witnessed during tea. She had been looking forward to renewing old friendships, but the atmosphere between Meg and Tina had been visibly hostile, even toxic, and Bella had seemed rather downbeat and not exactly charitable towards the other two. They seemed such a disparate bunch, it was hard to remember how they'd managed to get along so well as students. She sat up and checked the seating plan for dinner. The hall comprised three long tables running lengthwise, 
with high table placed perpendicular at one end. Bridget's name appeared at the top of the central table, with Bella opposite. Meg was seated next to Bridget, and Tina was next to Bella. Alexia was placed next to Meg. Bridget gave a sigh of relief. So Alexia would definitely be at dinner. Her exuberant friend had always livened up any social gathering, and helped to put everyone in a good mood. And once the wine started flowing, any awkward social tensions should hopefully be eased. It was just as well, since, for the duration of the dinner at least, there would be no escaping the group of women with whom Bridget had shared a house in East Oxford during her second year as a student. The house, she recalled, had been typical student digs. They'd paid a small fortune for a property with a severe damp problem, mould on the bathroom walls, and a roof that leaked when it rained. Ah, yes, those were the days. On impulse, she dialed Jonathan's number. She still felt guilty about abandoning him for the weekend. He picked up on the third ring. Bridget, how's it going? Just great. Two of my friends have fallen out with each other, one appears depressed, and the other hasn't shown up yet. Looks like it's going to be a fun evening. What are you up to? She imagined him lying on the couch at home, reading a book or watching television. He hesitated just a moment before replying, "'Actually, I've just popped into the gallery. "'I know that you told me not to, but we've got a new exhibition opening on Monday.' "'It wasn't me who forbade you from going into work,' said Bridget. "'It was the doctors, and with good reason.' "'Yes, well, Vicky has been running the shop all on her own while I've been off work. "'It wasn't fair to leave everything to her. "'Organising an exhibition is a big job.' "'That's what worries me,' said Bridget. "'Don't lift any heavy paintings. "'I don't want you to injure yourself again.' "'Any romance in their embryonic relationship "'had so far been limited to gentle hugs and chaste kisses. "'It was hard to do more than that with Jonathan recovering from his injury, "'especially since they had only just begun to get to know each other properly. "'But the time she had spent visiting him in hospital "'had helped them to cement their friendship.' Bridget hoped that once he was fit and well, they would be able to move their relationship forward to the next stage. "'I promise,' said Jonathan. "'Now you must do what you promise me. Go and enjoy yourself with your grumpy friends. And remember what I said. No finding skeletons in closets.' "'I'll do my best.' She ended the call, smiling to herself. Jonathan's easygoing nature always managed to make her feel better. She flicked through the contacts list on her phone, her thumb hovering briefly over Chloe's name. Should she give her daughter a call? She was tempted to, but in the end she managed to resist. Chloe hated it when she thought her mother was checking up on her. The two of them had not always seen eye to eye recently, and it would do them both good to have a little space. Besides, Bridget was supposed to be enjoying herself at the Gordy. When was the last time she had taken a weekend off just for herself? or even part of a weekend. She could barely remember. It was time to make a decision about what to wear for dinner. She retrieved her three dresses from the wardrobe and laid them out on the bed, eyeing them nervously. Whichever one she chose, she could never hope to look as glamorous as Meg, or match Tina for refinement. When you were five foot two and carrying too much weight around your middle, you had to set realistic expectations. She knew that whatever she wore would be a disappointment, so she might as well not worry. It was a choice between a black velvet dress with a neckline that showed off her décolletage to its best advantage, a red satin dress that made the most of her skin and hair colouring, and a pale blue dress in gauze and chiffon, which, on reflection, she decided made her look like the mother of the bride. After trying each one in turn, she decided on the black velvet dress— she touched up her makeup with a dab of foundation, a smidgen of mascara, and a smear of lip gloss. Then she squeezed her feet into a pair of heels that gave her a much-needed height boost. Walking would be tricky, but hopefully she'd be sitting down for most of the evening. She checked her phone once more for any messages from Chloe, but, as expected, there were none. Then, slightly unsteadily, she made her way down the stairs and over to the chapel for the pre-dinner service. 4. 
The rich harmonies of the Dobson organ reverberated off the ancient walls of the antechapel and floated up into the belfry, filling the space with glorious sound. Bridget picked up an order of service and proceeded into the main choir of the chapel, taking a seat in the back row of pews. It was common in Oxford College chapels for the pews to mirror each other across a central aisle, instead of facing forward towards the altar. All the better for quiet contemplation. She closed her eyes and let the music of the bark fugue wash over her, soothing away the tensions of the day. Organ music in an ecclesiastical setting always had the power to transport Bridget back to her own childhood. She'd enjoyed a traditional Church of England upbringing in the nearby town of Woodstock, where her mother had arranged the weekly flowers and taught in the Sunday school. Bridget had sung in the choir, and the church had been central to her existence. Life didn't get much more Middle England than that. On coming to university in Oxford, she'd found a natural home in the chapel choir, participating in the weekly ritual of Evensong, with its musical settings of the Magnificat and Nunc Dimittis. But that safe and comfortable world had come crashing down when her younger sister had been abducted and brutally murdered. Abigail's death had shaken Bridget's foundations to the ground and pushed her in a totally new direction. Regular church attendance had fallen by the wayside as her faith struggled unsuccessfully to survive the cataclysm. Forced to confront a much darker reality than the world in which she had grown up, Bridget had joined the police force, beginning as a uniformed constable, before applying to become a detective. It was her way of trying to put things right. Not that Abigail's death could ever be put right, even if her killer were caught and brought to justice, which he never had been. The final chord of the organ music died away, and Bridget opened her eyes. The chapel was half full. None of her former housemates had turned up, although the warden was seated in the opposite pew, and the chaplain had taken his place in front of the altar. He was young, much younger than her, and had probably still been at school while she was a student at the university. She wondered if the floor-length cassock he wore concealed a pair of trendy jeans beneath. "'Welcome to our gaudy service,' he intoned. Bridget imagined Chloe sniggering at that. Was the organist wearing rhinestones? Would a flashing neon cross descend from the rafters, with angels adorned in Gucci sunglasses? That would certainly liven things up. We will start by singing the hymn, All People That On Earth Do Dwell, which is printed on your orders of service. As the organist played over the melody at full volume, the congregation rose to its feet. Familiar with the four-square tune from her choral days, Bridget joined in heartily, even though those around her were mumbling the words. There was nothing like a good sing to lift the spirits. Indeed, the first verse exhorted them to sing to the Lord with cheerful voice. But these days her musical endeavours mostly consisted of singing along to her collection of operatic CDs. Her daughter was always telling her to upload her CD library to her phone— but that was a technological challenge that Bridget was forever putting off. After the hymn, the chaplain spoke amiably about how a gaudy was a chance to review old acquaintances and friendships, and how friendships formed during university could, if properly nurtured, last a lifetime, helping us through the trials and tribulations of life. He was too young to have seen many trials and tribulations. Still, he made a good point. So why had Bridget allowed her friendships with her old housemates to lapse after leaving university? Was it simply Abigail's death that had made her cut off all previous ties and start afresh at police training college? Or was it what had happened to the sixth member of their little household? Lydia, the only member of the group who could not be expected to attend the Gordy, because she was dead. We read in the Gospel of John, chapter 15, Verses 12 to 13, the chaplain was getting into his stride now, and his voice had risen in a fervour of evangelical zeal. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Or her friends, mused Bridget. Would she lay down her life for Bella, Meg, Tina, or Alexia? 
Given that she hadn't seen any of them during the last seventeen years, it seemed a pretty tall order. Would they do the same for her? She very much doubted it. But for her sister Abigail, that was a different matter. But maintaining friendships takes work, said the chaplain. None of us is perfect, and so when problems arise we must be prepared to forgive each other. As St. Paul wrote in his letter to the Colossians, chapter 3, verse 13, Forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Amen. Amen, mumbled the congregation. It was the lesson that Bridget had grown up with. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. But it was a bitter pill to swallow. How could she ever forgive the person who had taken Abigail away from her, and who had destroyed her perfect family, driving her parents to the brink of despair? Maybe that was the real reason she didn't go to church any more. She couldn't stand being constantly told to forgive. The organist was already thundering through the rousing melody of the final hymn, Guide Me, O Thou Great Redeemer. Bridget rose to her feet and joined in, but was unable to find the same joy she'd experienced singing the first hymn, even though this was normally one of her favourites. All that talk about dying for one's friends, and of forgiving one's enemies, had stirred up too many painful memories and dark thoughts. It was hardly a great start to what was supposed to be a joyous evening. Maybe things would start to look up after a glass or two of wine. On her way out, she took the chaplain's hand and thanked him for a lovely service. It was the expected thing to do, and she had no wish to be discourteous. Up close, he looked even younger. A sprinkle of freckles covered his nose and cheeks. His eyes were blue beneath a shock of sandy-coloured hair. "'How long have you been the chaplain here?' she inquired politely. "'Since last Trinity term,' he grinned, still finding my feet. "'You're doing fine.' She moved on so that other people could have a chance to greet him. Outside, the evening air was growing cooler. The university term wouldn't start until October, but Chloe had already been back at school for three weeks. As Bridget made her way slowly back to front quad, these heels were going to kill her, she reflected that maybe it was time to properly renew old acquaintances. She resolved to enjoy herself over dinner and start rebuilding bridges. With its high vaulted ceiling, stained glass windows, and long wooden tables set for a banquet, the thirteenth-century dining hall could not have looked more magnificent if Queen Elizabeth I herself had been the guest of honour. Small table lamps the length of the hall created a cosy atmosphere reminiscent of the days when candles had provided the only illumination. Each place was set with an elaborate arrangement of cutlery, three differently sized wine glasses, and a linen napkin, artfully folded into the shape of a bishop's mitre. Gilt-framed portraits of centuries-old scholars and clerics gazed down sternly from the walls, as if envious of the four-course feast that was promised. Bridget walked the length of the hall to take her place at the top of the middle table. Meg arrived soon afterwards, sitting down next to her. Tina and Bella followed, taking their seats opposite. Each setting was marked with a name card printed in fancy lettering. The three women had all changed their clothes since Bridget had last seen them, undergoing a transformation from informal to black tie. Both Meg and Tina looked as if they'd spent the time between tea and dinner having a fashion makeover. Meg was wreathed in a concoction of purple silk and flowing organza. The elaborate dress, combined with her ample bosom, threatened to knock over one of the many wine glasses every time she leaned forward. Tina had slipped into an off-the-shoulder black dress that displayed to advantage her chiselled collarbone and toned upper arms. Bella had at least managed to change out of her jeans and jumper— into a plain blue dress, which she had teamed with a black jacket. For Bella's sake, Bridget was glad that she herself hadn't overdressed, not that she could have hoped to pull off either of the looks adopted by Meg or Tina. "'We'll have to behave ourselves, sitting so close to the warden,' joked Meg, 
glancing up at the nearby high table, where places were reserved for the warden, his wife, and other college dignitaries. Although, since we're no longer students, we can't get sent down. She grinned wickedly. So perhaps this is our chance to behave badly. What are you planning on getting up to? asked Bella. Me? Nothing, said Meg, adopting a look of wide-eyed innocence. But perhaps Tina is going to stab someone in the back with a knife. That may be your style, Meg, countered Tina archly. I always stab my enemies from the front. Bridget groaned inwardly. She'd hoped that the two women might have brought their hostilities to an end by now. She still had no idea what their problem was, and didn't think that asking them outright would help to calm the mood. Come on, girls, she said jokingly. You'd better watch out. Remember that Belle is a teacher. I'm sure she knows how to deal with unruly children. Please don't remind me about it, said Bella gloomily, and the group fell into an uneasy silence. The hall was rapidly filling up, but the place next to Meg remained empty. It looked as if Alexia may not make it after all, which was a shame. Bridget hoped that Meg and Tina were not going to snipe at each other across the salt and pepper grinders all evening. "'Bella tells me that you're a police inspector these days,' said Meg. "'Is that true, or was she pulling my leg?' "'It's true,' said Bridget. "'So if you're a detective inspector, that must mean you're a plain-clothes officer.' "'Correct. "'So you could be on duty right this minute, and no one would know.' Bridget laughed. "'I can assure you that I'm definitely not working this weekend. "'I'm here to enjoy myself. "'I wonder what they're serving?' she said brightly, picking up one of the college-crested menus that were placed at regular intervals along the tables. Immediately her mood improved. A watercress and cucumber soup with pea shoots and saffron oil, served with Brolia Garvey 2016, was to be followed by a butternut squash, sage and gorgonzola risotto. The main course was a three-bone rack of lamb with fondant potato, baby vegetables, and shallot jus, served with Chateau La Sergue, 2005. Dessert would be praline chocolate croquant, raspberry compote, and sweet Persian pistachios, served with Dow's Late Bottled Vintage, 2012. Tea, coffee, and mince to follow. She'd have to spend the rest of the week on the cabbage soup diet, but it would be worth it. They do a very similar thing at the Ivy in London, said Tina, glancing briefly at a second menu before passing it to Bella. She made it sound as if she was rather bored with fancy food. "'Is that where you hold your client meetings?' asked Meg. "'No wonder lawyers charge such a bloody fortune.' Bridget, who had never dined at the Ivy, felt her mouth watering at the prospect of the food. "'You should count yourself lucky,' Bella told Tina, echoing Bridget's thoughts. "'I don't get to eat in posh restaurants on a teacher's salary.' "'Of course not,' said Meg warmly. And some people take posh food too much for granted. I'd be more than happy with fish and chips served from a newspaper. She glared at Tina. Quite frankly, the ivy is not all it's cracked up to be. Tina looked ready to respond with a caustic remark of her own, but was interrupted by the arrival of the warden and his wife, leading a procession of tutors and assorted college VIPs to their places on high table. Once the new guests were standing by their places— the warden rapped on the table with a wooden gavel. Everyone in the hall fell silent, and then, en masse, rose to their feet. They had followed this arcane routine so many times as students, they didn't need to be told what to do. In a sonorous voice the classics tutor proclaimed the Latin grace that was printed on the back of the menu, with a helpful English translation for those who, like Bridget, were not fluent in the tongue of Virgil and Cicero. Oculi omnium in te respiciunt, domine, tu das escam illis tempore opportuno. The eyes of all wait upon thee, O Lord, and thou givest them their food in due season. Hearing Latin spoken had been one of those things Bridget had become accustomed to as a student. As a member of the chapel choir, she had done plenty of singing in Latin, and could still, if pushed, just about recite the Latin version of the creed. The matriculation ceremony in the Sheldonian Theatre, in which students were inducted into the university, 
had been conducted entirely in Latin, as had the degree ceremony three years later. The university motto is in Latin, Dominus Illuminatio Mea, The Lord is my light. In fact, a formal qualification in Latin had once been a prerequisite for studying at the university, even if your chosen subject was chemistry or mathematics. Per Jesum Christum Dominum Nostrum. Amen. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen, intoned the one hundred and fifty voices of the assembled guests. Or one hundred and forty-nine, thought Bridget, given Alexia's absence. With the formalities of grace out of the way, the black-waistcoated dining staff, who had been standing in the wings, now sprang into action, serving warm bread rolls with butter. Real butter, thought Bridget, who had spent years consuming tasteless low-fat spread with little benefit to show for it, and pouring the first wine of the evening in a carefully choreographed routine designed to be fast, efficient, and almost invisible. As if the setting wasn't theatrical enough, the first course dishes were delivered to the tables covered with silver domes, which were removed with a flourish. In eager anticipation, Bridget unfolded her napkin and picked up her soup spoon. She intended to enjoy the food, however sour the company may be. An ear-splitting scream from a high table caused her to drop her spoon before she could taste the soup. In the silence that followed, all eyes in the hall turned to the cause of the disturbance. The warden's wife was on her feet, her hands to her face, her eyes staring in horror at something on the table before her. The warden rose, too, and angrily threw his napkin down on the table. "'What is the meaning of this outrage?' he bellowed. "'Whatever it is, I'm not to blame,' whispered Meg to Bridget. But no one laughed. The tutors and college staff on high table were getting to their feet and peering at the warden's bowl of soup. "'Goodness me!' exclaimed the classics tutor in alarm. "'When I said the words, oculi omnium, I never thought—' His voice trailed away. Bridget's mind was no longer on her soup. This might be her day off, but a police officer was never really off duty. It was her job to respond to people in distress. It wasn't just her job, though. It was part of her nature— she rose to her feet and rushed over to the high table where the warden and his wife had been seated. She didn't know what she'd been expecting to see, but it certainly wasn't the sight that met her eyes. Staring up at her from the warden's soup bowl were two very round and very real eyeballs. "'Is this supposed to be a prank of some kind?' demanded the warden. "'Who would think that putting sheep's eyeballs in my soup was funny?' His wife had resumed her seat and was fanning herself with one of the menus. She looked almost as green as the soup. The biology tutor, who had been sitting at the far end of the table, came over to examine the floating orbs, as if they were specimens in his lab. "'Warden, I can categorically state that these are not sheep's eyeballs, but human,' he announced, sounding intrigued by the discovery. "'If you look closely, you can see how the shape of the iris— Whatever knowledge he had been intending to impart was curtailed by another wail from the warden's wife. The rest of the hall now erupted in a cacophony of shouts and exclamations. Almost everyone seemed to have an opinion on the matter. Quite a few people were knocking back their glasses of wine, but not many people were touching their soup. Bridget was acutely aware of the need to restore some order and preserve what looked like potential evidence of a crime, although no actual crime had as yet been uncovered. "'Everyone remain seated!' she shouted in her most commanding voice. The hubbub that had exploded faded away. "'I am a detective inspector with Thames Valley Police, and I am assuming charge of this situation.' She turned to address the college butler, who had delivered the soup to High Table and was standing nearby, a look of absolute horror on his face. "'Call the police, and inform them that a crime has been committed.' Ask them to send an investigating team to the college immediately. You can give them my name. In the meantime, cover the soup with one of those silver domes. We need to preserve the evidence. Evidence of what, precisely? asked the warden. Is this some sick joke? I don't know yet, said Bridget, but I intend to find out. The chatter in the hall had begun to grow in volume again, 
but was suddenly disrupted by a new and unexpected noise. The ringing of a bell. It's the bell in the chapel, remarked the classics tutor. Who can be ringing it at this time of day? The bell rang once, twice, three times. It paused briefly, then continued, clanging loudly and ever more wildly. Make sure that no one touches this, Bridget instructed one of the serving staff, indicating the bowl of soup containing the eyes, which was now mercifully covered by a silver dome. She turned, passing Meg, Tina, and Bella, who were regarding her with something approaching awe, and strode out of the hall. Outside, the ringing of the bell was even louder and more frantic. She hurried as quickly as she could in her heels and dress to the chapel entrance. Pushing the heavy door open, she stepped inside the antechapel. The young chaplain stood in the belfry, desperately tugging at the bell rope. As soon as he saw Bridget, he abandoned his task and ran to meet her. The shock on his face was plain to see. "'What is it?' asked Bridget. "'What's happened?' "'Over there,' said the chaplain, pointing towards a row of wooden cupboards at the end of the north transept. "'I was just about to put my vestments away after the service. She fell out when I opened the door.' "'Who fell out?' asked Bridget, struggling to keep up with him as he hurried away towards the place he had pointed to. "'Damn these shoes!' She kicked them off and ran the rest of the way to catch up with him. "'There!' The chaplain pointed at the woman's body lying sprawled across the floor by the open door of the furthest cupboard. "'Don't go any closer,' warned Bridget. "'We have to preserve the crime scene.' "'I don't know who she is,' said the chaplain. "'I do.' Bridget gazed down sadly at the corpse. Even with the amount of blood covering the dead woman's face, she could see quite clearly that it was Alexia Petrakis. Her eye sockets were two bloody holes. 5. Six pints of Yorkshire bitter, please, mate, and a jumbo pack of bacon fries. Detective Sergeant Jake Derwent had to raise his voice to make himself heard over the noise in the pub in Leeds. It was Saturday night in the city centre, and it looked as if half of West Yorkshire was out partying. He'd driven up to his hometown from Oxford on Friday night, arriving late after doing battle with the latest set of roadworks on the M1 motorway. His mum had fussed over him, reheating the shepherd's pie she'd saved, and then cooking him a big breakfast fry-up in the morning, just the way he liked it. Today he'd taken his parents to Harlow Car Garden in Harrogate for his mum's birthday, doing his best to answer his dad's questions about crime in Oxford, and fending off his mum's not-so-subtle inquiries into whether or not he'd found himself a nice girl yet, and why didn't he consider moving back up north, the price of houses being what they were in the south. There were some nice new developments in Leeds city centre, down by the river. Just right for a young man like him. He should get in now before prices shot up. He had to admit it was tempting— Oxford house prices were insane, and buying a place of his own was out of the question. Even renting was expensive, and all he could afford was a flat above a laundrette on the Cowley Road, sandwiched between an Indian restaurant and a Chinese takeaway. But for some reason he found himself resisting his mum's suggestions. He liked his flat in Oxford, despite it being a bit cramped. He liked the hustle and bustle of Cowley Road, even if it could be seedy and rough at times. But there was more keeping him in Oxford than just his flat. There was his pride. There was his job. And it was only when they'd stopped for tea and scones at Betty's Café and his mum said, "'It's not as if you have anyone special in Oxford,' that he almost blurted out, "'There's Fionn Hughes.' But he held his tongue. Any mention of the sexy Welsh detective constable at Thames Valley Police would have opened up a whole new can of worms that he wasn't yet ready to deal with. His mum would pounce on any female name as a potential girlfriend, wife, and future mother of his children, and would want to know everything about her. She'd been almost as upset as he had at the break-up of his long-term relationship with his previous girlfriend. Maybe even more so. Right now, he and Fionn were getting along just fine, both as work colleagues and, tentatively, as friends. She had definitely mellowed towards him in recent weeks, and especially after the most recent case. When he'd first got to know her, she'd been as prickly as a Welsh porcupine. Did they have porcupines in Wales? 
They had plenty of sheep, but Fion was certainly no lamb. Anyway, she'd recently confided in him that she was bisexual, and he was still chewing over what to make of that. Could he ever be comfortable with a girlfriend who was attracted to other women? Fionn had told him she found women easier to get on with because men were so often insensitive. Jake understood that she was setting him a challenge, and wondered if he could be the sensitive guy that Fionn wanted him to be. Things are going very well for me in Oxford, he found himself telling his mum and dad. Since my promotion, I've worked on a couple of big cases. That was true enough. There had been the murder of the wealthy student at Christchurch, and then the strange case of the artist shot dead in cold blood on the high street. Both murders had made the national news. "'And you say you've got a female boss?' his dad asked, spreading a generous portion of clotted cream onto his scone. "'Yeah, dear Bridget Hart. She's all right, actually,' said Jake through a mouthful of buttery scone. "'Is she married?' asked his mum. "'I don't suppose she has a family, doing a tough job like that.' "'She's divorced with a teenage daughter,' said Jake. "'And she does a good job. She's fair, and she doesn't take any crap from anyone.' He found himself wanting to defend his boss. It couldn't be easy for her, heading up murder inquiries and looking after her daughter at the same time. Especially not when her ex-husband was a senior detective in London. DCI Ben Hart had turned up unexpectedly in the middle of their last murder investigation— causing quite a discordant atmosphere in the incident room for a while. "'Shall we go and look around the Alpine house next?' he asked, to change the subject. They'd driven back to Leeds with a car boot packed full of potted plants and shrubs, and Jake had promised to give his parents a hand planting them in the morning, before heading back to Oxford. Now he was out in Leeds city centre catching up with his mates from school. They were doing the round of pubs and bars in Core Lane, Duncan Street, and Lower Brigget. Next stop would be an Indian restaurant for some much-needed carbs to soak up the alcohol. It had been a while since Jake had been out on such a monster pub crawl, and he would welcome the break. "'That'll be twenty-three pound forty, please,' said the barman in a thick West Yorkshire accent. Jake paid for the round with a grin. It wasn't just the house prices that were cheaper in Leeds. Pints were cheaper here, too. Buying a round in Oxford, he'd have been lucky to get any change out of thirty quid. Cheers, mate. He picked up the tray of glasses and snacks and carried it over to the table where his friends were waiting for refills. The table was already overflowing with empty pint glasses. The lads quickly cleared a space for him. What took you so long? asked Dan. Did the barman have trouble understanding your posh southern accent? Six pints of your very finest ale, please, barman, said Matt, mimicking a ridiculously upper-class voice. I make it snappy your working class off added Scott. A gale of drunken laughter greeted their mockery. "'I haven't got a southern accent,' said Jake crossly. Back in Oxford, the guys at Police HQ poked fun at him for his short Yorkshire vowels. He passed the beers around. Cheers. Dan was eyeing up a girl sitting at the bar, whose skirt was almost non-existent. "'What do you reckon?' he asked the lads. "'Not bad,' said Scott. "'Slapper.' said Kieran. Minga, said Rhys. Jake took a quick gulp of his pint so he wouldn't have to volunteer his opinion on the girl. He wondered what Fionn would think if she could see him now. His mates would confirm her very worst fears about coarse, insensitive males. So, mate, asked Dan, dragging his attention away from the woman at the bar. How do you rate the girls in Oxford? Are all the rumours about posh girls true? I don't know what you mean said Jake. Oxford's not full of posh girls. Come on, I bet they're all stinking rich. Jake thought again of Fion. He wondered how he could describe her to the lads, without them making fun. Fion certainly wasn't the kind of horse-riding, jolly hockey-sticks girl they crudely imagined. She had gone to an ordinary school in a Welsh mining village. In many ways, she was more working class than his mates, and yet she had studied at Oxford University— and was one of the smartest people he had ever met. There was no way he could begin to explain her to the lads. He wasn't even sure how he would describe her to himself. Fionn was different to any girl he'd ever known. He sipped his beer thoughtfully, while Dan began telling the others a dirty joke he'd heard at work. It had felt good to meet up with his old friends again. 
but now he felt as distant from them as if they were a hundred miles away. They had been wrong about him losing his northern accent, and yet it was true that a gulf had opened up between them. He'd felt the same when he'd first moved to Oxford. All those medieval quadrangles and dusty libraries and students on bicycles everywhere. But he'd never expected to feel that way in the city where he'd grown up. Was he, in fact, becoming a soft southerner, like the lads joked? Or was he now stuck in some no-man's land, no longer fitting into either of the cities he called home? His phone buzzed in his pocket, and he pulled it out to see who was calling. Fion. His heart began to race, and he felt the tips of his ears growing hot, a sure sign that they were flushing pink. He hoped his mates wouldn't notice. What could Fion possibly be phoning him about on a Saturday night? It was almost as if she'd sensed his discomfort and had called to rescue him. It was too loud in the pub to talk on the phone, and he had no desire for his mates to listen in, so he got up and headed outside to shouts of, "'What's her name, then? Is it Lucinda? Or Camilla? Perhaps Lady Henrietta?' "'Hi,' he said to Fion, leaving the din of the pub behind him. "'What's up?' Fion wasn't one for wasting time on small talk. "'There's been a murder at a Gordy in Merton College,' she said in her Welsh accent. "'You need to get yourself back down here right now.' "'Christ,' said Jake. "'I'm at the pub.' "'So I can hear. "'The thing is, the boss was one of the guests, "'so Baxter's been put in charge of the case.' "'Baxter?' "'Jake had encountered Detective Inspector Greg Baxter in the office a few times, "'but hadn't worked with him before. "'The D.I. was older and more experienced than Bridget, "'and gave the impression of being gruff and humourless.' Jake suddenly felt stone-cold sober. Hearing Fionn's voice over the phone had answered one question for him. Oxford was definitely his home now, not Leeds. The second question still hanging over him, could he be the right man for Fionn, was one that she would have to answer for herself. It was up to him to prove to her that the answer was yes. "'I'll head off first thing in the morning,' he promised. "'I'd leave right now, but I'm over the limit.' Okay said Fion. I'll see you tomorrow. It was only afterwards that he realised he had forgotten to ask the obvious question. What the hell's a Gordy? 6. Uniformed police from the local St. Aldate station had secured the college chapel, and seen of crime officers in their white suits were now crawling all over the place, rigging up arrays of bright lighting, dusting for prints taking photographs and carrying out fingertip searches of the chapel and anti-chapel. Vikram, Vic, Vijay Aragavan, the head of Soko, was in charge of the operation as usual. "'You look as if you had other plans for this evening,' he said, indicating Bridget's dress and heels with a grin. "'Or maybe CID are just better turned out these days.' "'Ha, ha! It wasn't the first time Bridget had attended a crime scene in wholly unsuitable clothes.' In fact, she was beginning to make a habit of it. This time, she wasn't even going to attempt to pull one of the white protective suits over her dress, so she was keeping her distance. A ribbon of crime scene tape was strung across the antechapel from the organ to the choir entrance, dividing the north and south transepts. All the main action was taking place in the north transept, where the body had been found. Vic's face grew serious. Sorry, it must have been a terrible shock for you. Yes. Bridget acknowledged. I knew the victim well from my student days. We were good friends, although I hadn't seen her in a long time. I was looking forward to catching up with her this weekend. That would never happen now, of course. Those lost years would remain forever lost, and she would never have the chance to catch up with her old friend. Perhaps you should go and sit down? Let others do the work this time? No, said Bridget adamantly. I want to help. The reunion that she had looked forward to so much was no longer possible, but she was determined to find out who had committed this terrible crime. It was the least she could do for Alexia. She had quizzed the chaplain immediately after discovering the mutilated body, but he had been too distraught to tell her much. According to him, he had been tidying up after the service, and had been about to put his vestments away. On opening the wooden cupboard in the north transept where the robes were kept— the woman's body had fallen out on top of him. 
In terrified panic, he had rung the bell to summon assistance. No one else was being allowed inside the chapel, and Bridget wondered what the other guests were doing now. The dinner itself had been brought to an untimely close, first by the discovery of the eyes in the warden's soup, and then by the ringing of the bell, and she imagined that the guests had probably made their way to the college bar. Maybe the horror of Alexia's murder would enable Meg and Tina to get over their differences. Then again, maybe not. "'What can you tell me about the murder?' she asked Vic. "'From the marks on her neck, it looks like she was garroted. We found a piece of wire in the cupboard, which was most likely the murder weapon. We also found a small, sharp knife, the sort you'd use for paring vegetables. You can guess what that was used for.' Bridget shuddered as she remembered the sightless sockets in Alexia's bloody face. They were joined at the tape by Dr. Sarah Walker, the medical examiner who Bridget had worked with on several murder investigations. She had clearly just finished her examination of the body, and Bridget was hoping she would be able to provide some more detailed information. Dr. Walker was never the chattiest of Bridget's colleagues. Now she regarded her with a look of professional aloofness. I understand that the murder victim was known to you. Yes, said Bridget. She was an old university friend. What can you tell me about how she died? Are you sure you want to know? There was an element of warning in Dr. Walker's voice. Yes. Whatever had happened to Alexia, it was vital for Bridget to find out as much detail as she could. I'm afraid that it was a particularly gruesome murder. Death by garroting is always unpleasant. It's been used as an execution method since Roman times, and also as a means of torture. There are many variations, but in this case a length of wire was used. Simple, but effective. The wire was looped around the victim's neck and then pulled tight, resulting in death by asphyxiation. The victim would have been completely unable to cry out, and any attempt to free herself would simply have drawn the wire tighter. Dr. Walker pulled off her latex gloves with a snap. The enucleation was carried out using a kitchen knife. Sorry, said Bridget. The what? Enucleation. The removal of the eyes. Leaving the eyelids, eye muscles, and other structures intact. In this case, the eyeballs were gouged out with a knife and hacked from the optic nerve. Quite messy. Bridget swallowed hard, struggling to maintain her poise. She was used to attending post-mortems, but had always found them the most difficult part of her job. Now she was dealing with a friend, it was hard to keep her emotions under control. Were they? I think that the eyes were almost certainly removed after death, said Dr. Walker. You'll be wanting to know the time of death, no doubt? Bridget nodded. Yes, if you can give me an estimate. It's hard to say precisely, said Dr. Walker hedging her bets as Bridget had known she would. But I would say she's been dead for at least three or four hours. Bridget felt her blood run cold at the news. If Alexia had been dead for three hours, it was almost certain that her body had been concealed in its hiding place before the chapel service had begun. All the time that Bridget had been sitting listening to the chaplain's words and reflecting on her own dead sister, her friend's corpse had been slumped in the cupboard, just yards away from her. She remembered Jonathan telling her not to go looking for any skeletons in cupboards. If only he knew. Look sharp, said Vic. From where he was standing, he had a clear view of the main chapel door in the south transept. Their cavalry's arrived. I'd best go and see how my guys are getting on. Sarah Walker also made her farewells and left, leaving Bridget standing on her own by the crime scene tape as D.I. Greg Baxter and D.C. Fionn Hughes entered the antechapel and strode towards her. The detective inspector and the young detective constable made an incongruous pair. Baxter, in his mid-fifties, grey, balding, round-shouldered and overweight, dressed in a badly fitting suit and a pair of slip-on shoes. Fionn, in her mid-twenties, tall, slim, with a pixie haircut, dressed in tight-fitting black jeans, green emerald leather jacket and a matching pair of snakeskin ankle boots with two-inch heels. 
Bridget couldn't help smiling to herself. The first time she'd encountered Fionn, she'd been leaning against Bridget's desk, clad in green motorcycle leathers, texting at breakneck speed on her mobile phone. The young constable didn't excel at interpersonal skills, but Bridget had come to value her technical ability, encyclopedic knowledge and near-photographic memory, even if Fionn's sharp tongue could make her colleagues flinch at times. Bridget had worked with Baxter in her days as a detective sergeant, but since being promoted to D.I. earlier in the year, their paths had not crossed, except in department meetings. Bridget had been glad of that. Although she and the older D.I. were now the same rank, he still seemed to think he was her superior, either because of age or gender or both. Besides, they had very different styles of working. Baxter was a competent detective, but something of a stick in the mud when it came to procedures. He got the job done, but wasn't known for his flashes of inspiration. He was an old-school detective, the sort who enjoyed a pint down the pub at lunchtime. In the old days of policing, liquid lunches had been the norm, and Baxter didn't change his habits in a hurry. Right now, he wore a frown on his face. Only on-duty police officers and members of the Socco team should be in the chapel he told Bridget. I am a police officer, she said, standing as tall as she could, and I can be on duty whenever I'm needed. For the first time that evening, she was glad of the extra couple of inches afforded her by her uncomfortable shoes. Well, you're not needed now, thank you, said Baxter. In the context of this investigation, you're a private individual attending a college gaudy, and therefore I have to ask you to leave the crime scene. You'll be questioned in due course along with everyone else. Come on, Greg. Are you saying I'm a suspect? Baxter chose his words with care. I'm not making accusations. It's far too early in the investigation for that. But from what I understand, you knew the murder victim personally and were the second person on the scene. Besides, everyone is a suspect until proved otherwise. Oh, come on! She knew he liked to do things by the book, but this was ridiculous. I can help you out here if you'll let me. I'm sure you can. But it's a question of following procedures, said Baxter. Don't make me tell you a second time to leave this to those assigned to the case. All right, then, said Bridget. Have it your own way. But I want to be kept fully informed. Alexia was a good friend of mine. That, said Baxter... Is precisely the problem. Now, if you'll allow me to get on with my job, I have a murder inquiry to run. D.C. Hughes, come with me. He marched off towards the body. Fionn turned to follow him. As she went, she gave Bridget a wink, and Bridget knew that she had at least one ally in the detective team. Despite having been dismissed from the chapel, Bridget was in no mood to join her friends down the bar just yet. Gossip and rumours about what had happened would no doubt be rife, and Bridget might learn something of value there later. But for now, she wanted facts and evidence, not wild speculation. She made her way back to the dining hall where the waiting staff were clearing the tables. Not surprisingly under the circumstances, the meal had been abandoned. Bridget didn't think she could eat anything just now, and certainly not soup. The butler was busy clearing the crockery and cutlery from high table. "'How can I help you?' he asked as she approached. He was a tall man with a commanding presence who very much looked the part in his black waistcoat and bow tie. Bridget could imagine him leading a team of staff in an old country house with footmen and scullery maids and a cook presiding over the kitchen. She showed him her warrant card, which she always carried with her, whatever the occasion. The butler put down the dishes he was holding. "'I've already been interviewed at some length by one of your colleagues,' he said defensively, not sounding as if he relished being grilled for a second time. Bridget gave him a reassuring smile. "'I'm sure you won't mind answering just a few more questions.' "'Well, I suppose not. "'Let's start with a bit of background. Mr... Kernahan. Nick Kernahan. "'What is it you'd like to know?' How long have you been doing this job, Mr. Kernahan? The butler was clearly too young to have been around when Bridget was a student here. Ten years now. 
I came here after a short stint at Wadham College. And what exactly is your role in an event like this? She indicated the dining hall and the places still laid out for dinner. Well, the menu for a formal dinner is decided in a meeting between myself, the chef, and the bursar. The bursar controls the budget. As you'd expect, the chef is in charge of the menus and all the food preparation. I'm responsible for the service. What about staff? How many work for the chef and how many work for you? The chef has a team of six who prepare food and do all the cooking. I have eight staff serving the food. That's two per table. Plus another four serving the wine. Bridget did a quick calculation in her head. Including the butler and the chef, that made a total of twenty people involved in the preparation, cooking and serving of the food and wine. It made Downton Abbey look rather low-key. And are these all regular staff? Not really. A lot of them are temps. They tend to work for short periods, then leave. We use an agency to supply them. Only the chef and I have permanent positions with the college. Tell me, who would have had access to the bowl of soup that was served to the warden? I've already explained this to your colleague, said the butler, with some obvious irritation. Anyone could have had access to it. Any of the kitchen or waiting staff, and anyone else too, for that matter. What do you mean, anyone else? The watercress and cucumber soup was a cold dish, a gazpacho. It was prepared well in advance and placed on a table at the back of the hall. If you're trying to find out, you might have had an opportunity to put the... eyeballs... in it. Then the answer is everyone who is attending the dinner this evening. Bridget recalled seeing the food on the table when she had entered the hall, each bowl covered by its own individual silver dome. I see, she said. She tried another angle. A knife was discovered in the same location as the body. It looked like the kind of implement that might be used for preparing vegetables. Yes, I've been shown it, said the butler. It's one of ours. The college's, I mean. But don't start getting the idea that one of the kitchen or serving staff must have taken it. I explained this to your colleague. The kitchen isn't kept locked. The knife could have been removed at any time. Again, anyone could have done it. The butler's answers weren't exactly helping to narrow things down. But something else occurred to Bridget then. One more question. Could the bowl of soup containing the eyes have been delivered to anyone? I mean, all the dishes looked exactly the same to me. If someone intended the warden to receive the eyeballs, how would they have known which was his dish? The warden has a gluten allergy. His food is always labelled. Interesting. As Bridget considered this fact, she heard a commotion at the entrance to the dining hall. D.I. Baxter had left the chapel and was striding down the length of the hall, a look of fury on his face. D.I. Hart, he bellowed. Did I not make myself clear in the chapel? The butler, discreet to a fault, resumed clearing the table as if nothing was amiss. You asked me to leave the chapel, said Bridget, which I did. I asked you to back off and leave me to run my investigation. I'm not getting in your way. Baxter ground his teeth together. You have no authority on this case, and it is not your job to be questioning members of staff or any other witnesses. Bridget wondered if she should tell Baxter what the butler had said about the warden's gluten allergy, but decided that he wasn't in the mood to listen to her. He could ask his own questions and find out the answers for himself. Fine she said. I'll leave you to do it your way. But what is going to happen now to all the guests? No one leaves the college until I say so, including you. Is that clear? We'll be interviewing everyone. Now, if you don't mind, I've work to be getting on with. He folded his arms and waited for her to leave the hall. Bridget decided it was time for a drink. As she left the hall and crossed the quadrangle on her way to the college bar, she noticed uniformed officers guarding the stone gatehouse. The college had become a prison. 7. Merton College Bar was just as barely furnished and seedy-looking as it had been in Bridget's student days. There were no bar stools or chairs, just long wooden benches and functional tables positioned along each wall. In Bridget's time, the college rugby players had enjoyed sliding their pint glasses up and down those long tables on a Friday night. 
an oar was fixed to each of the low ceiling beams, and the walls were covered with photographs of sports teams from days gone by. Unsurprisingly, Bridget's face didn't appear in any of the photos. She'd never been any good at sport, being too short for netball and too lazy for hockey. It seemed like every single dinner guest had relocated to the bar, and the room was completely packed. Bridget pushed her way through the crowd to the bar itself. "'A large glass of Pinot Noir and a packet of pistachios, please,' she shouted over the noise. Having interviewed the butler, she decided that she was hungry after all. She handed over a five-pound note and was delighted to receive a few coins in change. Even at these sorts of events, the college still charged student prices. Meg, Tina, and Bella were seated at the very end of one of the tables. Judging from the number of glasses and bottles covering the surface of the table, they'd downed a fair few drinks already. Meg and Tina had always been formidable drinkers. Bella made room for Bridget to sit at the end of the bench. "'I see that not much has changed here,' said Bridget. "'I don't think they've even updated the prices.' "'Nor the decor,' said Tina. "'It looks no better than when we were first here, and that was twenty years ago.' Bridget nodded. The bar might not look much different, but her three friends had altered in many obvious ways. Not only were they older, they had clearly moved on with their lives, in directions Bridget couldn't guess. She wished now that she'd made an effort to keep in touch with her old friends. She didn't even know where they lived or what jobs they did, except that Bella was a teacher. At university, Bella had studied classics and had hoped to pursue a career in academia. Tina had studied law and had been determined to become a lawyer. Meg had been a biochemist. She'd wanted to become an entrepreneur and start up her own biomedical company. Bridget wondered whether she had achieved her ambition. With her designer dress and expensive handbag, she certainly gave the impression of affluence and success. Tina, too. But before she could ask them what they'd been doing with their lives, Meg had an urgent question for her. What's happening in the chapel? No one's told us anything, but there are plenty of rumours circulating. You're a police detective now. You must know what's going on. That's right, said Bridget. But I can't tell you much about the murder inquiry. I won't be allowed to get involved with the investigation. Well, at least not officially, she thought. So it's true, then, said Tina. It was murder? Yes. And the victim was Alexia? I'm afraid so. God, that's awful. Tina and Meg exchanged glances, their earlier quarrelling brought to a halt, at least temporarily, by shared grief. "'I can't believe she's dead,' said Bella. "'Alexia was always so full of life.' It was true. Of all the friends, Alexia had been the most vivacious, and the life of any party. Like Meg, she was an extrovert, always dressing in bright colours, seeking out excitement and adventure— but she'd had a serious side, too, campaigning for worthy causes and going on marches for or against various issues. As Bella said, it was almost impossible to process the fact that she was dead. "'And then there were four, declared Meg, looking ominously around the group. "'Honestly, Meg,' said Tina, "'don't be so melodramatic. Try to show some respect for once.' In response, Meg raised her glass solemnly— to Alexia, to Lydia, let's drink to the dead. It was the first time that Lydia's name had been mentioned, and Bridget felt a kind of relief that the sixth member of the group had been acknowledged at last. Unlike the others who had left Oxford behind them and moved on with their lives, Lydia Corey had not been able to grow and change. She had taken her own life shortly after finals, at the end of that last fateful summer term, and had never even graduated from the university. For Bridget, that period of her life had dealt her a double tragedy. First, her own sister, Abigail, had been murdered, and then Lydia had committed suicide, all within the space of two weeks. The shock had been too much for her to handle, and it was perhaps no wonder that she had cut herself off from the four surviving members of the group. But she had never stopped thinking about them all, especially poor Lydia. Her friend might be gone, 
but had never been forgotten. And now Alexia was gone too. Bridget lifted her glass to Meg's. To the dead. Tina and Bella joined in too, raising their glasses and clinking them together across the table. To the dead. And to the living, added Meg, before downing her wine in one. Bridget took a careful sip of her own drink. She was as fond of a glass or two of wine as anyone, but she had no intention of trying to match Meg's alcohol consumption. Meg wiped a trickle of wine from her chin with the back of her hand. God, I need another bottle. Anyone else? Gin and tonic, please, said Bella. You can get me another bottle of Cabernet Sauvignon, if you like, said Tina, emptying the last of her wine into her glass. Nothing for me, said Bridget. Meg disappeared into the crowd, using her formidable bulk to muscle her way through the heaving mass of bodies that crammed the small space. So how exactly was Alexia killed? asked Bella, once Meg had gone. Bridget hesitated. There was a definite air of morbid curiosity underpinning Bella's question. No doubt everyone had already guessed that it was Alexia's eyeballs that had been so horribly gouged from their sockets and placed in the warden's soup. She saw no need to share any further gruesome details about the murder with them. They would find out for themselves in due course. "'I don't think I should say anything more for the moment,' she told them. "'I shouldn't really be talking to you about the investigation at all.' "'Well, what else do you think we want to talk about?' asked Bella. "'Look around you. Alexia's murder is the only topic of conversation in this entire bar.' "'That was probably true.' But Bridget had annoyed Baxter enough for one day, and didn't want to run into any more trouble with him. If he found out that she'd been releasing privileged information to potential witnesses, he would be incandescent, and rightly so. "'What I'd really like to find out,' said Bridget, helping herself to a handful of nuts, "'is what each of you has been doing since we last saw each other.' She hoped her attempt to change the subject wasn't too obvious. "'Tina, you're looking really well.' Tina did, in fact, look amazing. In her student days she had always dressed casually, and had rarely worn makeup, but now she looked immaculate with her strapless dress and polished beauty salon styling. And you too, Bella, Bridget added politely, even though Bella looked not much better now than she had done earlier in the day. Tina seemed happy for the conversation to switch away from Alexia's murder. Yes, she said, there's a lot to catch up with. "'Shall I begin? Or do you want to, Bella?' "'I'll go first, said Bella. "'My story won't take long.' "'You said that you're a teacher now?' prompted Bridget. Bella took a half-hearted sip of her drink before responding. "'Yes, well, it wasn't my first choice of career. "'As you know, I always wanted to stay on at Oxford and become a lecturer. "'But the academic world is fiercely competitive, "'and who you know is just as important as what you know.' I didn't know the right people. Bella made little effort to hide the resentment she obviously felt at the perceived injustice. So now I teach. There isn't a big demand for Latin teachers these days. But I managed to find a position in a small girls' school close to Peterborough. Everyone tells me it's a noble occupation. She tried to inject a note of brightness into her final sentence, but looked utterly disheartened. Bridget felt embarrassed and sorry for her friend. I'm sure that teaching can be very rewarding, but hard work and challenging too. A bit like being a police officer, perhaps. Maybe. So why did you choose to join the police force? Bridget knew that her usual defensive reply of, what else could I have done with a degree in history, would be too flippant for the circumstances, so she opted for the truth instead. I wanted to try and put the world right after Abigail's murder. And after Lydia's death, too, I suppose. There was too much evil in the world. I needed to try and redress the balance. And have you succeeded? It was a good question. Bridget had been promoted to Detective Inspector a few months ago, so she was obviously doing something right. And she had certainly made a difference, bringing criminals to justice and finding answers for victims' families. But how could you truly measure success if your goal was to save the world? 
Well, I suppose I've done some good, she concluded. That's all any of us can hope for, isn't it? said Tina earnestly. To do more good than evil. Meg returned from the bar then, clutching fresh bottles of Chardonnay and Cabernet Sauvignon, and a gin and tonic for Bella. She sank heavily onto the bench and sloshed more wine into her glass, spilling some over the edge. Wow, you lot look bloody miserable. What have you been talking about? Bella was just telling me about her job as a teacher, said Bridget. Meg gulped down a large mouthful of her wine. I see, so we're filling in the gaps, are we? Summarising our lives in nice, neat biographies and leaving out all the messy parts that we don't want people to know about. Apart from Bella, of course, who's desperate to tell everyone how her life went so badly wrong. Stop being such a bitch, Meg, said Tina. Sorry, can't help it, said Meg. Well, I'll happily go next. As you know, I never need an excuse to talk about myself. I might even tell you some of the messy parts, too. She manoeuvred her large bottom into a more comfortable position on the bench in readiness to tell Bridget her story. So, where were we the last time we met? We just finished finals when your sister was murdered and you had to run off back home. That really put a damper on the end of term celebrations, I can tell you. Oh, Meg, interrupted Tina again. How can you be so insensitive? Very easily. It's a knack I have. So, after Bridget left and Lydia topped herself, I decided I couldn't stand any more of this god-awful place. I moved to Cambridge and continued with postgraduate research in biochemistry. My doctorate was in gene therapy cures for congenital and hereditary blindness. Bridget decided to ignore Meg's tasteless references to Abigail's murder and Lydia's suicide. She knew that Meg meant no real harm. Gallo's humour was just her way of dealing with topics that were too difficult to discuss. "'What's gene therapy?' she queried. "'It's a technique for repairing genetic mutations in patients. We extract a sample of the patient's chromosome, replace the defective gene with a corrected version, and then inject it back into the patient. It's a life-changing treatment. We can literally make the blind see. Anyway,' After I finished my doctorate, I started my own biomedical company. I didn't just want to do research, I wanted to deliver real results to patients. And so Gen Meg Therapeutics was born. I had to name the company after myself, of course. Of course, said Tina. With an ego as big as yours, what choice did you have? Exactly. Meg took another gulp of her Chardonnay. So, now the clinical trials of the company's first treatment are almost complete, and we should be able to bring it to market as soon as we get regulatory approval. That sounds wonderful, said Bridget. Curing blindness? Yes, I think so. But not everyone seems to agree. Meg slid a sidelong stare at Tina, who turned away. What about your personal life? asked Bridget. Where do you live now? I have a house in Cambridge and an apartment in London. Half my time I'm a scientist, the other half I'm a CEO. It sounds like you have a busy schedule. Are you married? I was, said Meg acidly, but sadly not any more. What about you? Are you married? Divorced with a teenage daughter. And is there anyone special in your life right now? Bridget debated whether or not to tell them about Jonathan. As wonderful as Jonathan was, her relationship with him was at such an early and tentative stage, she didn't want to say too much. There might be. I'm not entirely sure yet. In other words, you've met some amazing hot guy, but you haven't shagged him yet, said Meg. What? she demanded, when Tina gave her a sharp look. I only said aloud what everyone was thinking. Tina sipped her glass of wine. My turn, then. It won't surprise you to learn that I became a lawyer. I work for one of the big London law firms, specialising in corporate liability. A parasite, in other words, sneered Meg. Tina continued as if Meg hadn't spoken. My clients are victims of corporate greed and arrogance. You mean they're pawns that you can use to bring massive lawsuits against hard-working, honest businesses, said Meg. I see myself as a champion for those who suffer abuse by large corporations that believe themselves to be unaccountable. Meg clapped her hands together sarcastically. The woman's a saint, 
Someone should give her a medal. Tina turned a fiery gaze on Meg. I don't need a medal. Seeing my clients receive their rightful compensation is reward enough. Bridget decided it was time to intervene before the two women came to blows. It was apparent that the pair had some ongoing personal quarrel, presumably related to Tina's work. Was it possible that her firm was bringing a lawsuit against Meg's company? Bridget did her best to change the subject. So, tell me, what was Alexia doing? Alexia became a journalist, like she'd always wanted to, said Bella. She obviously had all the right connections. At university, Alexia had written articles for student newspapers. Her ambition had been to work for one of the big national newspapers as a campaigning and investigative journalist. Bridget seemed to recall reading one of her articles in a magazine. She was bloody good at her job, too, said Meg. She started out working for the London Evening Standard, then went solo as an investigative journalist, uncovering big stories and selling them to whichever newspaper was brave enough to publish them. Remember that politician a few months ago who was caught accepting bribes from big business? It was Alexia who broke that story. Right, said Bridget. What about her personal life? The three other women exchanged glances. You know Alexia, said Tina. Her life was a whirlwind of romances and affairs. Every time I saw her she had a new boyfriend. It was impossible to keep up with her. Meg's face darkened. She certainly never missed an opportunity in that department. Come on, Meg, said Tina. Don't speak ill of the dead. Speaking's nothing to be ashamed of in my world, said Meg fiercely. Sleeping with your friend's husband is, however. Bridget stared at Meg in astonishment. Was she really saying that Alexia had slept with her husband? The hurt expression on her face left little room for doubt. Oh, Meg, I'm so sorry. It was probably my own fault, said Meg gloomily. We all knew what Alexia was like. She would pounce on anything wearing trousers. I should never have let her get near to Michael. She was the worst kind of sexual predator, said Bella. But what she did to you was shocking, even by Alexia's standards. You really can't blame yourself for what Alexia did, said Tina. Seducing Michael was an unforgivable thing for her to do. For the first time that day, it seemed that the three women were finally in agreement with each other. You're right, said Meg. I don't blame myself. I blame my ex-husband. And I blame Alexia, too. I'm not saying she deserved to die, but the truth is that she was a selfish bitch. Exactly, said Tina. She had no sense of loyalty. She may have been a good journalist, but she was a lousy friend. Treacherous, agreed Bella. Let's not pretend we're going to miss her that much. Bridget was shocked at what she was hearing. Alexia may have had a string of boyfriends and a complicated love life during her student days, but Bridget had assumed she would settle down eventually. It was distressing to hear that her old friend had seduced Meg's husband, and to hear the raw anger in Meg's voice. The cold venom in Bella and Tina's final remarks was perhaps even worse. Well, said Meg bitterly, now you know the truth. I hate Tina. Alexia and I hated each other, and Bella hates all of us, including herself. She sloshed more wine into her glass. So, let's get drunk. I'll drink to that, said Tina. She downed the rest of her glass and poured another. Bridget didn't think she could stand a second more of this. She'd been so looking forward to catching up with her friends. But now she wished she'd never come. She rose to her feet. It's been a long evening, she said. I'm turning in for the night. Bridget made her way out of the noisy, crowded bar and into the cool night air. The sky was clear, and an almost full moon watched silently over the college, lending a cold luster to its yellow stonework. The sinister effect only added to her sense of unease. Bridget's conversation with Meg, Tina, and Bella had left her deeply unsettled. So many sorrows and grievances had come to light that her mind was reeling. Poor Bella seemed quite despondent with her life. Meg and Tina's feud had driven a wedge between them, 
perhaps an irreparable one. And this business of Alexia and Meg's husband was perhaps the most disturbing revelation of all. Bridget walked through the tiny stone enclosure of Patey's quad next to the hall, and continued into Mob Quad. As she passed the chapel, a small group of figures emerged from the darkened archway that led from the south transept, rolling a gurney across the bumpy flagstones. Bridget knew without looking that Alexia's corpse lay on the trolley. She stood to one side to let the mortuary workers and uniformed officers pass. Thankfully, the body was sealed within a bag, so she was spared another view of Alexia's sightless eyes. When they had gone, she hurried on beneath the arch and onto the path that led to the grove building. She would be glad to get back to her room for the night. A lone figure sat on a bench to one side of the path, its face in darkness, shaded from the bright moonlight by a tree. Bridget? Is that you? Bridget recognised the voice of her history tutor, Dr. Irene Thomas. Will you join me? Bridget left the path and crossed the well-trimmed chapel lawn to join Dr. Thomas on the bench. Up close, the old woman's features were clear, her eyes shining bright in the night. "'I often come here to think,' said Dr. Thomas, "'especially at night. It's so peaceful.' "'It is,' agreed Bridget, taking a seat on the bench. "'I am so very sorry for your loss.' said Dr. Thomas. I know that you and Miss Petrakis were good friends, in your university days, at least. Thank you, said Bridget. We were, but I have to admit, with some regret, that I had allowed our friendship to lapse. In fact, I hadn't seen Alexia in seventeen years, not since leaving university. It's quite understandable, said Dr. Thomas. "'Considering your personal circumstances at the time?' "'Bridget nodded. "'Her old tutor's mind was so sharp "'there was never a need to explain anything to her. "'Unless she demanded an explanation, of course. "'But that was another matter. "'What are your thoughts on tonight's events?' "'inquired Dr. Thomas. "'As a police detective, I mean.' "'Bridget tried to choose her words with care.' Dr. Thomas was far too intelligent to be fobbed off with platitudes along the lines of, It's too early to say. I am not allowed to be part of the investigating team, because the victim was known to me. Of course. So I'm not privy to all the details. Naturally, said Dr. Thomas, just as in historical research, one never has access to all the source material one would like. No, agreed Bridget. Nevertheless, one must form an opinion based on the evidence available. It's certainly an unusual case, admitted Bridget, quite unlike anything I've ever encountered in the past. Are you referring to the murder method itself? Garrotting, I understand? Or the removal of parts of the body? I see that you're as well informed as usual. I have my sources within the college. I'm sure you do. Well, since you ask, I've never encountered either the method of the murder, nor the mutilation of the body after death. No. What do you think they imply? Bridget fell silent. She had resisted thinking too deeply about the way Alexia had been killed. She didn't want to imagine how she must have felt as the wire pulled taut around her throat, and she struggled ineffectually to throw off her attacker— she tried to suppress her emotional reaction and to think clearly and logically, as Dr. Thomas had always implored her to do in their weekly tutorials. "'Death by strangulation isn't particularly uncommon,' she said, "'although the use of a wire suggests a degree of premeditation. "'Indeed. Go on. "'The eyeballs are the most disturbing aspect.' Removal of body parts is an act most commonly associated with sexual crimes. It's sometimes used as a kind of signature by serial killers. And yet... Carry on. In that case, the killer usually retains the body parts as trophies. I've never heard of a murderer placing them where they will be found. No. Does it remind you of anything? 
Bridget had the sense she was being tested. Even in the darkness beneath the tree, Dr. Thomas's eyes seemed to sparkle with curiosity. No, I can't say it does. Sorry. The history tutor sighed with disappointment. Body part served at a feast is a common trope in revenge tragedy of the Elizabethan and Jacobean eras. It is? Really, Bridget? Think of Shakespeare's Titus Andronicus. Right, said Bridget, who wasn't as familiar with Shakespeare's bloodiest play as she felt she ought to be. She much preferred the playwright's lighter works, such as A Midsummer Night's Dream and The Tempest. Remind me what happens in that? A great deal. But the most relevant part is where Titus slays his enemies and bakes their heads to serve to his guests at a feast. Now I remember why Titus Andronicus isn't my favourite play. And yet, just like a good historian, a police detective must not be afraid to face the facts, remarked Dr. Thomas. As always, the tutor was right. You're suggesting that this was a revenge killing, then? It's not for me to say, said Dr. Thomas. That's for the police to determine. I'm merely pointing out the similarities. I won't be determining anything, said Bridget glumly. The detective in charge has warned me to stay well clear of the investigation. Hmm, said Dr. Thomas. Both you and I know that isn't going to happen. She rose to her feet. Good night, my dear. It's past my bedtime, and at my advanced age I find that late nights sap my energy terribly. Bridget watched her tutor walk away. There was no indication that Dr. Thomas's energy had been the least bit sapped. The old woman was as sharp as she had ever been, and in her youth her intellect had been as sharp as a knife. Bridget suspected that the history tutor had been sitting on the bench solely with the intention of catching Bridget as she returned to her college room. And although she had asked Bridget several questions, it was clear that she had already known all of the answers. Her purpose had been simply to plant the idea of a revenge killing in Bridget's mind. Bridget sat on the bench for a while longer. The Elizabethan and Jacobean periods had been violent, bloody times— and the revenge tragedy had been a popular form of entertainment in those days. The playwrights of the time had not felt any need to hold back in their crowd-pleasing productions, packed full of sex, violence, and dismembered body parts. Bridget found her thoughts returning unbidden to Meg and her ex-husband. Adultery was as good a motive as any for revenge, and if Meg had indeed murdered Alexia— she would not be the first jealous wife to exact vengeance in a bloody and violent manner. But Meg was perhaps not the only person who held a grudge against Alexia. As a journalist exposing corruption and abuse of power by people in high places, no doubt Alexia had made a number of enemies over the years. It was certainly an interesting idea to explore. The air was growing chilly, and Bridget returned to the grove building deep in thought. Back in her room, she went to the windows to draw the curtains. The moonlight cast an eerie glow across Dead Man's Walk and the playing fields beyond. If any ghosts haunted the footpath, they would surely be walking it tonight. But there were no ghosts outside, only the ones in Bridget's head. She drew the curtains tight and got herself ready for bed. Before turning out the light, her thoughts turned to Chloe and Jonathan— and to her older sister, Vanessa. She prayed that they were safe and sound. 8. D.C. Fionn Hughes poured boiling water onto her pomegranate and raspberry tea in the staff kitchen, then took her mug decorated with a Welsh dragon through to the incident room, where D.I. Baxter had called an early morning meeting to review yesterday's murder at Merton College. It was clearly too early on a Sunday morning for some people. D.S. Ryan Hooper looked as if he'd spent last night getting hammered. He rubbed his bloodshot eyes and sipped a cup of strong black coffee. D.S. Andy Cartwright also looked like he'd have preferred a few more hours in bed. Only D.C. Harry Johns looked bright and ready for action. 
Fionn knew that the young detective constable was into healthy living and liked to go for a run on a Sunday morning. Fionn herself went running most days. She had missed her morning run today in order to come into work, but would hopefully manage to find time this evening instead. She thought of Jake, and wondered if he'd managed to get away early as he'd promised. If the roads were clear, it would take him about three hours to drive from Leeds to Thames Valley Police HQ in Kidlington. Sunday morning was a good time to do the journey. She pictured him bombing down the motorway in his tastelessly painted orange Subaru, his dreadful music blasting from the souped-up speaker system, and smiled to herself. What on earth did she see in the guy? All right, everyone, let's get started. D.I. Baxter stood in front of the notice board in a light grey suit that looked like it had seen better days. A bit like D.I. Baxter himself, in fact. Baxter's hair matched the colour of his suit, and the man's beer belly threatened to burst his jacket wide open. The brown shoes on his feet did nothing to improve the overall effect. Fionn was reminded of a particularly uninspiring maths teacher she'd had at school, who would have killed the subject for her if she hadn't taken the textbook home and taught herself. Ryan stretched and yawned without bothering to cover his mouth. Andy put down his mug of builder's tea and took out his notebook and pencil, waiting to see what Baxter would say. Fionn also picked up her notebook. She knew that doing so made a good impression, but in truth she could remember everything without ever needing to write it down. "'So the dead woman,' said Baxter, "'is Alexia Petrakis, a journalist, thirty-eight years old, former student of Merton College, lived in London, and did freelance work for a number of national newspapers, investigating miscarriages of justice, that sort of thing.' Andy was jotting down every word Baxter spoke. Fionn doodled a mandala as a way of focusing her attention. The victim was murdered in the chapel of Merton College, where she was attending a college dinner to be held later that evening. She was strangled to death with a length of wire that was discarded at the scene. Then her eyeballs were cut out. Baxter delivered this shocking fact in the same monotone he'd used from the start. Fionn glanced across the room at Harry. His face had turned white at this latest piece of information, and he looked as if he might be sick any minute. She would offer him a ginger tea if he was still feeling queasy after the briefing. "'During the dinner, a pair of eyeballs were found in the warden's soup,' continued Baxter, indifferent to Harry's discomfort. "'DNA tests will confirm whether or not the eyeballs that were found did indeed belong to the murder victim.' Ryan raised a hand. Sir, do you think that the eyeballs may have belonged to someone else? His tone was as deadpan as Baxter's, despite the obvious insolence of his question. Baxter responded with exaggerated patience. That is what the DNA tests will confirm, Sergeant. Until then we should not make any assumptions one way or the other. Very good, sir. We'll keep our minds open. And our eyes, too. Baxter frowned, but said nothing to that. Instead, he consulted his notes. We interviewed all the kitchen staff last night, including the chef and the butler. The chef and his team spent most of the day preparing the food. There were to be four courses in total, although, of course, the dinner was abandoned during the starter. This was a cold soup, which was prepared during the afternoon. A gazpacho said Fionn. Baxter studied her, perhaps wondering if she was poking fun at him. A uh, gazpacho. That is correct, constable. It was dished up and the bowls were covered and left on one side, ready to be carried to the tables. The staff who served the soups were blind there was nothing amiss. Baxter hesitated, perhaps wondering if he had selected the right word. He swept his gaze around the room, looking for anyone who might find his choice of vocabulary amusing. But everyone held their faces straight. He resumed his lecture. No one can explain how the eyeballs came to be in the bowl of soup. However, we have established that the warden's soup was labelled and kept separate from the others due to his gluten allergy. Croutons, commented Ryan. The warden can't eat croutons. Croutons, indeed, said Baxter. Thank you, Sergeant. I'm guessing he isn't too fond of eyeballs either, sir. 
Harry lurched unsteadily to his feet. Excuse me, sir, he said, then rushed from the room with his hand covering his mouth. Fion sighed. It looked as if not even ginger tea would help Harry now. She took advantage of the interruption to raise her hand. Yes, what is it now? growled Baxter. I was just wondering, sir, if the eyes were intended to convey a special message. I mean, why eyes? Wouldn't it have been easier for the killer to cut off a finger instead? An eye for an eye, quipped Ryan. Baxter glowered at both Fionn and Ryan as if they were a couple of unruly schoolchildren. D.C. Hughes, we cannot possibly know the mind of the murderer, and we're not here to speculate or come up with fanciful notions. We gather evidence and interview witnesses, and we solve this case by good, old-fashioned police work. I don't want anyone running away with ideas of their own. Got that? Got it, sir, said Fionn. D.I. Bridget Hart would have welcomed suggestions at this stage. She always encouraged her team to think creatively and to use their initiative. In fact, she'd probably have had a few ideas of her own by now. We need to start filling in the blanks, said Baxter. He turned to Andy, who had already filled a whole page of his notebook. D.S. Cartwright, I'd like you to find out the victim's movements from the time she arrived in Oxford to the time she was last seen alive. Yes, sir said Andy, writing it down. Baxter pointed to Ryan and Fion. D.S. Hooper, D.C. Hughes, since you two have so much to say, you can go to the college and start interviewing the guests. There were 130 former students at the dinner last night, plus 20 tutors and other senior college members on high table. What time did they arrive at college? Where were they during the course of the afternoon and evening? What connections did they have to the dead woman? Get all the facts. Fionn grimaced at the prospect of carrying out interviews all day long with Ryan and his smart assed comments for company. Ryan, on the other hand, seemed happy enough with his allotted task. Aye, aye, sir, he said, giving Fionn a wink. Baxter rounded on him. Sergeant, if I hear one more joke like that from you, I'll have you conducting a fingertip search of the entire college. Yes, sir. Sorry, sir. So watch out, Baxter added. I've got my eye on you. Ryan struggled to keep his face straight. Wisely, he said nothing in reply. Fionn sighed. Working with Baxter was going to be a trial, but teaming up with Ryan threatened to be even more of an ordeal. She wished that Jake was back already. Where is D.S. Derwent? asked Baxter, seeming suddenly to notice Jake's absence. In Leeds said Fionn, visiting his mum. He should be back by lunchtime. Baxter grunted. Good. We need as many people on this investigation as possible. What about D.I. Hart, sir? suggested Fionn hopefully. Could she join the team? Baxter fixed her with a look like thunder. May I remind you that Detective Inspector Hart is a witness in this investigation, and is to be treated as such. I will be interviewing her myself as soon as I arrive in college, and I don't want anyone speaking to her without my permission. Is that understood? Yes, sir, very clearly. Harry returned to the room just as everyone was getting ready to leave. He looked a more normal colour now. There were damp patches on his collar where he'd splashed his face with water. D.C. Johns, barked Baxter, you can come with me. I have already interviewed the kitchen staff, but I want you to take full written statements from each of them. That will be twenty statements in total, and I want them all entered into the system by the end of today. Detailed paperwork. That's how we're going to crack this case. Yes, sir. Given that the kitchen staff prepared the soup, and that a knife in the kitchen was used to remove the dead woman's eyes, Harry flinched, but Baxter seemed not to notice or care. The kitchen staff have got to be our most obvious suspects at this point in time. Talk to them individually and try to nail down their movements throughout the day. Yes, sir. Right, sir. And no one leaves the college until we're done, bellowed Baxter. Ryan joined Fion as she made her way out of the incident room. All right, Fee. Want a lift in my car? No need, she said. I'd rather take my bike. She went into the bathroom to change into her green motorcycle leathers. 
then headed out to the car park, where her neon green Kawasaki ninja awaited her. 9. After a disturbed night of sleep in which the ghost of Alexia Patrakis had invaded her dreams, chasing her sightlessly down Dead Man's Walk, Bridget rose, showered quickly in the tiny ensuite bathroom, and got dressed. It was still early on a Sunday morning, but Bridget knew that her sister, Vanessa, who had two young children, eight-year-old Florence and six-year-old Toby, would be up and about. She had probably already baked a cake by now, and peeled all the potatoes ready for roasting later. Vanessa worked miracles in her kitchen, and never left the smallest detail to chance. She would be desperately disappointed to hear that Bridget couldn't make it for Sunday lunch. She called Vanessa's mobile in case she was out walking Rufus, the family's golden Labrador. As soon as Vanessa answered, Bridget could tell from the barking in the background that she was indeed out walking the dog. "'Be quiet, Rufus,' said Vanessa. "'Hi, Bridget. This is early for you. How was the Gordie?' Bridget thought it better not to answer the question directly. "'Vanessa, I'm sorry to bother you, but I've got a favour to ask.' "'Oh?' sounding suspicious. "'Something happened at the Gordie last night.' "'Something unfortunate. "'Now I'm stuck here in college and can't leave. "'Chloe will be travelling back from London this morning, "'and I won't be able to pick her up from the train station. "'Could you collect her, please, and take her to your place until I can get away?' "'Oh, don't say that you won't be able to make it to lunch,' said Vanessa irritably. "'You're always cancelling at the last minute. "'What could be so important that you can't leave the college?' "'Bridget debated whether or not to reveal what had happened.' Her sister always worried about Bridget's job, and would be dismayed to hear about a murder. But it would be better for her to find out from Bridget directly than to hear about it on the news. "'There was a murder here last night,' said Bridget, dropping her voice. "'We have to stay here until we've been interviewed by the police.' "'Oh, Bridget! So that's why I need you to look after Chloe for me.' "'Yes, of course,' said Vanessa, sounding flustered. I see that. I'll get James to meet you at the station in the Range Rover. James was Vanessa's husband, and was quite used to being bossed about by his wife. I'm going to be far too busy in the kitchen. You know how it is. Bridget didn't know. Her own version of Sunday lunch was a shop-bought pizza, or the microwave leftovers from the previous night's takeaway. But she knew how seriously Vanessa took her domestic affairs. Yes, of course. Thank you very much. "'By the way,' said Vanessa, "'who was murdered? "'Was it anyone you knew?' "'Now she sounded as if she wanted all the juicy gossip. "'It was, actually. "'It was one of my old housemates from my student days.' "'One of your housemates?' "'Vanessa sounded appalled. "'Yes, her name was Alexia Patrakis. "'The journalist?' "'Bridget was surprised that Vanessa knew Alexia's name. "'That's right.' Did you know her? I didn't know her. I just read her articles. She wrote for the Sunday Times and the Telegraph. The Guardian, too, I believe. She was something of a campaigner. You know, social justice, that kind of thing. Right. To Bridget's shame, it seemed that Vanessa knew more about Alexia than she did herself, at least in terms of her work as a journalist. Well, I'm very sorry to hear about it. How absolutely ghastly! That must have rather spoilt your evening. Bridget supposed that was her sister's way of offering her condolences. Vanessa had never been good when it came to expressing her feelings. You could say that, said Bridget. She wasn't going to tell Vanessa the precise way in which the dinner had been spoilt. Eyeballs in the soup would be too much for her to handle this early in the morning. So you'll make sure that Chloe's all right? Of course I will. Vanessa liked nothing better than to organise other people and sort out their problems. Now that she had got over the shock of Bridget's news, she was probably secretly pleased that she'd be able to mother Chloe for the day. I'll make sure she's properly fed and looked after until you can collect her. Thanks. Bridget wasn't sure if that was an implied criticism of Bridget's own ability to feed and look after her daughter. If it was, it was probably justified. 
Juggling a full-time career with being a single mother was a skill Bridget hadn't yet mastered, and probably never would. Take care, she said before she hung up. Next, she sent Chloe a quick message to say that something had come up at work, and that Uncle James would be meeting her at the station. She didn't think that Chloe would mind in the least. Lunch at Vanessa's would be far better than anything Bridget might rustle up. And Chloe always had a nice time with Florence, Toby and Rufus at Vanessa and James's huge detached house in leafy North Oxford. All this talk of lunch suddenly made her realise how hungry she was. She'd missed out on the four-course dinner last night, and the bag of pistachio nuts she'd eaten in the bar had only gone so far in filling the void. She slung her bag over her shoulder and headed down to the dining hall, hoping that normal service would have resumed, and that breakfast would soon be served. Bridget was in luck. As she walked up the steps to the dining hall, the smell of grilled bacon and toast wafted into the quadrangle. Breakfast was a much less formal affair than dinner, and Bridget queued with her tray at the hot counter. The college had always put on a good breakfast, and she happily filled her plate with bacon, scrambled eggs, beans, and toast. She grabbed herself a cup of piping hot coffee and looked for a place to sit. The long tables of the dining hall were beginning to fill with small groups of guests. The atmosphere in the hall was subdued, but she overheard murmurings of murder and scandal. Bridget kept her head down and found a space by herself at the end of one of the tables. Her appetite had returned with a vengeance, and she tucked into the hot food. "'Mind if I join you?' She looked up to see Meg carrying a tray piled high with food. Meg didn't wait for an answer, but sat down on the bench opposite, and began unloading the various plates and dishes from her tray. This morning she was dressed casually, but still managed to exude a sense of glamour, in a bright pink shirt and a pair of designer label jeans. Her eyes were red, however, and her coffee was black. "'Too much to drink,' she explained to Bridget. "'The story of my life!' The after-effects of the alcohol didn't seem to have dented her appetite, however, and she began to devour the various food items with gusto. "'How are you feeling?' asked Bridget. "'If you mean my hangover,' said Meg, in between mouthfuls of sausage and beans, "'it's nothing that a couple of aspirin and half a dozen cups of coffee won't fix. But if you mean how I feel about Alexia's murder, I am still coming to terms with it.' She set down her knife and fork. Look, Bridget, about last night. I just want to apologise for any bad behaviour on my part. I'd had a terrible shock. Well, we all had, obviously. Of course. Forget it. And I was half drunk, too, although that's no excuse. I said some cruel things that I wish I hadn't. Bridget took Meg's hand in sympathy. I was so sorry to hear about what happened between Alexia and your husband. Meg snorted. <laughs> Ex-husband and good riddance. Let's not talk about him. He's gone. And so now is Alexia. Let's talk about something else. Did you say you had an ex-husband too? Ben, yes. He lives in London now. My daughter, Chloe, stayed with him last night. And how old is she? Fifteen. A teenager? Unlucky you. At least I have no children of my own. That's one blessing. I've never been able to stand kids. You know I have no patience for that kind of thing. Meg had never been a patient person. She'd always been restless and driven. Perhaps that's what it took to start up your own pharmaceutical company. Bridget had always been restless too, yet she couldn't imagine herself running a business. Perhaps other qualities were needed too. Meg continued to cram food into her mouth as if she hadn't eaten in days— when do you think we'll be able to leave this place? I think you'll be allowed to go as soon as the police have interviewed you. Well, let's hope that doesn't take too long. I have a meeting in Cambridge after lunch. I wish I'd never come to this gaudy now. There was a question Bridget needed to ask Meg before Tina or Bella turned up. She glanced up and down the hall, then lowered her voice. Meg, tell me what's going on between you and Tina— you used to be such good friends. An irate look passed quickly across Meg's face. Oh, that. Tina's suing me. Can you believe it? What a bitch. I guessed it was something like that. 
Can you tell me what she's suing you for? I don't suppose it will do any harm to tell you. Meg finished her food and let her cutlery clatter onto her plate. I explained to you that my company is developing a gene therapy treatment. A cure for blindness, yes. Well, bringing a new treatment to market is a long and complex business. That's why new drugs are often so expensive. We have to run various trials, and there are a lot of regulatory hurdles to overcome. We've just successfully completed our phase three clinical trials, which means that hopefully we'll be able to start rolling out the treatment next year. But ten years ago, when we were first testing the treatment, we had a problem during our phase one trial. What kind of problem? What's a phase one trial? Meg slurped noisily at her coffee. A phase one trial is the first time that a new treatment is tested on humans. Its purpose is to find out if there are any dangers or serious side effects. The testing is carried out on a small number of volunteers before getting the green light to proceed with the larger scale phase two trials. Okay. Tina's firm is representing one of the volunteers who took part in the original trial. He developed a problem very soon after receiving the treatment. It started out as an allergic reaction, then quickly developed into multiple organ failure. He was given emergency treatment, but ended up with a serious brain injury. He never recovered. Oh, Meg. These kinds of adverse effects are rare, but they do sometimes happen. That's the whole point of the phase one trial, to find out if the treatment is safe. Anyway, it turned out that the reason for the adverse reaction was that the volunteer had a serious pre-existing medical condition that he failed to disclose to us. If we'd known, we would never have accepted him onto the study. It sounds like you have a strong defence, then. Our lawyers think so, yes. But Tina is arguing that because our recruitment process offered a financial incentive to volunteers, the patient, who was experiencing financial difficulties, was motivated to sign up for the trial without taking the time to understand the risks. Or perhaps the financial incentive encouraged him to conceal his pre-existing medical condition from us. I see, said Bridget. But the technique we've developed could give thousands of people the gift of sight, said Meg, her voice rising as she became more passionate. What Tina's doing could destroy not only my company, but the possibility of a cure. She could ruin everything I've spent my entire career working for. So you can see why we're not seeing eye to eye at the moment. She gave a weak smile. Sorry, no pun intended. Eye to eye. Bridget's thoughts went back to Alexia's empty eye sockets and the eyeballs in the warden's soup. A cure for blindness. A woman with her eyes removed. Could it be more than a coincidence? An official-sounding voice at the entrance to the dining hall alerted her to the arrival of Detective Inspector Baxter and his team. Is that the police? asked Meg. Can you ask them to interview me first, so that I can get away? It doesn't work like that, Bridget told her. Inspector Baxter has his own way of doing things. You might be waiting a while. God, what a bore, said Meg. I'll have to work on my laptop. Heavy footsteps approached the table. D.I. Hart, said Baxter without any greeting or preamble. I'll see you first. 10. Bridget drove down the Cowley Road in East Oxford to the uplifting strains of Bizet's Carmen playing on the car stereo. She'd arranged to collect Jake from home to save them both having to drive into Kidlington. The trip to the Hamilton's house in the Cotswolds should take them about forty-five minutes, depending on traffic. She quickly located the laundrette and Indian restaurant that Jake had described, and managed to slot the mini in between a builder's van and a bus that had stopped to collect and set down passengers. Her parallel parking skills were well honed from practice, and it helped having such a nifty little car. She texted Jake to tell him she was outside. She closed her eyes while she waited for him. Finishing off the bottle of wine and half of the chocolate cake last night hadn't been such a smart move. Her sleep had been disturbed by bad dreams and indigestion. And what kind of mother ate her own child's birthday cake anyway? One whose daughter went off with her mates, not caring about her mother, she thought. But it was her own fault for not sharing her plans to take Chloe out for a meal, and for not being there when she got home from school. 
and for generally being an inadequate mother in too many ways to count. Chloe had finally sent a text at 11.30 to say she was at Olivia's house and was having an epic time. At least Bridget had been able to go to sleep knowing that her daughter was safe. Unlike Zara's mother. She wondered whether Lady Hamilton had managed any sleep last night, and imagined that smooth, pale face raw with fresh, senseless grief. She jumped at the sound of a knock on the side window. "'Morning, Mum.' Jake opened the door and squeezed his tall frame into the Minnie's passenger seat. "'There's a lever under the seat,' said Bridget. "'You can adjust the position.' He slid the seat back as far as it would go, but still looked cramped. Maybe they would have been better off taking his car. He fastened his seat belt without complaining. She tapped the address into the sat-nav, then pulled out neatly from her tiny parking space, switching off the music in case Jake didn't appreciate her taste. Few people did, she'd found. The Saturday morning shopping traffic hadn't got into gear yet, but the road was already busy with buses, cyclists and delivery vans. Cowley Road was somewhat different to the broad, tree-lined roads of North Oxford, and to the tourist-crammed medieval streets of the centre. Few visitors ventured this far from the colleges, unless they were lost or staying in one of the cheap bed-and-breakfasts or family-run hotels to be found in the eastern quarter of the city. It was a lively, diverse part of Oxford, characterised by ethnic restaurants, trendy bars, traditional pubs, shared student digs, small businesses, and a live music and clubbing venue, the O2 Academy, which Bridget had so far banned Chloe from visiting. Cowley Road was the best place in Oxford to get a really good curry. She took a shortcut right into Howard Street, and navigated her way deftly along the narrow one-way street past all the parked cars. Breathe in, she told Jake as she squeezed the car through a particularly tight spot. Where exactly do the Hamiltons live? asked Jake. Shipton under Witchwood, said Bridget. She loved the way little English villages often had such fanciful names, like something Tolkien might have invented. Or two miles outside Shipton under Witchwood, to be precise. It's in the middle of the Cotswolds. I don't really know what the Cotswolds are. Well, the Cotswold Hills stretch from north of Oxford, west of the River Severn, and the Welsh border. Bridget could still remember most of her school geography lessons when they'd studied the local area. Jake seemed interested, so she carried on. Most of the Oxford colleges and university buildings are built from stone mined in the Cotswold Hills. The hills aren't really very high. It's mostly just an area of farmland with villages scattered about. All very picture-postcard. People pay a lot of money for a big country house with a view. I can imagine. So, do you mind if I ask, ma'am? Are you from around here originally? I grew up in Woodstock, just north of Oxford, said Bridget. So, yes, I'm local. I even studied at the university here, too. Sometimes she regretted going away to university, given what happened at home in her absence. But her sister's murder could not have been foreseen. The girls' school she'd attended always pushed its brightest pupils into sitting the Oxford entrance exam. She'd passed the exam, been offered a place, and had, of course, accepted it. Looking back, it was as if she hadn't really had a choice in the matter. Everything had just slotted into position, and her life had unfolded almost without conscious design. Meeting Ben, getting pregnant, having Chloe, divorcing Ben. Where had she been while all that was happening to her? But she knew where. Coping with grief, even if she'd refused to acknowledge it at the time. Perhaps she was still just coping, even seventeen years after Abigail's death. Perhaps grief still had the power to bubble up and overwhelm her if she ever dropped her guard. "'What subject did you study?' asked Jake, oblivious to the dark train of her thoughts. "'History.' "'So how did you end up joining the police, if you don't mind me asking?' "'What else could I have done with a history degree?' Jake laughed. It was Bridget's stock reply to the question, a flippant response that concealed the darker truth. She had been driven to join the police force in a desire to restore order to the world, to right wrongs and bring justice. No doubt she was hoping at some deep subconscious level to bring her dead sister back to life, or at least to obtain retribution for a young life snatched so cruelly away. That was an impossibility. Abigail's killer had never been caught, 
and there was nothing Bridget could ever do to put that right. But perhaps she could stop someone else's sister or daughter from being murdered. Zara Hamilton's face flashed before her, lying on the floor of her college room, her golden hair fanning out, clotted with blood, then laid out in the morgue, beautiful and serene, yet cold and lifeless. There was no possibility of bringing Zara back from the dead either, but at least Bridget still had a chance to find whoever had murdered her. She would find that person, whatever it took. So where did you study? she asked Jake. University of Bradford. Criminology. Well, at least one of us has some relevant qualifications then. They crossed the River Thames at Donington Bridge and joined the Abingdon Road. From there they would pick up the southern bypass and proceed northwest through the village of Ensham. It was a perfect day for a drive through rural Oxfordshire, the hedgerows luxuriant and green, the grass verges bursting with wild flowers, the landscape dotted with fields of glaringly yellow rapeseed. They passed half-timbered pubs, thatched cottages and ancient barns. Just outside Ensham, they joined a small queue of traffic at a narrow stone bridge over the Thames. The bridge was barely wide enough for vehicles to cross in both directions. Bridget fished a five-pence coin out of her pocket, lowered her window, and handed over the money to a young man at a toll booth. "'What on earth?' asked Jake, looking back at the toll booth as they drove on. "'Either a quaint and charming curiosity, or an annoying and ridiculous waste of time, depending on your point of view,' Bridget informed him. King George III granted the owner of the bridge the right to collect a toll, and no one can stop it. Think yourself lucky. If we were towing a trailer, we'd have had to pay twelve pence. The sat-nav directed them through the centre of the picturesque village of Shipton under Witchwood, past the chocolate-box houses, church and pub, all built in the same golden Cotswold stone, and down a country lane. Bridget slowed to twenty miles an hour, partly because the road was so narrow and winding, and partly because she didn't want to miss the entrance to the Hamilton's house. She needn't have worried. The entrance was impossible to miss. Huge wrought-iron gates flanked by stone pillars were guarded by carved stone lions. Bridget pulled up beside an electric intercom and pressed the buzzer. No one answered, but the gates glided open and she drove through, following a single-lane road. Open fields rolled before them, edged with dry stone walls made of the same material that had been used to construct the village. They continued along the curving, narrow road, passing trees, meadows, and pasture. There was still no sign of the house. Wow, said Jake, peering out of the window. So this is what you can buy if you have a couple of million to spare. Sir Richard's house and land was probably worth a lot more than that. Bridget knew that these grand estates changed hands for twenty million pounds or more. Of course the millionaire businessman hadn't been born into money, nor was his title hereditary. The Hamilton's money wasn't old money, the sort that was handed down from generation to generation along with land, a title, and an entry into Brett's peerage. It's what was sometimes still referred to derisively in some quarters as new money. As far as Bridget was concerned, earning money was more laudable than being handed it on a plate. And all money, whether old or new, always conveyed a certain power, and Sir Richard clearly liked to wield it and wanted everyone to know it, too. They followed the road along a tree-lined avenue, passing a stable block and a swimming pool. Then the driveway swung to the right in a great sweeping arc, and suddenly they were face to face with a Georgian mansion that looked as if it had stepped straight out of the pages of a Jane Austen novel. Wow, said Jake for a second time. The house was certainly impressive, with its aging red brick and decorative sandstone edgings, it was worth two wows. A flight of stone steps led up to the porticoed entrance. Three windows flanked the front door on either side, and seven ranged along the upper floor. A further story of dormer windows protruded from the slate-tiled roof. The otherwise perfect symmetry of the design was softened by an abundant sprawl of wisteria, covering one half of the building. The Minnie's tyres scrunched gratifyingly on the circular gravel drive in front of the house— which was bordered by a row of sharply clipped yew hedges. Bridget tugged on the brass bell-pull, and a chime sounded somewhere deep inside the house. 
A minute later, the front door was opened by a tight-lipped woman who appeared businesslike in a crisp white blouse and tailored black trousers. A housekeeper or secretary, Bridget supposed. May I help you? D.I. Bridget Hart and my colleague D.S. Jake Derwent, said Bridget by way of introduction. The woman studied their warrant cards carefully. Satisfied at last, she nodded and invited them to enter. They stepped into a marbled hallway, the panelled walls hung with oil paintings of hunting scenes. A grand staircase swept upwards, turning both left and right onto a first-floor gallery. Bridget caught a glimpse of someone. A girl, maybe sixteen or seventeen years old, leaning over the balustrade. But as soon as she looked up, the girl turned and vanished into one of the bedrooms. "'This way, please.' The housekeeper led them to a door on the left of the hall. "'If you'll wait in the drawing-room, I'll inform Lady Hamilton that you're here.' The room was the epitome of elegance. Cream silk curtains made from an excess of fabric framed the windows and trailed on the polished parquet floor. A crystal chandelier dangled from the central ceiling rose. In front of the marble fireplace, a Chesterfield sofa and armchairs were arranged around a Persian rug of exquisite design. In the far corner of the room, a grand piano stood with its lid open, as if in readiness for a soiree of classical music. Bridget wandered over to a polished table by the fireplace, on which were arranged family photographs in silver frames. They included numerous shots of Zara and Zack at different ages, and photographs of a younger child, presumably the girl she had seen on the landing. The door opened and Lady Hamilton appeared. She looked paler than yesterday, and even thinner, if that was possible. Bridget wondered if she'd eaten or slept since their last meeting. Inspector, Lady Hamilton held out a delicate hand. Judith said you were here. How may I help? We were actually hoping to speak to Zachary, said Bridget. Is he here? Zack? Why do you want to speak to him? Do you think he knows something? It's routine. Nothing to worry about. We'd just like to check a couple of facts with him. Bridget tried to make it sound as if it were no big deal. She didn't want to alarm Lady Hamilton, who looked as fragile as a blade of dried grass. Tread very carefully, Grayson had warned her. There's no room for error. Lady Hamilton wrung her hands together. Well, yes, Zachary is here. Would you like me to fetch him for you? That would be very helpful, if you wouldn't mind. Please take a seat, said Lady Hamilton, indicating the sofa and armchairs. I won't be a moment. Bridget and Jake took the two armchairs that faced each other either side of the fireplace. Zack would have to sit on the sofa between them, which would give them a good opportunity to observe him. They waited in silence, the only sound the ticking of the antique clock on the mantelpiece. After about five minutes, the drawing-room door swung open again, and Zack stomped into the room. Both Bridget and Jake stood. Zack looked no better than he had done yesterday. The cut on his cheek was now covered by a plaster, but dark purple swelling had blossomed below his right eye. "'Thank you for agreeing to see us,' said Bridget. He regarded them warily from beneath the shock of uncombed fair hair that flopped down in front of his eyes. "'Shall we sit down?' she said. She and Jake resumed their seats, and Zack took up position in the middle of the Chesterfield sofa, slouching, one arm running along the sofa's low back. Jake took out his notebook and pen. "'We'd like to ask you a few questions about what happened on Thursday.' said Bridget. What about it? His tone was sullen, uncooperative. We know that you went to the Oxford Union that evening, and we have eyewitness reports that you were involved in a fight there with Adam Brady, Zara's ex-boyfriend. We've already interviewed Adam, but we'd like you to tell us exactly what happened. What's that got to do with anything? That's what we're trying to establish. Zack shrugged. Adam's a jerk. Zara dumped him at long last. She was better off without him. He's an uncouth yob. He has no class. Bridget refrained from pointing out that both men had been kicked out of the bar for fighting. Did Adam come to meet you at the Union, or was he already there when you arrived? 
Zack sneered. He's not even a member. They shouldn't have let him in. I'll be having a sharp word with whoever was on the door that night. So Adam came there to see you? I was enjoying a drink with some friends, when that Neanderthal showed up. He obviously wanted to lash out at someone because Zara had left him. What exactly did he say to you? Zack shifted on the sofa. He was no longer slouching casually. I don't remember. Some bullshit about how life was so unfair. I told him to get used to it. And then what? He threw a punch at me. He touched his cheek and winced. You've seen how big that gorilla is. I think I handled myself pretty well, considering. The barman says he asked you both to leave. Yes, I'll be speaking to him too. That was well out of order. Adam was the one who needed to leave. He started the fight. I'm the president of the union, for God's sake. So you told me. What happened after you left? Adam skulked off. I went back to college. Did you return directly to your room? Yeah. Your girlfriend, Verity, says you were with her in your room from 11.20. But we have a witness who says they saw you banging on Zara's door at half-past eleven. He gave her a calculating look. Was that Megan? Please just answer the question. What of it? Why shouldn't I visit my sister? It's just that it contradicts what you just told us. It's only a detail. I've been drinking. I've been in a fight. How am I supposed to remember every smallest thing? And yet, since Verity is providing you with an alibi, we need that alibi to be watertight. Alibi? His eyes flashed with anger. What the fuck are you talking about? Why do I need a fucking alibi? You think I killed Zara? I was her brother, for Christ's sake. She was my twin. You have no idea. He moved to the edge of the sofa, balling his hands into fists. Jake was on his feet before Zack's fury crossed over into rage. Take it easy, mate. There's no need to get angry. We're simply trying to build a clear picture of everyone's movements. His words had the desired effect. Zack visibly calmed down and Jake resumed his seat. Bridget continued as if nothing had happened. Finding your sister's killer may well depend on small details. What we'd really like to do is eliminate you from our inquiries. To help us do that, we'd appreciate it if you could provide us with fingerprints and also a handprint. He frowned. A handprint? Is that a normal thing to request? In some circumstances, said Bridget. While Jake took the prints, Bridget asked, so, are you staying here until the investigation is over? God, no. I only came home to support Mummy. I'll be going back to college this afternoon. There's an important debate coming up at the Union. And Verity? Is she still here with you? He nodded. We'll both be returning today. She has the end-of-term ball to organise. They had just finished with the prince when the door banged open, and a red-faced Sir Richard stormed into the room. What the bloody hell do you think you people are doing? He bawled. He didn't wait for a reply. Have you no respect? This family is grieving for a daughter and a sister. You should be out there looking for the murderer, not coming here hounding my son. How dare you? The chief superintendent will be hearing from me personally about this. We were just leaving, said Bridget, trying to keep her cool. Sir Richard followed her back into the hallway. This is the last time you come here without a warrant, he said. And it's the last time you speak to my son or any member of my family without a lawyer being present. Do you understand? On their way out, Bridget glanced up at the staircase. The girl she'd seen earlier was sitting on the top step, looking down. As they left the house, Verity appeared and sat down beside the girl, putting her arm around her. From her bedroom window, Celia Hamilton watched the Red Mini execute a nimble U-turn and head back down the drive towards the gate. She would have liked to spend time alone with the detective inspector. Bridget Hart seemed like an understanding sort of person, ready to listen and not quick to judge. But she had come to speak to Zack, and, inevitably, Richard had sent her packing. Celia supposed the police must be terribly busy and didn't really have time to let you cry on their shoulders. 
There was the family liaison officer from the Met, of course. But Richard had sent her away, too. It seemed he didn't want the police intruding into their lives. What lives? Celia thought. Her life had been destroyed by this tragedy. What was the point of pretending otherwise? People often made the mistake of thinking that life was easy when you were rich. They couldn't have been more wrong. Of course, some things were easier. She'd never been short of domestic help, but then she wouldn't have needed it if they didn't own two enormous houses, one in London and one in the country. Sometimes she fantasized of living in a little cottage by the sea. And it wasn't easy being married to a man like Sir Richard. In the early days of their marriage, Richard had always been so busy, building his media empire, rubbing shoulders with the rich and powerful, doing deals. Celia had found herself having to socialize with other wives with whom she had little in common. It had been a relief when she fell pregnant, and had an excuse to say she needed an early night. But when the twins were born, she had been ill for quite a while. Richard had solved the problem the only way he knew how, by throwing money at it. He hired help for her, nursemaids and nannies, a string of young women with impeccable qualifications. But something had gone wrong somewhere along the line. Celia could never be sure when it had happened. Maybe the twins had missed out on her motherly love during those early weeks and months when she was laid low. But they had always had each other. And as they grew older, they had developed a bond that almost excluded other people. They even had their own language, which no one else could understand. She had thought that was just how twins were. It had been a relief when they'd gone away to university together. She'd thought they would look after each other. Now she wondered if she'd been terribly wrong. Between her fingers, she twisted the inspector's contact card. D.I. Bridget Hart. Oxford CID. The inspector's telephone number was printed below her name. Celia longed to call that number and tell her everything. But she knew she never would. A mother's duty was to her family. Fion would have been the first to admit she was more comfortable with computers than with people. Machines were predictable. They followed rules and she knew what they were thinking. So she was perfectly happy to be left in the office in the company of Zara's laptop, while Bridget and Jake swanned off to the Cotswolds to speak to the brother. "'Need any help with that?' asked Ryan, bounding over to her desk like an over-enthusiastic puppy dog. "'Often men were just as predictable as machines,' she mused, and it was all too obvious what the young sergeant was thinking. "'I thought you were supposed to be interviewing students in the college,' she said coolly. "'Yeah, I guess so.' said Ryan, grabbing his jacket from the back of his chair. She made herself a green tea and settled down to work. The forensics team had finished going over the laptop and had released it to her for further investigation. Zara's phone still hadn't surfaced, but Fion hoped she'd be able to access all the relevant information via the laptop. She began by checking out social media. Zara had been very active, with thousands of friends and connections online. Her Facebook page had the usual collection of personal posts. Photos of Zara alone or with friends, sometimes travelling in exotic parts of the world. A few pictures of her posing with Adam. She looked amazing in every one, even when trekking up a mountainside or when snapped late at night in a dimly lit bar. Zara didn't seem to want to draw attention to her wealthy background, and there were hardly any mentions of her family. In addition to the personal stuff, she had relentlessly posted about progressive and environmental issues, frequently reposting items from charities and protest movements. She'd been a keen supporter of the homeless charity, Shelter. Zara was even bigger on Twitter. Her focus here had been campaigning for various left-wing causes. Intriguingly, she appeared to have run not one, but several Twitter accounts, as well as one that was publicly identifiable as hers, Fionn uncovered two anonymous accounts that Zara had used in her campaigning efforts. Both accounts were heavily involved in marshalling support for the Hashtag No Oxford Platform campaign against Zach's invited speaker, Katrina Hodgson. It didn't take Fionn long to establish that the entire campaign had been orchestrated by Zara. She had clearly been vehemently opposed to her brother's choice of speaker, 
and had done everything she could to drum up opposition to it. She had even pushed for a rally to take place outside the Union building to physically deny entry to the controversial guest. Did Zack know how closely his own sister had been involved in trying to disrupt his planned debate? The fact that Zara had used anonymous usernames suggested that she hadn't been keen for anyone to know she was responsible. Next, Fionn moved on to Zara's emails. Fortunately, Zara had been very organised with her email, saving all her messages in clearly marked folders. Fionn clicked on a folder entitled College Building Project. The folder contained dozens of emails from Zara addressed to the Dean of Christchurch. Fionn clicked on the earliest email, which had been written just over six months ago. The message was long and read like an essay. She speed-read through it to get an overview of Zara's concerns. I am writing to protest about the college's plans to demolish the homeless shelter in Oxford in order to build more student accommodation. This action is morally indefensible. Christchurch is one of the wealthiest colleges in Oxford. It is unthinkable that we should be taking from the poorest in society to expand our property portfolio. Fionn remembered what Adam had said about Zara's father giving a donation to the college to build new student accommodation. Reading between the lines, it sounded as if this might be the proposed accommodation block, Hamilton House. It looked as if Zara had been determined to block her own father's efforts to donate money to the college. Judging by what she'd written, the new building would come at the cost of knocking down a shelter for homeless people. A reply from the dean's secretary thanked Zara for her input, and drew attention to the fact that the new building would provide high-quality affordable accommodation, and would be of most benefit to students from less well-off backgrounds, the implication being that Zara herself was too privileged to understand the issue. Talk about a red rag to a bull. Zara had immediately embarked on an email campaign, lobbying the dean mercilessly. She'd been met with ever terser responses. In the end, the dean's secretary had refused to reply to any further correspondence, suggesting that Zara take up her concerns with the city council's planning department. A further angry exchange of emails between Zara and the council planning officer, a Mr. Michael Prothero, had ensued. Her persistent demands had been thwarted by endless and petty bureaucracy. The last email in the folder was dated the day Zara died. She had emailed both the council and the dean again, threatening a campaign of mass peaceful protest if work began on the demolition of the shelter. She had not received any replies. Fionn leaned back in her chair and stretched out her arms. She reached for her mug of tea and found that it had long since gone cold. It was already past noon. The morning was over, but hadn't been wasted. Fionn had established two key facts. Firstly, Zara Hamilton had been a one-woman protest machine, operating both in the open and covertly behind the scenes. And secondly, whatever causes her father and brother stood for, Zara had vehemently opposed. 11. D.I. Hart, my office. It was just after lunchtime when Bridget returned to Kidlington, having stopped to grab a sandwich for herself and Jake from the drive through on the ring road. As soon as she walked into the CID suite, Chief Superintendent Grayson summoned her into his lair. He sat behind his desk, twisting a ballpoint pen between the fingers and thumb of his right hand, it was a clear sign that the superintendent was angry, and Bridget already had a pretty good idea of what he might be angry about. I've just had Sir Richard Hamilton on the phone giving me an earful about you harassing his family. Well, sir, I wouldn't put it... Sit down. Grayson began stabbing the pen repeatedly against the desktop. Did you listen to a single word I said? Yes, sir, I... What did I tell you? That Sir Richard's a bully. And? Not to do anything without telling you first. And I did, sir. I told you I was going to the Hamilton's house this morning. Grayson frowned. The pounding of the pen on the desk became more vigorous. You did. But you didn't tell me you intended to accuse Zachary Hamilton of murdering his sister. Is that what Sir Richard told you? Pretty much. Well, it's not true. I simply asked him some questions about his movements the day of the murder. I wanted to make sure of his alibi. 
You have reasonable grounds to suspect him? No, but I can't rule him out either. I was just doing my job, sir. The ballpoint pen snapped under the strain of its repeated battering. Grayson tossed the pieces into a waste paper basket. All right, carry on then. Catch the bugger who did this. The sooner we can close this case, the better. But remember... Keep you informed, concluded Bridget. She returned to the CID suite feeling frustrated. She and her team needed to be free to investigate all leads without hindrance from the dead girl's father, and that included shining a spotlight on Zack Hamilton and his activities the day Zara was killed. Right now, Zack was looking very much like a suspect in this case. She called her team together for a meeting. She began by letting the others know how she and Jake had got on with Zack, and reiterating Grayson's warning about treading warily around the family. "'I know you've all been busy this morning. Tell me what you found.' The interviews that Ryan and his sub-team had carried out hadn't revealed much at all. "'We took statements from a few people who saw Zara at Informal Hall at 6.20. Apparently she was one of the first in line, and left again soon after, as if she was in a hurry to get somewhere.' But no one saw her leave college or return. In fact, no one saw her again. We interviewed everyone who has a room in Tomquad. If these are the brightest minds of the next generation, then God help us. No one seems to have noticed a damn thing. Okay, thanks. Andy? So we made inquiries about the movements of Adam and Verity. And? Yeah, it all checks out. Adam was in the bar, knocking back beers, just like he says. Verity was chairing the ball committee, whatever the hell that is, from half-past eight until gone eleven. Sounds like they were telling the truth. About that, at least. Anything else? We worked through the guest list for the Dean's drinks reception and spoke to everyone who was there, including the leader of the council. Sounds like one big piss-up for the great and the good. The canapes were first-rate, the booze flowed freely. No one told us anything worth mentioning. Okay. Bridget wasn't too bothered about any of that. She still had her trump card to play. Jake, any luck with that handprint we got from Zack this morning? She'd sent him directly to the forensics team as soon as they got back from the Cotswolds. Bingo, said Jake, looking pleased with himself. I just got a call from the lab. The handprint that Socko found in the room being redecorated is definitely a match to Zack's. Bridget nodded. It was as she'd expected. Their trip to Shipton under Witchwood had been justified after all, despite what Sir Richard might think. They've also got a match for the blood on the towel that was found right next to the handprint. Zara's? Jake nodded. The room filled with murmurs as everyone started to speculate. A clear trail of evidence was beginning to emerge. So, what do we have? asked Bridget, holding up her hand for silence. Ryan was the first to voice what they were all thinking. So, Adam's pissed off after being dumped by Zara. Meanwhile, Zack's busy playing at being president of the Union. Adam goes to see him, possibly hoping for some sympathy, or at least an explanation of why Zara dumped him, and instead, Zack tells him what an arsehole he is. Adam lands a few punches, and Zack goes back to Zara's room. And is seen banging on her door by Megan, put in Andy. Right. He's drunk, he's hurting after the fight. He's angry with Zara, maybe even blames her for Adam hitting him, they exchange words, he hits her, she collapses. He tries to stop the bleeding with the towel, then runs away in panic, dumping the towel in the room below. Verity lies to give him an alibi, and he thinks he's got away with it. Yeah, agreed Andy. And it was probably Zack who threw up in the seminar room when he was getting rid of the bloody towel. Too much booze and a nasty shock would make anyone puke their guts up. Bridget nodded. It's certainly a possibility. But we don't have hard evidence. Zack's handprint, ventured Jake. It proves he was in the seminar room, nothing more. We can't ask for a sample of his DNA, not unless we arrest him. So there's no proof that it was Zack who was sick in that room. She turned to Fion. How did you get on with Zara's laptop? Fion's green eyes lit up and she smiled. Some interesting background. Zara didn't just oppose Zack in debates at the Union. She was very politically active online. In particular, she was running a campaign to stop the college from building new student accommodation 
with money donated by her father. Bridget frowned. Why would she do that? Because the site that the college wants to develop is currently used as a shelter for homeless people. So the donation put Zara at odds with her family. And with the college authorities. I found dozens of emails between her and the dean, or the dean's secretary, to be precise. Also emails with the city council. Any evidence that Zack was involved in any way? None that I found. She'd gone to some lengths to hide her activity. She used anonymous Twitter accounts to orchestrate the campaign to ban Katrina Hodgson, Zack's invited speaker, from speaking at the Oxford Union. My guess is that she wanted to keep the full extent of her campaigning a secret from her family. What is Katrina Hodgson supposed to be speaking about? This house believes that giving money to the homeless encourages homelessness. No prizes for guessing which side of the debate Katrina Hodgson is on. Wow, said Bridget. Incendiary stuff. All right, said Ryan. All this just strengthens the case against Zack. If Zack discovered that Zara was behind the campaign, he wouldn't have been at all happy with her. That alone might have been enough to trigger an argument. Circumstantial, said Bridget. We need cast-iron proof if we're going to arrest Zack Hamilton. We won't even be able to interview him again unless we can put a strong case in front of the chief. We need evidence, and for that we need solid police work. She checked her watch. Who wants to come with me to the post-mortem? She wasn't expecting a big show of hands. Both Jake and Ryan pulled a face, but Fionn said, I'll do it. In that case, said Bridget, Jake, Ryan, Harry, you three can start watching the CCTV footage from the college entrances. I want to know precisely who came and went and at what time. Andy, take your team back to the college. Widen the door-to-door -door inquiries. Speak to anyone and everyone. Someone must have seen Zara after she left the dining hall. And Andy, get onto the phone company and find out why they're taking so long to get hold of Zara's call records. You're just in time, said Roy Andrews, greeting Bridget and Fionn with an effusive handshake. Today's bow tie, Bridget noted, was blue with white dots. She wondered how many the pathologist had in his collection. She'd never seen the same one twice. The bow peeked shyly above the top of the plastic apron he wore over green scrubs, as if it knew it was too cheerful for a mortuary. The lower part of his face was covered by a surgical mask. Julie is preparing everything as we speak. Would you like to go in there and get changed? He pointed them towards the female staff changing rooms. The chaps from forensics are just getting ready. Five minutes later, Bridget and Fionn emerged in their scrubs, rubber boots, and masks. Even in this get-up, Fionn managed to look like the sexy female lead in a TV crime drama, while Bridget knew she looked ridiculous. The forensics guys acknowledged their arrival with a nod. They were ready with their cameras and evidence bags. Julie Pearson, Roy's assistant, was laying out the instruments Roy would use for the autopsy. A selection of lethal-looking cutters, saws, and drills that looked like they'd come from the toolbox of a serial killer. She gave them all a cheery wave. How did people in mortuaries manage to stay so relentlessly upbeat? It was the only way to survive the job, Bridget supposed. She would have hated to work in this environment all day long. The atmosphere was cool and clinical, even in the middle of summer, an effect enhanced by the harsh strip lighting and the background hum from the ventilation ducts. The white, tiled, windowless room was edged with stainless steel worktops. In the middle of this impersonal space stood a slab, on which Zara Hamilton lay like an effigy, a sheet covering her body from the shoulders down. Her golden hair fanned out around her, yet her skin seemed more like pale stone than flesh. There was something pre-Raphaelite about her, as if she was waiting to be rowed to the Isle of Avalon. "'Are we all set?' asked Roy. He made it sound as if they were about to embark on a voyage of discovery, which, in a way, they were. "'Any mortuary virgins here?' He glanced sideways at Fionn. The eyes of the young detective constable above her face mask gave nothing away. Either she was unaffected by the presence of death, or very good at hiding her feelings. "'This is my first post-mortem,' she said. "'But you don't need to worry. Blood doesn't bother me.' 
We'll be seeing a lot more than blood today, said Roy, as if he relished the prospect. Bridget had trained herself over the years to get used to post-mortems. She was better now than she had been, unless the victim was a child or a teenager. Every dead teenage girl laid out on a mortuary trolley reminded her of Abigail. In recent years, the corpses had started to look more and more like Chloe. She nodded to Roy. Ready when you are. Fionn took out her notebook and pen, ready to take notes. The forensics men switched on their cameras. Is this thing on, Julie? Roy pointed at a microphone hanging down from the ceiling above the slab. Julie gave him a thumbs-up sign, and he began his delivery. Forensic post-mortem of Miss Zara Hamilton. Saturday the 8th of June, conducted by Dr. Roy Andrews in the presence of Julie Pearson, D.I. Bridget Hart, and D.C. Fionn Hughes. He waited for the forensics guys to speak their names, too. Then came the job of removing Zara's clothing and bagging it up for the forensics men to take back to the lab. A yellow summer dress and a matching bra and knickers in pale pink. Pretty, but not overtly sexy, thought Bridget. Zara's taste had been good. She waited patiently while the forensics men got to work, cameras clicking, taking snapshots of the body. When they'd finished, Roy stepped back up to the slab as if for his starring role. Thank you, gentlemen, he said, nodding as the forensics men moved aside. The warmer packed thought Bridget. Now it was time for the main billing. The pathologist cleared his throat. Preliminary findings first. I took the body's temperature when it was brought into the mortuary on Friday lunchtime. Temperature at midday on Friday was twenty degrees Celsius. Normal body temperature, as I'm sure you're aware, he directed his attention to Bridget and Fion, is thirty-seven degrees Celsius and on average a dead body cools down at the rate of one degree per hour. "'So can you give me a more accurate time of death?' asked Bridget, hopefully. "'Hold your horses. It's not that simple.' "'I'd be surprised if it was.' Roy's eyes smiled at her above his face mask. "'Her body temperature had dropped seventeen degrees, which would put the time of death at seven o'clock on Thursday evening. But... He held up a gloved finger. There are complicating factors. Firstly, thin people like Zara here cool more quickly than those of us with, how shall I put it, more of nature's insulation. He patted his own ample stomach. Diplomatically put, thought Bridget. Secondly, a second gloved finger shot up. She was sprawled on the floor and not curled up. And finally, she was wearing a thin summer dress. All three might well have resulted in more rapid cooling. Therefore, the true time of death is likely to be later in the evening, perhaps around nine, ten, or eleven, but probably not as late as midnight. Fionn made a careful note. That's very helpful to know, said Bridget. It was becoming clear that a key question to establish was whether or not Zara was already dead when Zack was seen banging on her door. The other indicator of time of death is the state of rigor mortis, continued Roy. Zara was completely rigid when she was brought in at midday on Friday, which is compatible with my earlier hypothesis that the time of death was somewhere between nine o'clock and eleven. It's now... He glanced at the clock on the wall, which read three o'clock. Another twenty-seven hours since she was brought in, and, as you can see, the small muscles of the eyes and face have started to relax. He gently prodded the girl's eyelids, making Bridget wince. But at least the eyes stayed closed. There was nothing worse than a corpse that watched you throughout the proceedings. All clear so far? asked Roy. Bridget nodded. As to the actual cause of death, the primary cause would appear to be the blunt force trauma to the back of the victim's head. But we'll know more once we open her up. Is there any possibility this could have been an accident? asked Bridget. Might she have fallen and hit her head on some surface? Patience, please, dear I heart. There is a procedure to be followed here, as I am sure you are well aware. Good things come to those who wait. 
Roy started with an external examination, commenting on every mark while the forensics men took more detailed photographs. Other than the wound to the head, there were no bruises on the body. Next he took biological samples, plucking hairs from Zara's head, scraping her fingernails and swabbing her genital area. There's no obvious evidence of defensive wounds, he said, and no evidence of sexual assault either. Bridget breathed a sigh of relief. At least that was one less thing to worry about. All right, said Roy at last. Now we move on to the internal examination. Bridget glanced at Fion. This was usually the point at which inexperienced detective constables had been known to pass out. Fion's green eyes showed no sign of emotion, so Bridget guessed she was doing all right. With practised strokes, Roy drew a Y shape on Zara's torso, from the shoulders down to the groin. Then he cut her open and removed the breastplate, revealing her heart and lungs. Bridget swallowed, willing herself not to look away, but seeking instead to detach herself mentally from the process. As she had told Jake, Zara's body was now evidence in the investigation. The girl was dead, but she could still communicate with them from beyond the grave, revealing vital clues to how she died, and perhaps other secrets, things that Zara herself could no longer tell them, things that no one else knew, except perhaps her killer. Fion leaned in closer, peering with interest at the space opening up in the corpse's chest. Roy worked quickly and meticulously, lifting out the organs and inspecting them, then passing them to Julie, who weighed them and sliced off samples for further analysis. Even though the cause of death was in all probability the trauma to the head, Home Office rules insisted on detailed examination of all the internal organs. Well, there was nothing wrong with her innards, said Roy. Now for the head. As he moved to stand behind Zara's body, Bridget found she was holding her breath. This part of the autopsy was going to tell them what they most needed to know. It was also the most difficult to watch. Roy made an ear-to-ear -ear incision over the top of the head and peeled back the scalp. Then he sawed away part of the skull to reveal the brain. Bridget experienced a strange feeling of anticlimax, as if she'd been expecting the brain of this brilliant young student to be different somehow from the brains of ordinary mortals. As if all that studying of English literature and accumulated knowledge would have resulted in something more stellar. Zara's brain looked disappointingly like other brains. But still, a brain was a remarkable thing. What knowledge, thoughts, and memories stored in the neural pathways of that lump of grey matter were now lost to the world forever. It wasn't as if you could download all that data onto a flash drive. Once it was gone, it was gone. Roy and Julie carefully rolled Zara over, so that they could examine the injury site in more detail. Hmm, said Roy, peering at the wound to the back of the head. Tweezers, please. Julie passed him a pair of fine-tipped tweezers. With care he pulled several fine white threads from Zara's blood-clotted hair. He held one up to the light for them all to see. These fibres may have come from a cloth or tissue used to try to stem the blood flow. The forensics men were ready with their evidence bags. Probably from the blood-soaked towel, commented Fion. This is interesting. Can you see what happened here? Roy motioned for Bridget and Fion to gather closer. Bridget peered at the wound from where she was standing. She was quite close enough. A piece of bone has broken loose from the skull and been forced into the cranium, causing concentric fractures to occur. Yes, said Bridget. She didn't really understand what she was looking at and was happy to take Roy's word for it. It's a common enough outcome in this kind of injury. The shape of the bone matches the object that caused it. As you can see, the displaced bone is elliptical in shape and measures perhaps ten centimetres along its major axis. I'll be making a more detailed measurement later. But there's something else in here, too. With extreme delicacy, he extracted an object from Zara's skull and placed it on a glass dish that Julie held out for him. What is it? asked Bridget. That, said Roy, 
Looks to me like a sliver of purple glass. I'd say it came from the murder weapon. Bridget stared at the glass fragment, the hairs on the back of her neck slowly rising. I know what this is, she said. I know where to find the murder weapon. Twelve. Harry, said Jake to the young detective sitting at the desk facing his. Any chance of a decent cup of coffee round here? I was thinking the same thing, said Ryan, the other sergeant. Caffeine boost needed, Harry. But why do I have to get it? moaned Harry. Because Jake and I are sergeants, and you are but a lowly constable, said Ryan. Respect for authority is the foundation stone of human civilization. I read that in a Christmas cracker once. Go on, off you go. Yeah, all right, agreed Harry. I could use a break anyway. The three of them had been trawling through the CCTV footage from the college entrances for hours. Ryan and Harry had taken the videos from Meadow Gate and Canterbury Gate, leaving Jake to study the footage from Tom Gate, the college's main entrance on St. Aldate's. Normally a Saturday afternoon would have found Jake in one of the pubs off Cowley Road, pint in hand, watching the football on a big TV. The season for his own team, Leeds United, was over, but a couple of international friendly matches were playing today. He would just have to catch up with them later. Instead, he stared at his computer screen, watching people enter and leave the college just as closely as he ever watched any game of football. Closer, in fact, because he was running the video at one and a half times normal speed. Otherwise, he'd be here all night. He watched as students and academic staff came and went through the big double gates that were kept open during daylight hours. Tourists crept inside in small groups, trying to get pictures of Tom Quad on their phones but were never allowed more than a couple of feet inside the gates before being dismissed by the bowler-hatted custodians. The Bulldogs, as Ryan called them. At one point, a homeless man who appeared to be drunk staggered into the college and was sent on his way with a firm shove. The message was clear. Undesirables were not welcome in these hallowed halls. At just after half-past six, six-thirty-two to be precise, Someone looking like Zara strode out through the college gates. Jake rewound thirty seconds and watched again to make sure it was definitely her. Yes, there was no mistaking that long blonde hair, nor the summer dress she was wearing when they found her yesterday. She walked with a natural grace and confidence that seemed effortless. She'd certainly have made Jake's head turn if he'd seen her in the street. She exited left out of the college, walking away from the city centre, Jake paused the video and made a note of what he'd seen with the relevant timings. Then he settled down for another session. Where had Harry got to with those coffees? As if on cue, the DC returned with three lattes from the Starbucks round the corner. Real coffee, said Harry. Not like the dishwater that comes out of the machine here. Cheers, mate, said Jake, taking his coffee. Hot, milky, and with two sugars. It would power him through the next few hours of tedium. He took a sip and returned to his screen. Around eight o'clock there was a lot of coming and going from the main gate, as the dean's guests arrived for the drinks reception. But Jake just managed to catch sight of Zara returning to college. He made a note of the time. Fifteen minutes later, Zack's girlfriend, Verity, left with a couple of other students. They were all carrying folders— Jake had assumed that the ball committee meeting she'd chaired had taken place in the college. But maybe it was held somewhere else. Local pub? He made a note to check. Ryan wandered over to peer at his screen. Found anything yet? Yeah, a couple of relevant sightings. That's good, said Ryan, yawning. At Meadowgate it's just a steady stream of tourists trooping in and out all day long. The college must milk a fortune out of them. As the evening progressed, the number of people coming and going through Tomgate diminished, and Jake fast-forwarded the video to twice normal speed. He had to concentrate harder, but made quicker progress. Half an hour after Verity had left, Zack himself was on his way out, dressed in formal black tie, black dinner jacket, white dress shirt, and black bow tie. He looked immaculate, and certainly hadn't been in a fight yet. He turned right on leaving the college and headed north up St. Aldate's towards Carfax, 
presumably on his way to the Oxford Union. At nine o'clock, Verity re-entered the college, this time alone. Just after nine o'clock, a custodian appeared and pulled the large double gates closed, leaving only a small pedestrian gate inside the main gate open, just wide enough for one person to step through at a time. The smaller gate appeared to be operated with a security pass. Verity reappeared twenty minutes later, carrying more files. More stuff for the meeting? At five past ten, a very drunk-looking Adam stumbled out through the door and onto St. Aldate's. For a moment he staggered around as if unsure of his direction. Then he seemed to come to a decision and headed north towards Carfax, the same direction Zack had taken earlier. Fists were about to start flying at the Oxford Union. "'Whoa!' said Ryan suddenly. "'Have you seen the score?' "'What?' "'South Korea beat Austria 3 nil. "'Oh, cheers!' said Jake, who'd been planning on watching the match when he got home. Sorry. Did I spoil it for you? asked Ryan, not sounding the least bit sorry. Who do you support, then? Leeds. Ha! You're a glutton for punishment. Loyalty, I call it. A fine quality, said Ryan, both in life and in football. So, what about your chances of scoring with the young and unattached DC Fion Hughes? What do you mean? asked Jake, startled by the question. "'It's a football metaphor,' explained Ryan, deadpan. "'Scoring means—' "'I know what it means,' blurted Jake, turning red. "'Why do you think I'm interested in Fion?' "'That would be my superior powers of observation, no doubt. "'Well, you got it wrong, mate.' "'Really? So you won't mind if I try my own luck?' "'Be my guest.' "'Right.' I'll report back in due course. Jake returned to his task, rattled by Ryan's banter. He had no idea if the guy was serious or if he was just winding him up. He wasn't entirely sure himself what he thought of Fionn. She was a real stunner, for sure, but rather strange and aloof. He did his best to dismiss all thoughts of her lithe, leather-clad form and concentrate on the video. Zack returned at five past eleven, looking in no better state than the homeless man who tried his luck getting into college earlier in the evening. He carried his jacket in one hand, slung over his shoulder, his bow tie hanging loose, his collar undone. He walked with the traditional zigzag gait of the severely inebriated. His hand kept going to the cut on his cheekbone. It took him a couple of goes to open the door to the college with his security pass. There was no sign of Adam. Suddenly, Jake sat bolt upright. Verity and her co-committee members returned to college at close on midnight. According to Verity, she'd been waiting in Zack's room from eleven o'clock, and had spent the rest of the evening with him. But Verity hadn't even been in the college during that time. She had lied, and Zack's alibi was blown. Result. Spotted something? asked Ryan. Yeah, said Jake. I think I may even have single-handedly solved this case. Nice work. In that case, the beers are on you. Thirteen. Chief Superintendent Grayson was waiting in his office, as patient as a spider, almost as if he'd been expecting to be told of a breakthrough. Whether this was some sixth sense honed by decades in the job, or just wishful thinking, Bridget was pleased not to disappoint him. She knocked on his glass door and entered. She didn't waste time taking a seat. Sir, I think we've got enough on Zack to make an arrest. Only the narrowing of his eyes told her that this was not the news he was hoping for. First, his alibi has been blown. The CCTV footage proves quite clearly that his girlfriend, Verity, wasn't in college until nearly an hour after she claimed. That leaves Zack without an alibi, and we know that he was in college during that time. Circumstantial, was all Grayson had to say to that. Secondly, continued Bridget, undaunted, Zack was seen banging on Zara's door at a time consistent with the time of death. Grayson swatted the fact away like a fly. Circumstantial again. Thirdly, Zack's handprint was found on the wall of the seminar room immediately below Zara's. The wall had been freshly painted that afternoon. Next to it was a towel covered in Zara's blood. 
Anything else? I've just returned from the post-mortem. The pathologist confirmed that Zara was killed by a blow to the head from a blunt object. A fragment of purple glass was embedded in Zara's skull. In Roy Andrews' opinion, it most likely broke off the murder weapon on impact. Yes. She delivered her coup de grace. When I was in Zack's room yesterday, I saw a glass paperweight on his desk. It's the same colour glass as the fragment found in Zara's skull. She waited for that to sink in. My theory is that Zack and Zara got into an argument. He was drunk. The argument turned violent and he struck her with the paperweight. Afterwards, he tried to stop the bleeding with the towel, then ran off, dumping the towel on his way out. He and Verity concocted the alibi afterwards. The chief super was listening carefully, studying her through hooded eyes. He said nothing for a minute. Then, all right, bring him in. I'll take the flak. But be discreet. Bridget followed the marked police car down Banbury Road as they battled through the late evening weekend traffic. Sitting next to her in the passenger seat was Jake. His long legs folded awkwardly like before, but obviously elated that they were acting on his discovery. We've got him, haven't we, ma'am? He pressed eagerly. One step at a time, cautioned Bridget. The evidence was sufficient to justify an arrest, but they needed more to make a murder charge stick. She knew that Grayson had taken a bold decision in backing her. She prayed it wouldn't turn out to be a reckless one. We still need the forensic evidence to back us up. A quick phone call to Jim Turner in the Porter's Lodge before they left Kidlington HQ had confirmed that Zack had indeed returned to college from the Cotswolds. Bridget hoped they'd find him in his room in Peckwater Quad. She wasn't expecting him to cooperate meekly like a lamb, hence the presence of the two uniformed officers in the other car. Both were battle-hardened old-timers who wouldn't take any crap from an uppity rich kid. The two vehicles entered St. Aldate's and pulled up near Christchurch. The area in front of the college gates was packed with a bustling crowd. "'What's going on, Mum?' asked Jake. Bridget already knew what. Half of the people spilling onto the road in front of them were wielding cameras packing huge lenses and professional flashes. Press photographers— as Grayson had warned, the wolves had scented blood at last. The college had closed its gates to them, and two grim-faced custodians were standing guard at the entrance, preventing anyone from approaching. Shit, swore Bridget. Someone must have tipped off the press. Not one of us, asked Jake, sounding appalled. She shook her head. It could have been anyone. A student, a member of staff at the college, a friend of the family. A tip like that can earn good money. The case had all the ingredients needed for a front-page story in tomorrow's Sunday papers. The violent murder of a beautiful young woman. An Oxford student and daughter of a titled businessman. And an opportunity to wheel out all the usual clichés and stereotypes of the British class system. Up ahead, the two uniformed police officers emerged from their car and began pushing their way through the crowd. Cameras flashed. Journalists swarmed around them, clearly loving the action. Shit, said Bridget again. Come on, let's get this done. She forced her way past the cameras and microphones, very glad of Jake's tall frame to plough a furrow in front of her. She kept her head down and said nothing in reply to the shouted questions. At Tomgate, a bowler-hatted custodian held the narrow wooden door open for them to pass. They made their way to Peckwater Quad, ignoring the stares of the handful of students who were milling excitedly around the quad. When they arrived at Zack's room, they heard voices. Bridget rapped three times on the door, and the voices fell silent. The door opened, and Bridget was greeted by a scowling verity. The girl's expression quickly changed from contempt to bewilderment when she noticed the two PCs hovering behind. "'Is Zack here?' asked Bridget. "'Yes.' "'Good.' We'd like to speak to him, please. She walked into the room without waiting for a response. The three men followed. Zack was sprawled on the sofa, drinking a glass of wine. An empty bottle lay on its side at his feet. He raised his glass to her in mock salute. 
Well, if it isn't D.I. Smarty Pants and her trusty sidekick come to ask more of their tedious questions. His expression darkened when he saw the two uniformed constables. I thought my father warned you not to come near me again. Zachary Hamilton, said Bridget. I am arresting you on suspicion of murder. You do not have to say anything, but it may harm your defence if you do not mention when questioned something which you later rely on in court. Anything you do say may be given in evidence. Zack stared at her, dumbstruck, but Verity's response was instantaneous and vicious. This is ridiculous. Zack didn't kill his own sister. For God's sake! Bridget swivelled to face her. Miss Cunningham, one of the reasons I am arresting Zack is because we have evidence that the alibi you provided for him is false. Do you have anything to say to that? Verity's mouth fell open, but no sound came out. No, I didn't think so. Bridget signalled for the uniformed PCs to step in. They marched up to Zack and hauled him to his feet. Get your hands off me! roared Zack. He struggled in the men's grip before allowing them to cuff him. You people have no goddamn manners! Bridget almost laughed at that. I'm entitled to one phone call, aren't I? he demanded. You'll be able to make a phone call from the station, and then your phone will be confiscated as evidence. Christ, muttered Zack. It's like a bloody police state. As the two PCs led Zack from the room, Bridget moved over to the desk. Amongst the bottles of vodka and scotch and the used glasses was a purple glass paperweight. On one side, the glass was clearly chipped. Bag that up and bring it in for evidence. Bridget told Jake. Verity stared at them, horrified, then flew from the room. Fourteen. When is his lawyer getting here? asked Bridget, dumping her bag on her desk. Jake had gone on ahead in the police car to drop the paperweight off before forensics all went home for the evening. The police car had made use of its blue flashing lights and siren to zoom past the traffic on the Banbury Road, but Bridget had got stuck behind a double-decker bus, and it had taken her an age to get back to HQ. Jake checked his watch. Should be here within the hour. She's driving over from London. London? Bridget rolled her eyes. Zack used his one phone call to contact Daddy, who told him to say nothing until the family lawyer arrives. She's from some top-notch London law firm, apparently. Terrific. Bridget was familiar with the type. This lawyer probably earned in a day what Bridget earned in a month. Where's Zack now? Interview room two. He wanted to know if we had somewhere more comfortable he could wait. Duty officer told him it's not the bloody Ritz. All right, it won't hurt him to stew for a while. Have we taken a DNA sample and fingerprinted him yet? First thing we did, ma'am. The forensics team are working on it. Okay. Bridget knew that the case against Zack would stand or fall on the strength of the detailed forensic work that was now taking place behind the scenes. She had staked a lot on the evidence going her way. Good work, she told Jake. Now see what you can get off his mobile phone. Yes, Mum. D.I. Hart, my office, now. Detective Chief Superintendent Grayson's voice boomed across the CID suite. Oh, Christ, muttered Bridget. Good luck, whispered Jake. Bridget had barely closed the chief super's door before he began. Well, D.I. Hart, I don't need to ask you how the arrest went, because I've just watched it on the news. What did you not understand about the word discreet? Sir? Sit down and shut up. Now watch this. He turned his laptop screen so she could see, clicked his mouse, and a video began to play. The footage was shot immediately outside Tomgate. Bridget watched with dismay as the two PCs emerged from the gate, an aggrieved-looking Zachary Hamilton between them. His hands were clearly cuffed behind his back. Bridget and Jake followed a few paces behind, trying to avoid making eye contact with the cameras. The film tracked Zach as he was bundled into the car and driven away. Grayson stopped the video. His mouth was drawn in a tight line and a vein pulsed in his right temple. How the hell did those vultures know what was happening? I don't think they knew anything specific about the arrest, sir. 
but it's impossible to keep a murder like this a secret. It was bound to leak. Was it strictly necessary to cuff him? He resisted arrest, sir. The constables made the decision. I see. Grayson sighed, pressing his forefinger and thumb into his eye sockets. So what's happening now? We're waiting for his lawyer to arrive. She's on her way from London. Oxford lawyer's not good enough for the son of Sir Richard Hamilton, eh? The remark was a concession that Bridget appreciated. It would appear not, sir. Very well, then. When she gets here, let me know. I want to observe this interview from the other side of the glass. Yes, sir. Bridget left Grayson's office with mixed feelings. She'd smoothed over his immediate fury, but she didn't much like the idea that her boss would be watching from behind the two-way mirror, as if she wasn't under enough pressure already. She checked her watch. It was already nearly six o'clock, and they were still waiting for the lawyer to make her grand entrance. The phone rang, and Jake picked up. Great. We'll be down straight away. Thanks for letting us know. He put the phone down. That was the desk sergeant. She's just arrived. About bloody time. Meet me downstairs. I'd like you to join me in the interview. You handled Zack well this morning. Thanks, Mum. I'll be with you in a minute. From the handful of people in the lobby, there was no mistaking the lawyer. Everything about her, from the salon-tinted hair and flawless makeup to the well-cut designer suit, mulberry handbag and briefcase, spoke of an eye-watering hourly rate. In her patent high-heeled shoes, she towered over Bridget. She held out a manicured hand. Caroline Butler, from the law firm Kingsley Butler & Cook. D.I. Bridget Hart. Are you the senior investigating officer? asked Caroline, looking surprised. Yes, why? Oh, no reason. I was expecting to find someone more senior in charge, given the high profile of the case. Bridget bristled at that. Couldn't the family have found a lawyer closer to Oxford? she asked pointedly. We do have them here, you know. Kingsley Butler and Cook have been the Hamilton family's lawyers for years. Bridget forced a small smile. She mustn't allow this high-powered lawyer to rattle her. Well, let's not waste any more time, shall we? This way, please. Behind Caroline's back, Bridget thought she caught a glimmer of amusement on the desk sergeant's face. She led the way down the corridor in a cloud of expensive perfume that she couldn't identify. They met Jake coming in the opposite direction, and the lawyer accepted a quick handshake from him. Would you like a coffee? asked Jake. A skinny latte, please, said Caroline. Dream on, thought Bridget. The canteen did black or white coffee, with sugar or without. They all tasted much the same. I'll see what I can do, said Jake. They stopped outside interview room two. Zack is in here, said Bridget. Caroline looked at her watch. We'll start the interview in one hour. I want to spend some time alone with my client first. I'm sure you understand. She opened the door and disappeared inside. She's stalling, said Bridget, fuming. We've wasted time already waiting for her to arrive, and now this. It was a standard technique of lawyers to delay the start of the interview. They only had twenty-four hours in which to question Zack before they had to either charge him or release him. The clock was ticking, but there was nothing they could do. I'll get to that coffee, said Jake. Okay. Tell them to use full-fat milk if they've got it. Jake grinned. Bridget returned to her desk and phoned Chloe. She braced herself for the familiar voicemail message to kick in. But instead, Chloe answered on the seventh ring. Hi, Mum. Hi, darling. Are you back home from Olivia's? Yeah, don't worry. Everything's good. Bridget heard music playing in the background, and the chatter and giggle of other girls' voices. It was inevitable that Chloe would take her friends back to her empty house. Bridget wondered if there were any boys there. Listen, I'm sorry, but I've got to work late tonight. Sure, no problem. Chloe sounded positively elated at the prospect of having the house to herself and her friends. A pause. Then, are you working on that dead student case? Where did you hear about that? Everyone in Oxford has heard about it. By everyone? 
Chloe presumably meant her school friends. But she was right. Now that the press had arrived in town, very soon literally everyone would know. Well, are you? demanded Chloe. You know I can't discuss work with you. You are! I knew it! said Chloe with obvious glee. I think there's a pizza in the freezer if you want it tonight, said Bridget. Don't try to change the subject. Anyway, we already got a bucket of KFC when we were in Oxford earlier. Oh, right. Bridget hated the thought of her daughter living off fast food. She'd wanted to be a better parent than that. But life just kept getting in the way. At least they'd be having vegetables at her sister's house on Sunday. Don't forget that you're going to lunch at Aunt Vanessa's tomorrow. I haven't forgotten. Aren't you coming too? It depends on how the case is going. The dead student case? probed Chloe. No comment. Chloe laughed at that. Bridget savoured the shared moment. I'll see you later. Yeah, bye, Mum. The phone went dead. Jake waved her over. Look at this, Mum. He handed her Zack's mobile phone. Some very interesting text between Zara and Zack over the last week. He seemed buoyed up by what he found. Bridget scrolled up and down the screen, reading and rereading the exchange with mounting interest. Very good. Can you print these out for me? Sure. While he did that, Bridget grabbed herself a quick coffee from the machine. Milk. One sugar. That unmistakable dishwasher taste. And sat down to read once more through the case notes on Zack. Having all the facts at her fingertips was a habit that stretched back to her days as an Oxford undergraduate and the weekly one-on-one -on -one tutorial with her tutor, a woman possessed of unparalleled mental agility and wit. She had constantly challenged Bridget with probing questions and controversial hypotheses, forcing her to engage in arguments which she hadn't previously considered. Grueling at the time, but a surprisingly good preparation for a police detective. At seven o'clock on the dot, Bridget decided she'd allowed the overpaid lawyer more than enough time with her client, and told Jake it was time to go. She tapped on Grayson's door to let him know she was about to start the interview. Before heading downstairs, she tasked Fionn with finding out how forensics were getting on. She needed fast results if she was going to nail Zack. She knocked on the door of the interview room and entered without waiting for a reply. She was pleased to note that Caroline's mug of coffee was untouched, and had gone cold. Zack had not been offered any. He sat slumped in his chair, looking tired. An hour alone with the London lawyer had obviously been an exhausting experience. Good, thought Bridget. It shouldn't take him long to crack. I think we'll make a start, she said briskly. She and Jake took seats opposite the lawyer and her client. Miss Butler has a long journey back to London. I'll be staying at the Randolph Hotel until this matter is satisfactorily concluded, said Caroline. Of course, thought Bridget. Five-star luxury in Oxford's best hotel for the celebrity lawyer. Zack could expect the comfort of a police cell for the night. She switched on the digital interview recorder. Is everyone ready? Yes, said Caroline curtly. Zack just nodded. Good. Bridget pressed the record button on the machine. This interview is being recorded. This is an interview with... She looked across at Zack. State your full name, please. Zack said nothing. Just stared at her with a look full of disdain. Your name, please, repeated Bridget patiently. If Zack was going to behave like a spoilt brat, they could sit here all evening. She'd seen hardened criminals break after a few hours of waiting. And whatever Zack was, he certainly wasn't that. Zachary Hamilton, he said eventually. And your address, please? Which one would you like? He was playing with her, flaunting his wealth. The one where you reside during term time will be fine. Christchurch, Oxford. For the sake of the recording, Bridget identified herself and asked Jake and Caroline to do likewise. Once she'd stated the date and time, explained the procedure for accessing the tape afterwards, and repeated the words of the caution, they were ready to start. She began with some easy questions to loosen him up and get him talking. Zack, can you tell me about the early part of the evening of Thursday the 13th of June? Did you see your sister Zara at any time during that evening? 
he delayed slightly before answering, as if probing the question for some kind of trap. No, the last time I saw her was earlier in the day, just after lunch. Where did you see her? In Tomquad. She was on her way to the library. I was just returning from a tutorial. What did you say to her? Nothing much. I'd just asked her how she was. And how was she? Good. A trace of a smile. He was visibly relaxing as the questions flowed. Caroline, by contrast, was perched on her seat like a bird of prey. And how did you spend the rest of that afternoon? asked Bridget. I was working in my room until dinner. Bridget found the idea of Zack doing much work hard to believe, but she let that pass. He may well have been in his room, though, with a delectable verity. And what time was dinner? Like I told you previously, I went to Formal Hall at 7.20. Alone? With Verity. That's Verity Cunningham, your girlfriend? Of course. The smile had gone. He was bored now. What did you do after eating? I went to the Oxford Union, around nine o'clock. In your initial statement to police, said Bridget, you claimed that after visiting the Union, you returned to college at eleven o'clock and spent the rest of the night in your room, in the company of Miss Verity Cunningham. Is that correct? Zack leaned back in his chair, looking uncomfortable. Is that correct? Caroline gave him a nod, and he answered, Yes. Verity stated specifically that you were with her from 11.20, and yet CCTV footage supplied by the college indicates that although you returned to college at 11.05, Verity herself did not return until 11.55. Why did you and Verity lie when you told us you were in your room together during that time? I didn't lie, said Zack. I just didn't know exactly what time I got back. Caroline fixed Bridget with a steely gaze. Please do not accuse my client of lying, D.I. Hart, unless you have unequivocal evidence that he did so. So, Zack, continued Bridget, tell me precisely what you did after returning to college. I don't remember. I've been drinking. You remember nothing about your movements? He shook his head. Interesting. At 11.30, Megan Jones... Zara's neighbour, reports seeing you banging on Zara's door. In her statement, she describes your mood as foul and states that you were hammering violently on the door. Do you remember that? Like I said, I was drunk. But surely you remember knocking on Zara's door? Zack looked to Caroline, who nodded. I may have gone there, but I didn't see her. There was no answer. Why did you go? I wanted to see my sister. Why did you want to see her? Zack shrugged. I just did. Does it matter? Caroline shot him a warning look. I have advised my client not to comment on questions that have no relevance to the case. Okay, said Bridget. Let's take a step back. Earlier that evening you were involved in a fight with Adam Brady, Zara's ex-boyfriend, at the Oxford Union. What was that about? You'll have to ask Adam, said Zack. He started it. I think what my client means is no comment, said Caroline. No comment, said Zack, with a smirk on his face. You're president of the union this term, aren't you? inquired Bridget casually. Zack's face brightened. Yes. Enjoying that role? Yes, very much. I fail to see how this is at all relevant, interrupted Caroline. Bridget studiously ignored her. Your invited speaker for the next debate is rather controversial, don't you think? A grin spread across Zack's face. Katrina Hodgson. I'd say that she is extremely controversial. That's why I invited her. Some people aren't too happy with your choice. Zack shrugged. That's their problem. There has, in fact, been a campaign on Twitter to stop her from speaking. Yeah, well, those people need to learn to respect the right to freedom of speech. And, said Bridget, your own sister, Zara, was organising that campaign. She waited for her words to sink in. Zack reacted as if she'd slapped his face. 
Zara? No, that's not true. Here's the proof, said Bridget, sliding the printouts from Zara's anonymous Twitter accounts across the desk. Zack studied them, looking first mystified, then shocked, then angry. I fail to see what this has to do with anything, said Caroline. Are you seriously suggesting that my client murdered his own sister because of some online messages about a debate? Bridget waited a beat before replying. Those aren't the only messages we found. She paused again before elaborating. Do you have the printout, dear Sterwent? Jake handed out copies of the texts he'd taken from Zack's phone. Bridget read through her own copy as she waited for Zack and Caroline to digest this latest piece of evidence. Dear S. Jake Derwent has just passed me a piece of paper, on which is printed out a text message thread between the suspect, Zachary Hamilton, and his sister, the late Zara Hamilton. The text messages are as follows. Zara, when are you going to do it? Zack, never. Zara, you promised. Zack, change my mind. Zara, you've got twenty-four hours and then I'll tell everyone. Zack, if you tell anyone about this, I'll kill you. The last text was sent on Thursday morning at 11.06, said Bridget. It would appear to be a death threat. The interview room fell completely silent. Bridget let the silence grow before continuing her questioning. What is the it referred to in these texts? Zack shook his head. The colour had drained from his face along with all traces of his earlier bravado. No comment. When you knocked on Zara's door after returning from the Oxford Union, did you see your sister? No. It was barely a whisper. Did you see her? pressed Bridget. Did she open her door to you? No, she didn't. But I knew she was in there because her light was on. Bridget nodded to Jake. He leaned across the table towards Zack. Look, mate, we've all been there. We've all had one too many as a student, and, well, sometimes things get a little out of hand. Sometimes you can't really explain why you did something. Hell, sometimes you don't even remember clearly what it was you did. So you had a few drinks, got into a punch-up with Adam. It wasn't your fault. You went to see your sister about it. You got angry. You hit her. You probably didn't ever mean to hurt her. And then you panicked. No, said Zack. It wasn't like that. Tell me how it was, said Bridget softly. You wouldn't understand. Do you have a sister or a brother, D.I. Hart? Bridget held his gaze levelly. Two, she wanted to say. One living, one dead. She held her tongue. Zack was in tears now. I loved Zara. That's what you can't seem to get. I would never have done anything to hurt her. Never. Not even if I was drunk. And yet you threatened to kill her. That wasn't a threat. They were just words. They weren't even about... the debate or Twitter or anything like that. What were they about? They were private. No comment. Bright spots of colour were highlighting his cheeks. He lapsed into sullen silence again. Jake took up the thread once more. So you had an argument, you hit her, and then afterwards you tried to stop the bleeding with a towel. But you couldn't. It was too late. You ran away, stopping in the seminar room below Zara's to be sick. You also dropped the bloody towel there and left a handprint on the wall. No. We matched the blood on the towel to Zara's said Bridget. Fibres from the towel were found in her hair, and we matched the handprint to yours. Zack clenched his fists and banged on the table. You've got it all wrong. Yes, all right, I threw up in the stupid seminar room. I wasn't feeling well after Adam punched me. But I don't know anything about a bloody towel. I didn't hit Zara. I didn't even see her. Caroline's eyes had become cold. You don't have to say any more, Zack. Bridget pushed on. I think you should, Zack, because I don't believe your story. And I don't think that a jury will either. 
You see, the post-mortem revealed a sliver of purple glass in Zara's skull. It was an unusual type of glass, very distinctive. And yet, a purple glass paperweight with an identical design was found in your room in college. It even has a chip in it. What are the chances of that? Zack's eyes narrowed, and he seemed to regain some of his composure. Then, slowly, he began to laugh. Caroline glared at him. What's so funny, Zack? You idiots! You don't have a clue! He was grinning now, like a man led down from the gallows at the last possible moment. Zara and I owned identical paperweights. They were a gift from our godmother. Twin paperweights for twin brother and sister. Murano Glass, from Venice. Mine got chipped, but Zara's was in perfect condition. There was a knock on the door, and Bridget paused the interview to answer it. Fionn was waiting in the corridor outside with a sheet of paper. Her face was grim. Bridget closed the door to the interview room behind her. What is it? The results on the paperweight have just come back from the lab. Tell me the worst, said Bridget. The paperweight in Zack's room was not the murder weapon. The sliver of glass found in Zara's skull doesn't match the chip in Zack's paperweight. She handed Bridget the report from forensics. Bridget felt as if the ground was cracking under her. She went back inside and resumed the recording. D.C. Fionn Hughes has just passed me the forensics report on the paperweight taken from the suspect's room. It confirms that this was not the same paperweight used to attack Zara. There will be no further questions relating to the paperweight. The look of smug satisfaction on Caroline's face was galling. D.I. Hart, I think you've just demonstrated that you have no substantive evidence against my client. I therefore insist that you bring this farce of an interview to a close. Fifteen. Bridget woke early on Sunday morning, feeling almost worse than when she had gone to bed. The spirit of Detective Chief Superintendent Grayson had haunted her dreams, rattling chains and bellowing, Find me evidence, hard evidence, and when I say hard, I mean rock-bloody solid. She hoped that Zack had fared no better. A night in the cells could be a sobering experience, especially for a young man accustomed to luxury and privilege. No doubt Caroline Butler, of Kingsley Butler and Cook, had enjoyed a more recuperative rest at the Randolph Hotel in her three hundred pound a night room. She showered and dressed and went downstairs to find Chloe still in her pyjamas, eating breakfast at the kitchen table. She watched her daughter for a second as she thumbed her mobile phone in one hand, while spooning cereal with the other. Sometimes, when Bridget studied her daughter's face, she saw Ben staring back. Chloe certainly took after her father in many ways. She was already taller than Bridget, with shiny black hair and those mysterious dark eyes that promised so much. Bridget could only hope that Chloe had inherited Ben's best genes. With any luck, she'd got the best of Bridget, too. The best of both parents. But somehow that seemed too much to hope for. Mum, have you seen my black top? You know, the off-the-shoulder one from Super Dry? Bridget sighed. Here was a crisis of a more domestic variety than the one that had kept her awake half the night. Isn't it in your wardrobe? I couldn't see it anywhere. Well, why don't you wear the nice blouse with the polka dots? Oh, Mum, that's so, like, last year. Last year? If any of Bridget's clothes were only a year old, she considered them to be new. If you can't find it, then it's probably still in the laundry. I haven't had time to get round to it these last few days. She was treated to a sour-faced scowl. You could always learn to use the washing machine yourself. No response to that one. Bridget flicked the switch on the kettle. Haven't you showered yet? she asked Chloe. We'll be going to Aunt Vanessa's in an hour. I have to drop you there and get back to work. Oh, Mum! It can't be helped. I'm busy with that case. You know, the one I can't discuss. Chloe's face lifted from her phone. Go on, tell me about it. I heard that the murder student's incredibly rich. So they say. Have you arrested anyone yet? I can't say. 
Come on, Mum. Give me some gossip I can tell my friends. Chloe, this is a murder case. A young woman was violently killed. It came out as a rebuke. The scowl returned to Chloe's face and she flounced upstairs. Oh, God, thought Bridget. Give me a break. Just one. An hour later they headed off to her sister Vanessa's house in North Oxford, the interior of the mini filled with an uncomfortable silence. Chloe had somehow managed to slide into a pair of skin-tight jeans that were more slashes than fabric. The nice polka-dot blouse was nowhere to be seen, and instead she was wearing an enormous baggy cold-play T-shirt. Bridget could imagine her sister's silent disapproval and the inevitable hushed comment when she thought Chloe was out of earshot. Doesn't she own any decent clothes? Bridget put her foot down as they sped out of Wolvercote Village, keen to drop off Chloe and get back to Kidlington. They could only hold Zack in custody without charge for another eight hours. The case depended now on whatever forensics had managed to find overnight. And also how cooperative Zack was feeling after his night in a police cell. I hope you don't mind spending a few hours with Aunt Vanessa, said Bridget. She also hoped her sister wouldn't be too grumpy at the news that Bridget couldn't stay. She hadn't yet told her. Coward, she chided herself. Beside her in the passenger seat, Chloe fiddled with her phone. Shame the ban on using phones in cars didn't apply to passengers as well as drivers. Bridget tried again to start a conversation. Sorry I couldn't be with you for your birthday, she said. I'll make it up to you, I promise. It's all right, said Chloe. I had a nice time with my friends. What did you do? Oh, you know, just hung out. Right. Bridget was only too aware that conversations with her daughter tended to be a bit like interviews with suspects. Bridget asking all the questions and getting minimal, evasive answers in return. Still, she persisted. It was good practice. Who were you hanging out with? Just friends. Girls or boys, Bridget wanted to find out, but knew that some questions were best left unasked. They were halfway down the Banbury Road when Chloe suddenly twisted round in her seat and said, That student at Christchurch. How did she die? I can't tell you. We haven't released any details to the public yet. Why do you want to know? It's just that Olivia's sister is in her first year at Christchurch, and she told Olivia all about it. She said that the dead student was really popular. She was really upset about it. Yes, said Bridget gently. Murder is upsetting. It's more than just headlines in the newspapers. It leaves a mark behind that perhaps never heals. I know. She turned to give Chloe a reassuring smile. Sometimes she was still just a child, and other times she was so grown up and independent. Do you think the killer was someone who knew her? We're not sure at the moment. But you'll catch whoever did it, won't you? I'll do my best. They turned left into Bellbroughton Road and then right into Charbury Road. Immediately the bustle of the main thoroughfare gave way to the sort of peace and tranquillity that only money could buy. Large Edwardian detached houses were set back from the road behind clipped hedges and old stone walls. They had been built in a more genteel age, when ladies stayed at home and entertained their guests with afternoon tea served by the maid. Bridget suspected that for Vanessa the house was a defence against the outside world, an imposing property of brick and stone, big enough to accommodate a huge family and their domestic entourage. Bridget's house would have squeezed into a quarter of the space, yet somehow her sister managed to occupy her vast home with just herself, her husband, two children, and a dog. Bridget pulled into the driveway and parked her mini behind Vanessa's Range Rover, the de facto vehicle for ferrying small children to prep school with their sports bags and musical instruments. "'Are you coming in?' asked Chloe. "'You're not just going to leave me to explain that you're not staying for lunch, are you?' "'No, of course not.' The thought had crossed her mind, if only for a second. She couldn't help it. Her sister had that effect on her. Vanessa was two years older than Bridget, and taller and slimmer, too. Bridget had always found that most unfair. Unlike Bridget, Vanessa had approached life's milestones in a sensible and correct order. A career first, then a husband, 
followed by children, one of each to complete the set. Bridget, by contrast, had reached those three landmarks in reverse order, an early pregnancy followed by a hurried marriage to an ultimately disappointing husband, and eventually a late career that was only now getting going. "'You ought to have been more careful,' Vanessa liked to tell her, seemingly at every opportunity. And yet, while Bridget had some regrets, Ben, for all his charm and good looks, had turned out to be an indifferent father and an unfaithful husband. She would never regret having Chloe, even though having a baby at a young age had shunted her career into the slow lane. Besides, Vanessa, too, had her sorrows and her remorse. They never spoke about Abigail, the murdered sister who hadn't lived beyond the tender age of sixteen. But whenever Bridget was with Vanessa, the third sister was always at their side. Beautiful Abigail would forever be the barrier that kept the two surviving sisters apart. But she was also the glue that bound them together. Each had coped with her loss in their own way. Bridget had joined the police force. She had wondered about that decision often enough over the years. She must have imagined that she could solve every crime and lock every criminal behind bars. She must still have believed that now at some subconscious level. Or else what kept her going, day after day? Vanessa had taken on perhaps a greater challenge. To make her world perfect. Her marriage, her beautiful house, her two lovely children, even the dog, were all part of a vain bid to paper over the cracks, to undo the one outrageous wrong that could never be undone. Bridget was not so different to Vanessa, and she could never be angry with her. That would have been too cruel. Chloe reached the door first and rang the bell. The loud chime was followed immediately by the sound of a dog barking. The door opened and a golden Labrador bounded through. Rufus! cried Chloe, laughing. The big dog jumped up and licked her face. Down, Rufus, down! Vanessa was right behind. She kissed her niece and turned to welcome Bridget. Bridget got her apologies in before Vanessa had time to say anything. Really sorry, but I can't stay. I have to get back to work. Her sister frowned. I saw you on the news. It was said as a reproof. Vanessa had always found Bridget's job slightly distasteful. Bridget didn't know why. It's not as if she worked in a strip club, although she had raided a few in her time as a uniformed constable. What am I going to say to Jonathan? Bridget had forgotten about the lunch guest Vanessa had invited. Just explain where I am, she said. It's not as if this... Jonathan. This Jonathan even knows who I am. Yes, he does. I told him all about you. Look, here he comes now. A man was walking up the path past the Minnie. He looked much younger than Vanessa had described, more like late thirties than mid-forties. He was tall and had warm, intelligent eyes behind tortoiseshell glasses that gave him a quirky, boyish look. His navy, open-checked shirt and smart designer jeans were casually understated. Vanessa, he said, offering up a bottle of wine wrapped in tissue paper. And you must be Bridget. Hi, she said, correct first time. She shook his hand. Not exactly a great deduction, he said. Your sister described you very well. Oh, said Bridget, wondering exactly how Vanessa had described her. I'm afraid I can't stay for lunch. She was surprised to find that she was genuinely sorry. Jonathan seemed so, too. That's a shame. Perhaps some other time? Yes, perhaps. Sixteen. Jake was enjoying his breakfast outside in the warm sunshine. A bacon roll and a coffee. Bliss. He looked up as a sleek green machine roared into the Kidlington HQ car park. Fionn brought her motorbike to a neat halt, jumped off, and removed her crash helmet, running her hand through her hair. Be with you in a mo, she called to him. No worries, said Jake, watching as she darted nimbly up the steps, her skin-tight green leathers squeaking as she moved. His suggestion that he pick her up from home had been politely but firmly rebuffed. He wondered if Ryan had made his move on her yet. He didn't rate the guy's chances highly. If he were a betting man, he'd put his money on no score. 
The previous night, after the interview with Zack had ended in a stalemate, Bridget had asked him and Fionn to go and have another try at coaxing the truth out of Adam. He was obviously still hiding something, and both he and Zack were refusing to discuss the fight at the Oxford Union. Fionn appeared five minutes later, dressed in her work clothes. Ready? Jake tossed his empty coffee cup into the bin and led the way to the Subaru. This time he'd remembered to clear the passenger seat of chocolate wrappers before leaving home. They stopped at a newsagent's on the way to see what the Sunday papers were saying about the case. The headlines splashed across their pages spoke of murder, beauty, wealth, and privilege. The articles that accompanied them seemed designed more to entertain than to inform. Jake bought a copy of each, and Fionn read them aloud as they headed into the city centre. When they arrived at the college gates, the photographers and journalists standing outside seemed to have multiplied. Jake and Fionn pushed their way through, saying nothing. Inside Christchurch, life looked to be continuing pretty much as it had done every Sunday for the past five hundred years. A line of choruses in red cassocks and white surplices were leaving the cathedral and trooping across Tomquad. All male, they ranged from young men to boys of no more than seven or eight. Jake couldn't imagine life as a choir boy. At that age he'd spent his weekends kicking a football in the garden if it was dry, or watching cartoons on television if it was raining. He wondered what Fionn had been like as a child. Probably weird then as well. Only one thing had changed since their previous visit. All around the black and yellow tape that marked the perimeter of the crime scene, bouquets of flowers had been left. Dozens of them, of all colours and sizes, with personalised messages and cards attached lay in tribute to the murdered student. A uniformed PC still stood guard at the foot of the staircase, surrounded now by the floral display. Jake nodded to him as they passed. They found Adam in his room in Blue Borquad. Jake had to bang on the door three times before he appeared, unshaven, and with a crumpled look about him as if he'd just got out of bed and thrown on the first thing that came to hand, grey jogging pants and a Christchurch rowing club sweatshirt. You again, he said. What do you want now? Can we come in? asked Jake. Adam shrugged and let them inside. The floor of his room was still strewn with discarded rowing kit, track suits and muddy socks. An empty pizza box rested on the bed. The place looked like a pigsty even to Jake's undiscerning eye, and it didn't smell much better either. He wondered if Adam had been out of his room since they'd left him here the day before. He seems to have given up on life. Fionn picked her way through the detritus and sat down on the window seat after shoving aside a damp bath towel. We want to talk to you about the argument with Zack at the Oxford Union, said Jake. Oh, God, not that again, said Adam, collapsing onto the unmade bed and knocking the pizza box onto the floor. Jake took the desk chair, removed a pile of clothes, and sat down. Yes, that. Talk us through that encounter. Why did you go to see Zack at all? Adam stretched out on the bed, staring up at the ceiling. I've been thinking about what Zara said when she broke up with me, and I thought that maybe Zack might know something. What exactly did Zara say? Adam pursed his lips, reluctant to speak. She told me there was someone else he said, eventually, his voice full of bitterness. So that was it. The truth was beginning to emerge, just as Jake had finally managed to drag the truth out of his own girlfriend, after so many tears and lies. Did she say who? he asked gently. No, she wouldn't discuss it. I told her I'd find out sooner or later, and it was better if she told me herself, but she just didn't want to talk to me. Did you have any ideas? asked Fionn. None. I kept thinking about it afterwards, and it just didn't make any sense. I don't understand how she could have been seeing anyone else. Jake nodded. His own girlfriend had been seeing someone at work. It had been easy for her to hide her cheating from him, especially since he'd been so unwilling to see it for himself. All those mysterious texts, the time she'd arrived home late from work, the weekend she'd had to go into the office, he was a police detective. He ought to have been suspicious. But he had trusted her. 
He didn't know now if he'd ever be able to trust someone in the same way again. So you went to see Zack? Yeah, said Adam. I was sure he would know. He must have known all the time. She was his sister, for God's sake. But the bastard wouldn't talk about it. In fact, he got really aggressive, started shouting at me. He even shoved me. That's when I snapped. You punched him? Yeah, said Adam. Felt good at the time. Didn't get me anywhere, though. Except in a whole heap of trouble. And did you ever find out who the other person was? Adam shook his head, defeated. If I knew, I'd tell you. 17. So who was Zara's new man? On Bridget's arrival at Kidlington, Jake and Fion had quickly filled her in on what Adam had told them that morning. Adam's claim that Zara was seeing someone else was now the best lead she had. She'd also received news from forensics that had confirmed her worst fears. While the vomit in the seminar room was definitely Zack's, the blood-stained towel held no traces of his DNA. There was no hard evidence to link him with the murder. But Zack didn't know that yet. He sat slumped in his chair in the interview room. All the arrogance and belligerence he had displayed yesterday had drained away overnight. He looked like a man who'd given up hope. His hair was dishevelled and there were black smudges under his bloodshot eyes. The man who aspired to be Prime Minister had been broken by a single night of discomfort. By contrast, Caroline Butler appeared to have enjoyed a most refreshing stay at Oxford's five-star hotel. Her makeup was immaculate, and she was wearing a fresh blouse and jacket. On the table in front of her stood a Starbucks coffee. She watched Bridget from across the table. Bridget repeated the question to Zack, trying to inject some kindness into her voice. There was no need to push him now. He was a defeated man. I don't know, he mumbled. She didn't tell me. Were you close to your sister? Yeah, but, you know, we didn't discuss everything. Is this line of questioning going anywhere? asked Caroline impatiently. Bridget took no notice of her. But you knew there was someone else? No, not until Adam told me. He was staring at his hands, not looking her in the eye. At the Oxford Union? Yeah. Is that why he came to see you? Yeah, he asked me if I knew who it was. And what did you tell him? That I didn't know. Anything else? Zack shrugged. I told him a few home truths. Such as? A faint smile of amusement twitched his mouth. That it was time Zara dumped him. That he wasn't good enough for her. That he was a nobody. And what was his response? Zack touched the purple bruise on his face. He punched you. And then he went back to college to look for Zara. Zack ran a hand through his fair hair, making it stand up. I was angry, all right. I thought it was Zara's fault that Adam had come after me. I was mad at her. That happens with siblings, okay? He put his head in his hands and let out a huge, racking sob. But I would never have hurt her. I loved her. He buried his head in his hands, in tears. Satisfied now? demanded Caroline, her eyes blazing. Rest assured that Sir Richard will hear all about this. Bridget was out of ideas. She looked across at Jake, who was sitting next to her. It was obvious he had none either. You're free to go, she said to Zack, but stay around Oxford. We might need to speak to you again. Chief Superintendent Grayson's vast desk was littered with a selection of Sunday papers, mostly tabloids. Photographs of a smiling Zara Hamilton, her blonde hair like a halo, stared back at Bridget from their front pages. Lurid headlines seemed to accuse her. Oxford student in savage murder. Brutal killing of wealthy heiress. Golden girl murder. We let him go, sir, she said. Zachary Hamilton. There wasn't enough evidence to detain him. 
The lines etched into Grayson's forehead seemed deeper this morning. He ran a hand through his graying hair. I've already spoken to his lawyers. They're considering a civil action against the police. We had reasonable grounds to arrest him, sir. I know, and you sought my permission before making the arrest. There's no need for you to worry about your own career, Bridget. She nodded. She couldn't remember him using her first name before. He swept the desk clean with his arm, depositing the newspapers into his waste paper bin. So, where do we go from here? Do you have any leads? Zack's in the clear, unless new evidence emerges. It's still possible that the murder was a burglary that went wrong. Her wallet is missing, and also her mobile phone. What about the murder weapon? We still haven't found it. But it was almost certainly Zara's paperweight. That suggests the killing may not have been premeditated. Perhaps not even deliberate. It adds weight to the burglary scenario. Yes, sir. The murderer may simply have grabbed the nearest heavy object. But you don't believe that the killer was unknown to the victim? It was a statement, not a question. No. The ex-boyfriend, Adam, now claims that Zara split up with him because she was seeing someone else. Who? We don't know. No one we've interviewed so far has mentioned another boyfriend. But if there was someone, then we need to find out who he was and talk to him. Do you think Adam's telling the truth? I think so, sir. Zack confirmed that's what their argument was about. Adam went to him demanding to know who the other person was. The only question is whether Zara was telling Adam the truth when she said there was someone else. Zack maintains that he had no idea she was seeing someone. Well, this gives us a new line of inquiry to follow. What about call records from Zara's phone? That's got to be our top priority. But the phone company's dragging its feet because it's a weekend. We should get her call records tomorrow, and we'll be interviewing all of Zara's friends again to ask about this other boyfriend. Good. Take the rest of the day off. Sir? It's Sunday afternoon. Your team deserves a few hours of rest. Next week isn't going to be easy. For any of us. Despite the chief super's instruction to take the rest of the day off, Bridget spent a couple of hours sorting through her emails and her overflowing inbox. By the time she arrived to collect Chloe, the family lunch was long over. Sorry, said Bridget as Vanessa let her into the house. Jonathan's already gone, Vanessa told her in a tone of voice which was half scolding and half despairing. And I so wanted you to meet him. I did briefly, said Bridget, giving her sister a kiss on each cheek. He seemed nice. Maybe I'll get to meet him another time. She did feel bad about letting her sister down. She knew how much effort Vanessa put into preparing these lunchtime gatherings. And however irritating she might be as a matchmaker, she was a superb cook. No ready-made microwave meals for Vanessa's family. Her kitchen boasted a library's worth of cookbooks. A Sunday roast would have been far preferable to the slightly stale sandwiches that Bridget had salvaged from the office vending machine. Chloe was sitting on the floor playing a board game with her younger cousins, eight-year-old Florence and six-year-old Toby. Vanessa disapproved of electronic devices and video games. Beside them, the dog was asleep in front of the fireplace. It opened one eye as Bridget entered. "'What have you all been up to?' she asked. "'We had an ace time in the garden with Rufus,' said Chloe. "'And Jonathan was fun, too. "'Good.' James, Vanessa's husband, wandered into the room wearing a blue and white striped apron over his shirt and jeans. "'Just been loading the dishwasher,' he said. He greeted Bridget with a peck on the cheek. Bridget smiled. James was a successful businessman running his own IT company, hence the house worth millions, but still managed to find time for family and home. Her own ex, Ben, had hardly known one end of a dishwasher from the other— how had Vanessa succeeded in bagging such a man? The difference between the two could not be marked down to bad luck, but poor planning. Bridget had jumped at the first handsome man to flatter her with his attention, while Vanessa had stalked potential partners for a decade before finally pouncing on her prey. "'Solved your golden girl murder yet?' he inquired. 
Don't tell me you read that kind of newspaper, James. Only the headlines. They make a change from the weekend financial times. I'm sure they do. She turned to her daughter. Come on, then. Say goodbye to everyone. On the drive home, Chloe seemed more relaxed than when Bridget had dropped her off. You really did have a nice time? Bridget asked. I'm sorry I had to leave you on your own. No worries. I know that the children are only small, and that Aunt Vanessa can go on a bit. Honestly, Mum, it wasn't a problem. Okay. A minute passed. Jonathan was really nice, said Chloe. Oh? Yeah. A short silence. He kept asking all about you. Did he? Another beat passed. What did you tell him? Chloe laughed. Only the good bits. You should ask him out on a date. What? Bridget felt herself blushing. Before you get too old, added Chloe. Cheers. Thanks for that. You know what I mean. Did she? At thirty-eight she must seem ancient to Chloe. Too old to go on a date? Apparently not. But since when had her teenage daughter offered her dating advice? Wasn't it supposed to be the other way around? Not that Bridget had much advice to give, other than, don't do what I did. Oh, and by the way, Chloe continued, seamlessly transitioning to a different topic, Dad called to say he's going to drop in tomorrow with a birthday present for me. Oh, is he? Bridget's world came crashing down once again. That was so like Ben. He paid his daughter no attention for months, then flew in from nowhere bearing expensive gifts. And I've been thinking, added Chloe, I'd like to go and visit Dad in London. What? Bridget was caught off guard by the twist in the conversation. Did he suggest that? Yeah, he did. He said I could go and stay with him for a few days over the summer. Did he now? The anger was rising up inside Bridget. How dare Ben suggest that? And to go behind her back, speaking directly to Chloe? He had never shown any interest in having her to stay before. He'd been too busy chasing women to show any concern for his daughter. But now he had settled down with his latest girlfriend, he was trying to have it all. Well, it was Bridget who had done all the hard work, bringing up Chloe single-handed, sacrificing her own career, going without. Don't be like that, Mum. You know I don't get to see him very often. It would only be for a few days. It's no big deal. The years of contained anger and resentment boiled over, and Bridget was yelling before she realised it. No, absolutely not. I won't allow it. 18. Bridget was still fuming when she rose on Monday morning, but now the anger was directed at herself. She had allowed Ben's behaviour to rattle her again, this time turning her against her own daughter. Chloe had hardly spoken a word to her after their row yesterday, and Bridget could scarcely blame her. She popped her head around Chloe's bedroom door before leaving to see if the dark clouds had blown over, but the stormy weather seemed to have intensified. "'I'm just getting ready for school,' snapped Chloe, still clearly resentful. "'I'll see you this evening,' said Bridget, "'although I might be late. "'I'll leave some money in the kitchen in case you want to buy yourself a takeaway.' This wasn't how she'd intended to bring up her daughter. Today of all days she should be spending time with Chloe, patching up the mess she'd made yesterday. When she'd first had Chloe, she'd imagined an idyllic future in which she would always cook proper meals for her family. They'd sit around the dining table enjoying their evening meal together. But those dreams had come to nothing. How could she do that and pursue her career, too? She hadn't even managed to hold her family together. A career, a husband, and a daughter? Was it too much to want all three? She didn't think so. No need, said Chloe with a shrug. I'm meeting Dad this evening, remember? He said he'd pick me up from school and take me out to dinner. Oh. Bridget held her tongue. The less she said on the subject, the better. I'll catch you later, then. Have a nice time. For once she was grateful to be distracted by her work. As soon as she arrived at the office, she grabbed herself a coffee and settled down to read through Zach and Adam's statements again. 
Zara had told Adam there was someone else, but refused to say who. If Zack was to be believed, she had never mentioned another relationship to him. None of the students who'd been interviewed had suggested that Zara was seeing someone else. Who could it be? Someone from outside the university? Someone inappropriate? Certainly no one had come forward to volunteer for the role. As soon as the rest of the team arrived and got themselves some coffee, green tea for Fionn, she called a briefing. Everyone already knew of Zack's release, and the mood in the room was downbeat. Bridget's first job was to rally her troops. The case against Zack has crumbled, but we have a new lead. Zara finished her relationship with Adam for someone else. What we need to establish now is, who was the other man? Zara was protecting him for some reason. Why? She scanned the sea of faces before her, mostly blank. That Monday morning feeling. Fion raised a hand. Why do you say a man? It might have been a woman. Ryan chuckled, but Bridget glared at him and he tried to turn his snigger into a cough. Good point. Zara kept the identity of this other person a secret. She must have had a reason for that. I want to know who it was and why she was so secretive about it. That could be the key to solving the case. Jake, Fion, Ryan, I want you three to go back to Christchurch and get alongside the students. Talk to them. Someone must know something. Andy, Harry, you go through the statements we've already taken with a fine comb. Reread everything in the light of this new information. Someone might have let something slip. What's happening with Zara's phone records, anyone? Still nothing, ma'am, said Fionn. I called again this morning. Some kind of technical glitch is holding them up, but they promised to get them across by the end of today. They can do better than that, said Bridget crossly. I'll speak to them myself and put a rocket under them. Come on, then, people. Let's get moving. She was rewarded by a flurry of activity as they scrambled to their feet. Coffee mugs clattered on desks. Chairs scraped against the floor. Doors opened and closed. They were moving forward again. Jake was pleased when Fionn joined him in his car. You're not taking your bike to the college, then? he asked. She shook her head. It makes more sense to come with you than bring two vehicles. Yeah, I suppose it does. You wouldn't rather go with Ryan instead? No. Why would I? Good point. He waved at Ryan, who was stalking across the car park, his hands in his pockets, trying hard not to look at Fionn in Jake's car. It was hard not to smirk at him. Did Ryan say anything to you? No, what about? The guy hadn't made his move then. Perhaps he never would. Guys like Ryan were all talk. I don't know. He just mentioned you the other day. Did he? So you two talk about me behind my back, do you? No, he blurted. Why couldn't he talk to Fionn without always saying the wrong thing? He turned to her and was relieved to find a mischievous grin on her face. I expect you just talk about beer and football, she said. You're not too far wrong there. A disgruntled Ryan caught up with them in Tomcod where they found the porter, Jim Turner, rearranging the growing carpet of flowers outside the staircase to Zara's room. He was clearing a path so that people could still walk past without having to descend to the lower level of the quad. That's quite a display, said Jake, glancing at the bouquets and handwritten messages. Hearts and kisses and a small teddy bear in a Christchurch jumper with a single rose between his paws. We will miss you, Zara. Heaven has another angel. Rest in peace. He wondered how well any of these people had really known Zara. Perhaps her death had somehow made people think they knew her, the way Princess Diana's death had affected millions who'd never even met her. It is that, said Jim Turner, straightening up. Zara is greatly missed. Anyway, how can I help you? We just want to chat to as many people as possible. Anyone who knew Zara. Jim gestured with his arm. Everyone knew her. I suggest you start knocking on doors although you might find that people are at lectures or in tutorials this morning. It's the exam season, too, but perhaps you could go along to the dining hall at lunchtime. He pointed to the opposite side of the quad, through that archway and up the stairs. Can't miss it. Good idea, 
said Jake, wondering if you had to be a member of college to eat there. He wouldn't say no to a plate of something tasty for lunch. It would surely be better than the police canteen back at Kidlington. We'll get round more people if we split up, said Fionn. Just like in Scooby-Doo, grinned Jake. But remember, don't go down into the cellar on your own. Fionn rolled her eyes, but he thought he detected a hint of amusement, even in those cool emerald orbs. Ryan looked miffed that he hadn't thought of anything witty to say. Ryan agreed to take Tom Quad in the meadow building while Fionn headed off to Peckwater Quad. Jake made for Blue Boar Quad. Despite his initial shock at the modern architecture planted so brazenly next to the 16th and 18th century buildings, he'd come to like the straight lines and right angles of Blue Boar's utilitarian architecture. He hoped the students living there would be straight talkers too. In a high-ceilinged room in Peckwater Quad, Sophie Hinton sat opposite Dr. Claiborne, feeling ill at ease in the unfamiliar surroundings. This room belonged to a maths tutor, and on one wall was a whiteboard covered with incomprehensible equations. Dr. Claiborne had rescheduled Friday's Miss Tutorial, asking her to come and see him today instead. She supposed he felt obliged to fulfil his teaching commitments, but she wished he'd simply cancelled. It felt wrong being here on her own without Zara by her side. She stumbled her way through her essay, reading it aloud, doubting the strength of her own literary analysis. Lust and ambition are the driving forces of tragedy. Discuss. What she'd written seemed trite compared to the real-life events of the last few days. Her mind was so numbed by horror that there was no capacity left for thoughts of English literature. She wondered if Dr. Claiborne felt the same. He sat with his head tilted back, his eyes half-closed. Was he even listening to a word she was saying? She ploughed on to the last sentence of her essay, and silence filled the room. Dr. Claiborne seemed unaware that she had finished. She knew where his thoughts were directed. Zara Hamilton. It was impossible to think of Zara now without picturing her as Sophie had last seen her, prostrated on the floor the carpet spattered with blood. She could not scrub that image from her mind. But when she tried to guess at the identity of Zara's killer, a shadowy form without features was all that she could conjure. Yet someone here must know who had murdered Zara. Sophie was sure of it. The college was very claustrophobic to her now. The ancient walls seemed to be closing in on her, shutting her into a dark, enclosed world. This place was full of secrets. Old secrets accumulated over the centuries like dust in the library. New secrets, hidden cunningly away by clever people, stacked as thick as the stone walls that enclosed them. Even eagle-eyed Val, the scout, with her network of spies, did not know them all. Dr. Claiborne removed his glasses and rubbed his eyes. She waited patiently for him to question her about her essay, to challenge her arguments so that she could defend them arguing her case with more clarity. That was how a tutorial was supposed to work. But Dr. Claiborne seemed too distracted. It suddenly occurred to her that, maybe for once, the tables had turned, and it was now her tutor who was under scrutiny. He certainly had plenty to hide, and Sophie had no wish for him to guess how much she knew. But perhaps she had been wrong to keep his secrets hidden. The truth was a mosaic, a pattern that emerged when all the facts were placed together in the right way. The police were searching for that pattern, but they didn't yet have all the facts. She wondered if she should have told them more when they had interviewed her. But she was not the only one with secrets. Zara had kept her own secrets, too. Perhaps more than any of them. Sophie? Dr. Claiborne's voice broke through her thoughts. I think we'll wrap up. The maths tutor will be wanting his room back. She was glad to get away. She ran through the college to her room in Meadow Building. The familiar rooms and buildings felt very threatening now, and she couldn't wait for the end of term when she could return home to where she belonged. 19. The huge stone staircase that led up to the dining hall at Christchurch looked like something out of a medieval castle. Jake was reminded of school trips to stately homes as a kid. 
Those places had always had a dead feel to them. The great rooms roped off, their inhabitants long dead and buried. But these walls reverberated with life. Footsteps echoing on the stone steps, voices magnified by the cathedral-like acoustic. A women's rowing crew, not bothering to change out of their kit for lunch, overtook him, taking the stairs two at a time. They were probably starving after their training. Jake, too, was ravenous after a frustrating morning of interviews. No one he'd spoken to had told him anything he didn't already know. Just as Jim Turner had said, a lot of the students were out at lectures or tutorials. He'd barged into one room where a small group of students were having their essays scrutinised by their tutor. The process seemed unduly harsh and adversarial to Jake. He'd seen suspects treated better back at the interview rooms in Kidlington, and none of these students here even had a lawyer to defend them. Except that it turned out they were all law students. No wonder lawyers always turned out to be such hard-nosed bastards. Jake's sympathy for them had waned at that point. The tutor had glared at him over his half-moon spectacles while he questioned the students about Zara. But even though they'd seemed glad of the interruption, none of them could tell him anything useful. He was really starting to wonder if he was on a wild goose chase. It was definitely time for a break. The dining hall itself was one of the grandest rooms he'd ever seen. He gazed up at the wooden beams in the ceiling, feeling as if he really had just entered the Great Hall of Hogwarts. Centre stage on the wall behind High Table, a portrait of Henry VIII in his familiar wide-legged stance presided over the clatter of serving spoons and the babble of a couple of hundred chattering students. They queued up to collect their food from a row of mobile, stainless steel hot plates, which looked oddly out of place next to the stained glass windows, the wood panelling, and the vaulted ceiling. Three long wooden tables adorned with table lamps ran the full length of the hall, with a fourth table, at the far end, running perpendicular. Fionn was waiting for him near the entrance. "'Made any progress?' she asked. "'Not really. You?' She shook her head. Maybe we'll have better luck here. He sniffed at the smells rising from the hot plates. Do you think we could grab a bite to eat first? We're supposed to be working. Come on, I'll start on high table. Okay. Jake's stomach rumbled. He saw Ryan wander into the hall. Fancy a bite to eat? asked Jake. Good idea, said Ryan. Let's grab a tray before it all goes. Fionn moved around the dining hall, chatting to different groups of students. She'd spoken to some of them before, but they were all happy to talk again. It seemed they welcomed the opportunity to talk about Zara, and what she meant to them. No one had a bad word to say about the murdered student. However much Fionn probed, the answers were always the same. Zara was adored by everyone, and no one could imagine who might have wanted to kill her, or why. As for the possibility of an unidentified lover, Fionn got the impression that any number of the men she talked to, and perhaps a few of the women, would have been delighted to have taken that role. But none of them had. She came to the shorter table that ran perpendicular to the others at the top end of the hall. High table. At formal dinner in the evening, high table would be reserved for the dean, the dons, and any visiting dignitaries but at lunchtime students were allowed to occupy it just like any other table. Verity, Zack's girlfriend, was sitting with a couple of other students, deep in conversation. One was a young man in a buttoned-down shirt and tweed jacket. He looked as if he bought all his clothes from Shepherd and Woodward, the old-fashioned gentleman's outfitters on the high street. The other was a girl with blonde hair cascading down her back. They appeared to be discussing the menu for the upcoming summer ball— Fionn distinctly overheard the words, Jerusalem artichokes. Sounds absolutely delicious, trilled the long-haired girl. Pretending to examine the portraits of Elizabeth I, Henry VIII, and Cardinal Wolsey, Fionn hovered behind them, listening in. Verity was clearly in charge of the meeting. What about the choice of wines? she asked. If she'd noticed Fionn lurking, she was deliberately ignoring her. The butler gave me a tour of the wine cellar, replied Mr. Shepherd and Woodward. He suggests a 2009 Alsace for the starter and fish course, and for the main course, a rather fine burgundy. They've got gallons of it in the cellar. 
For dessert, I've chosen a sweet Bordeaux from 2014. Obviously, there'll be port served with the coffee. Obviously, thought Fionn. Super! squealed the excitable girl. The girl didn't strike Fionn as particularly intelligent, and yet here she was at Oxford University. She didn't appear to be much of an asset to the ball committee either, although she must have been elected to her position on the ball committee, whatever it was. Or had she? Maybe she had simply volunteered to do a job no one else wanted. Fionn had no idea. Balls and their committees had never interested her. She'd heard enough of fancy menu planning. She pulled up a chair and sat down opposite, bringing the discussion to an abrupt end. D.C. Fionn Hughes of Thames Valley Police. She flashed her warrant card at them. The group fell silent. Fionn said nothing more, waiting as the silence stretched out uncomfortably. The blonde student flicked her long hair nervously. Mr. Shepherd and Woodward fidgeted with the buttons on his tweed jacket. He might know his wines, but his taste in fashion was abysmal. Only Verity kept her cool, regarding Fionn with a look of disdain. Um, said the blonde girl at last, I expect you're here to ask about Zara. Absolutely shocking what happened. We thought of cancelling the ball, but Zara always wanted the best for everyone, so we decided to go ahead and hold the ball in her honour. She smiled, revealing a mouthful of pretty white teeth. I'm sure Zara would be delighted, said Fionn. The girl's smile wavered. Are you here just to talk about the ball? said Verity. Or is there something you want to ask? Yes. The day Zara was killed, she split up with Adam. Was she seeing someone else? The blonde girl shrugged and looked round the group for support. No, there was no one else, said Verity with emphasis. I expect that she simply grew tired of Adam. I was surprised she endured him for so long. He's such a bore. There was a general nodding of agreement around the table. Adam gave Zack an awful black eye, exclaimed the blonde girl. We think the dean will have him sent down. Verity looked pointedly at her watch. I'm sorry, but is there something else you want to ask? We have a meeting in five minutes with the bursar about the ball. No, said Fionn. You can go. She was wondering who to speak to next when she noticed Sophie, Zara's tutorial partner, holding a tray of food and looking for a place to sit. Fionn waved her over. Hi, she called giving the girl a welcoming smile. Come and join me. Sophie seemed nervous and reluctant to sit with Fionn. You don't mind? she asked. Not at all. She hesitated a moment before sitting down in the chair that Verity had vacated. How's the investigation going? she asked. Slowly, admitted Fionn. You released Zack? Yes. No doubt everyone in the college knew about Zack's arrest and subsequent release. We're exploring other avenues now. I see. Sophie stared at her plate of pasta, leaving it untouched. Talk to me about Zara, said Fionn. You must have known her well. Oh, yes, said Sophie. I first met her when we came up for interview. I knew at once that she would be offered a place here. She was so bright and intelligent. She was very kind to me, too. I was rather shy in those days, you see. Fionn smiled at the thought that Sophie had been even shyer than she was now. We became tutorial partners at the start of our first year, and we've been friends ever since. I mean, we were. Until her death. Her eyes welled with tears, and she bowed her head over her uneaten plate of food. Sophie's claim to know Zara felt much more convincing than that of most of the students she'd interviewed. Fionn remembered the close relationship she had developed with her own tutorial partner at college. When there were just two of you facing the tutor for the weekly tutorial, you forged a strong bond, even if you socialised with other people the rest of the time. If anyone could give them some insight into Zara's personal life, it was surely Sophie. She waited patiently for the girl to compose herself. Is there anything particular you want to know? asked Sophie eventually. Did she ever talk to you about her love life? probed Fionn. She watched as Sophie bit her lip, shaking her head a tiny fraction, saying nothing. It was obvious that the girl knew something. What we'd really like to know, 
said Fionn, is why Zara split up with Adam. We've been told that there was someone else in her life, but we don't know who. Any ideas? Sophie stared at her pastor and shook her head. Then she looked around the hall. It was beginning to empty, but there were still groups of people dotted around. We can't talk here, she said. Let's go outside. Twenty. I don't know if I should be telling you this, began Sophie. It's probably nothing. This is a murder inquiry, said Fionn. If you have any information, no matter how insignificant you think it is, you must tell me. Sophie had left her lunch uneaten back in the hall. The stairway leading from the hall was busy, as was Tom Cod. Walking with her head bowed and her arms folded, Sophie led the way out through the meadow gate to the broad walk at the top of Christchurch Meadow. They walked some distance from the college buildings before she said anything again. She checked to make sure no one was near, then continued. A couple of weeks ago there was a faculty dinner. English faculty? Theon knew the kind of thing. She had been to faculty dinners at Jesus College as an undergraduate. They were an opportunity for students and tutors to meet in an informal setting. Informal by Oxford standards, at least. Typically, they involved a posh dinner in a private room in college, often followed by copious quantities of alcohol in one of the larger student rooms. Sophie nodded. Yes, undergraduates from all three years, plus postgraduates and tutors. About thirty people in total. It was quite an evening. Champagne aperitifs, a four-course dinner with a different wine at every course, followed by port. And that's even before you moved on to the after-dinner piss-up thought Fionn. Did something happen at the dinner? Not during dinner, but most people were pretty drunk after the meal. We were all mingling and talking, which is the whole point, I suppose, and then a few of us went to have more drinks in Zara's room. How many of you? Perhaps eight in all? I didn't want to go, but Zara insisted. Everyone was really pissed by then. One of the first years threw up all over the carpet— and had to be carried back to his room. Some people got a bit too friendly with each other. Including Zara. Sophie looked uncomfortable. The thing is, our tutor was there, and... Well, he'd had loads to drink, and he and Zara... They got rather companionable? I think he might have been the last to leave her room. She looked away as if regretting she'd said so much. When you say our tutor... Do you mean Dr. Claiborne? Yes, Sophie grimaced. Was this the elusive other man? You're saying that he and Zara had an affair. I don't know if you could call it an affair, said Sophie quickly. I didn't see them together again, apart from during tutorials, of course. It was probably just a one-night stand. Dr. Claiborne is very young and good-looking, but he is married, and I think he and his wife have recently had a baby. Do you think Zara might have left Adam because of her relationship with Dr. Claiborne? I couldn't say. I don't really know what went on with Adam. He seems like a decent guy. Zara cared for him. I can't believe she didn't wake up the next morning and regret what had happened between her and Dr. Claiborne. She took a deep breath as if making up her mind to continue. But there's something else. What? On Thursday night I was walking past Zara's staircase in Tomquad and I distinctly heard raised voices coming from Dr. Claiborne's room on the ground floor. I think one of the windows must have been slightly open. It had been such a hot day. This was the evening that Zara was killed. Sophie nodded. What time was this? About half past eight. The voices were raised. They weren't shouting exactly, but they were definitely angry. And whose voices were they? Well, it was Dr. Claiborne and a woman. Did you catch any of the argument? No, I didn't want to be found eavesdropping outside the window. Besides, I had an essay to finish. Fionn stared at the timid girl in front of her. Why didn't you mention this earlier? She demanded. This might be crucial. Sophie looked aghast. I didn't want to betray Zara. Zara slept with who? asked Bridget in astonishment. 
After a morning with little progress to show, she'd driven to Christchurch to find out how Jake, Fionn and Ryan had got on interviewing the students. With nowhere in college to talk in private, they decamped across the road to St. Aldate's Tavern. The traditional Victorian pub was the sort of place that could get very crowded and noisy if there was a football match playing on the large, wall-mounted television. But this afternoon there were just a handful of students grabbing a late lunch, some regulars nursing pints at the bar, and an American family trying to decide whether to go for ale-battered haddock or Cumberland sausage. She found a quiet corner where she could talk with her team without being overheard. The four of them huddled around a circular wooden table, perched on the sort of high bar stools that Bridget always had trouble getting on and off. "'Dr. Claiborne,' repeated Fionn, her English tutor. Bridget pictured the man in her mind's eye. The young tutor with his stylish dress sense, designer glasses and trendy haircut might well have held appeal to his female students. "'You think Sophie was telling the truth?' "'I think so.' She said she didn't tell us earlier because she was worried about the damage it might do to Zara's reputation. Or she was afraid of getting her tutor into trouble, suggested Bridget. Quite possibly that, too. Bridget waited as the waitress arrived with their food order, putting out a bowl of soup for herself, some pita bread with hummus for Fionn, and sausage and onion sandwiches for Jake and Ryan. I thought you two already at lunch at Christchurch, Fionn remarked to the boys. Only a small one said Ryan, the grease from the sausage running down his chin as he took a large bite. Fionn pulled a face and looked away. Jake wiped his own mouth with a paper napkin. On the CCTV, I don't remember seeing Dr. Claiborne leaving college the night of the murder. Bridget frowned. What? Not at all. He said he went to the drinks reception in the dean's lodgings. But where did he go after that? Did he stay overnight in the college? We need to find out. With Dr. Claiborne's room immediately below Zara's, it would have been very easy for him to have visited her, said Ryan. And there were the raised voices coming from Dr. Claiborne's room at 8.30 on Thursday night, said Fionn. Was Claiborne having a row with Zara? Bridget made another note. Then she checked her watch. We need to talk to Dr. Claiborne, but first I have a meeting with the dean. She had been summoned for an update on the case, and Bridget was not looking forward to it. But if they were to continue having smooth access to the college, its grounds, and its members, then keeping the dean happy was part of her job description. Besides, this information about Dr. Claiborne shed a new light on things. She wondered if the dean had any idea what his staff got up to out of hours. Jake, Fionn, you head back to Kidlington. Zara's phone records should have arrived by now. Fionn, can you go through them, please? Jake. Double-check Dr. Claiborne's movements on Thursday. Brief the team on what you found this morning, and look again at every witness statement that references Dr. Claiborne. By the time I get back, I want to see a detailed timeline of every move he made the day of the murder. Ryan, I'd like you to go back to college and see if you can catch anyone who was out doing exams this morning. See if they know anything. A look passed between Jake and Ryan as if to say, Jake one, Ryan nil. Bridget wondered what was going on with her team, and whether the enigmatic Fionn Hughes had anything to do with it. Situated in the college grounds next to the cathedral, the deanery was an elegant building with Georgian windows looking out onto a mature, well-tended garden, blooming with summer flowers. "'I thought we would sit in the garden,' said Dr. Reed, indicating the open French windows. "'I've asked the housekeeper to bring tea.' His manner was charming, not rude like the first time she'd met him. Still, Bridget was on her guard. She followed him outside to a wooden bench in the shade of a sprawling horse-chestnut tree. It was a beautiful day, and in other circumstances she would gladly have whiled away the whole afternoon in this idyllic garden, preferably with a good book for company, rather than the dean. "'You'll notice the green door in the north wall,' he said pointing to an arched doorway that looked as if it might lead to a secret garden. Oh, yes? It's featured in Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. In the story, the door is kept locked and Alice is forbidden from using it. It leads to the cathedral garden. Fascinating. Bridget remembered that Charles Dodgson, better known as Lewis Carroll, had been a mathematics tutor at Christchurch in the 19th century. 
Alice Liddell was the daughter of the dean at the time. Indeed, said the dean, warming to his subject. The Mad Hatter's tea parties were based on Alice's own birthday parties held in the garden. And this horse chestnut tree is the one in which the Cheshire cat sat. Is that so? Bridget gazed up at the leafy branches of the ancient tree overhead, through which the sun cast a dappled light. Interesting as it was to be surrounded by such iconic literary features, Bridget had the feeling that the dean had chosen to hold their meeting in the garden so that he could impress her with cultural references. No doubt he was used to entertaining visiting academics and basking in the reflected glow of five hundred years of history. This was his territory, and he was sending a message that she was merely a visiting guest, here at his largesse. She should probably have insisted on holding the meeting at Thames Valley HQ in Kidlington, but she was not going to let the hospitality deflect her from raising the thorny question of Dr. Claiborne and his inappropriate relationship with one of his students. She imagined the Queen of Hearts shouting, Off with his head! The housekeeper arrived carrying a tray with a teapot, cups and saucers, and a plate of shortbread. She set the tray down on a wooden table. Thank you, Margaret, said the dean. I'll take it from here. Margaret bowed her head and returned to the house. How do you like your tea, Inspector? Milk. No sugar, please. The dean poured two cups of tea into the fine bone china cups and handed one to her. Can I tempt you? He offered her the plate of shortbread. It's Margaret's homemade recipe. She was growing tired of his perfect host act. Thank you, she said, taking a small piece and putting it on the edge of her saucer. The dean smiled. Perhaps we can get down to business. I was dismayed to read the newspapers this Sunday. It was precisely the kind of bad publicity I feared. I can't imagine how upsetting it must have been for Sir Richard and Lady Hamilton. It was a relief to hear him finally express his reason for summoning her here. The newspapers didn't receive a tip-off from us, if that's what you're concerned about, said Bridget, and I'm sure that Zara's parents have more to be upset about than newspaper gossip. Quite. I hope that now poor Zachary has been found innocent. You will soon be arresting the actual murderer. Zachary has been released without charge, said Bridget carefully, and we are following up fresh leads. The dean raised an eyebrow. Can you share those leads with me? No, but I would like to talk to you about one of your academic staff, Dr. Claiborne. Dr. Claiborne. The smile vanished from his thin lips. What is it you would like to know? He asked stiffly. Have any students or members of staff ever raised any concerns or made a complaint against him? Certainly not. Dr. Claiborne holds an exemplary record. So you're not aware that he may have had an inappropriate relationship with one of his students? Dear Lord, what on earth are you referring to? Bridget found his tone disingenuous. I'm referring to the fact that he may have slept with Zara Hamilton two weeks ago on the night of the English faculty dinner. The dean took a sip of his tea before replying. When he spoke again, his voice was icy. One hears idle gossip in the senior common room. I assume that is all you have. Idle gossip. Is there a possibility it could be true? I think that you should tread very carefully before making any allegations. You have already dragged the good name of Oxford University and Sir Richard Hamilton through the mud, not to mention making your own investigation look ridiculous by arresting an innocent man. If you have nothing of substance to implicate Dr. Claiborne in this investigation, I demand that you desist this line of inquiry. My duty is to follow up all possible lines of inquiry. She tried a different angle. On the night of the murder, you hosted a drinks reception in your lodgings. That's correct. A note of wariness had crept into his voice. Dr. Claiborne told us that he attended the drinks reception. Did he? said the dean. His face brightened again, the Cheshire cat smile returning. Why, yes, I do believe he did. In your initial statement, you claimed that you had spoken to him yourself at the reception. 
Did I? Well, then, I must have done. And yet none of the other guests recall seeing him there. The smile disappeared as quickly as it had come. Perhaps I was mistaken, then. I assumed he was there, as he had been invited. But he wasn't invited, said Bridget. His name didn't appear on the guest list we obtained from your secretary. Well, now you come to mention it, I can't be absolutely certain. I was busy most of the evening with George Romano, the head of Oxford City Council. Most members of the senior common room were there, so I assumed Dr. Claiborne was too. I can't be held responsible for knowing the whereabouts of my staff at all hours.